The City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, the 9th of February 2021. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council including transferring outside Australia. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on the traditional country of the Kaurna people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past, present and emerging. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land and acknowledge their continuing importance to the Kaurna people living today. We also extend that respect to Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. Council acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands, which is recognised on the National Heritage List as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Will all present stand in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air? Thank you. Please be seated, members. Uh, members, item number five on tonight's agenda, uh, there are no apologies or leave of absence. Um, oh, Councillor Moran has advised that she may have to leave the meeting a little early tonight. Um, minutes of the last meeting, the 28th of January 2021. I look for confirmation, so I'm going to move the minutes. Thank you, Councillor Abraham, today. And a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Members, any comments, changes? If not, to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, we have four deputations this evening. Um, the first deputation will be from Rachel Healy, um, who is going to speak to us as Joint Artistic Director of the Adelaide Festival 2021. Um, uh, for those of you that are speaking tonight, you have five minutes to speak. Uh, a warning bell will go at four minutes, which means you have a minute left to uh, sum up. So, uh, Rachel, if you'd like to come forward. Thank you and hello everybody. Like all arts organisations, it's been an incredibly difficult year. The Adelaide Festival has tried in this year to maintain our programming principles and the expectations of our community and audience, while the world around us has been in constant change. It has been a bit like whitewater rafting. We have lost some in the raft and the waves just keep coming, but the boat itself is sailing on and despite the rapids on a daily basis, we are determined to deliver this festival in 2021 to you. We came to the realisation in June that the international program couldn't be delivered in the same numbers or scale as any other year, but we hope we have used the many silver linings of the pandemic to create a festival that is as ambitious, fun, connected to the social, political and personal challenges of our lives and as immediate as any other. We have delivered a largely Australian program, which includes, and the brochure is, uh, is in front of you, which includes a number of new commissions and opportunities for local artists to create new work. 
These include works by Gravity and Other Myths, Australian Dance Theatre, Lewis Major Projects, Restless Dance, Slingsby, Ace Open, Sam Stagg, the Art Gallery of South Australia, Aurora Young Adelaide Voices, the Australian String Quartet, State Theatre Company and Iwari Choir. Partnerships with the city's major cultural inst institutions and venues include the University of Adelaide, the SA Museum, the Art Gallery, Adelaide Oval, Elder Park, the Adelaide Festival Centre and the Adelaide Film Festival. The program also includes existing Australian work that come to Adelaide Festival with an extraordinary, extraordinary pedigree, fangirls and small metal objects which are both must-see theatre productions, plus the national premiere of a new theatre production starring Robin Nevin, A German Life, which will premiere here in Adelaide before a national tour. We will again deliver our opera centrepiece, this time Neil Armfield's production of Britain's Midsummer Night's Dream, with all but one Australian singers. An innovative series, Live from Europe, gives our audiences an opportunity to take a peek into the really thrilling international work that has been created in the last few years. We have a number of events that celebrate a sense of place and the land we live on. The one-to-one -one concert series in which a concert is performed by a solo musician for a single audience member in a range of unexpected and iconic SI locations, the Adelaide Central School of Art inside the scoreboard at Adelaide Oval, Hans Heysen House, the new hotel at the market are just a few. And building on the success of A Doll's House in 2020, we are delighted that our key international event for 2021 is an interactive installation by New York artist Robin Frohart. This is one of only two fully international events in the program. The plastic bag store will be situated in the old Harris scarf store in Rundle Mall. It is at first glance a supermarket like any other. It's only when you look closer and stroll through its aisles that you discover that everything from the butcher's counter and dairy aisle to the biscuits, breakfast cereals and salad bar, that everything has been created from thousands of upcycled plastic bags and plastic rubbish locally sourced and harvested from the streets and bins of New York City. If you do nothing else, have a look at the trailer. It will make you immediately want to get amongst it. And you are struck when you are in the supermarket with the discomforting realisation that when you throw something away, there is no away. And to really remind us about the land we live on, work and feed ourselves on, Naku Adlu is a series of picnics and dinner that celebrate and educate audiences about the native foods of the Ghana nation and surrounding nations. After a year in which people fought over toilet paper and pasta in supermarket aisles, there has never been a better time to learn about native foods and build a greater awareness of local native ingredients and a bigger market for indigenous owned food products. We are also in the middle of building a new cultural hub for Adelaide, the Summer House, which will be our festival bar, meeting place, and our home of contemporary music. Our commitment to thought leadership continues. The Writers Week program is bigger than ever, with Australian writers flying in and international writers beaming in, along with breakfast with papers in the morning and festival forums. I've only given you a snapshot of what's in store, but it is a program that offers more individual events than in 2020 and optimises opportunities for audiences to connect with the festival. We have been broadcasting the opera to Renmark, Port Perry, Mount Gambia and Wyala, for example. Of course, we are affected by limited capacities, but we do hope that you will all come and experience the Adelaide Festival this year. It is a festival like no other, but I think you will remember it for its artistic excellence and its sense of community. Thank you, Ms Healy. That was excellent. Looking forward to the festival starting. Thank you. Thank you, Lord um, our second deputation tonight is Miss Carrie Allen, who is from the Spark at the Whitmore, from Spark at the Whitmore, sorry. Carrie, uh, Carrie, if you'd like to come forward. Again, uh, the bell will go at four minutes, so you've got a minute to wind up. And hello, Rose Kentish. Right Honourable Lord Mayor and Council Members, thank you very much for letting us address you this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Um, as the Lord Mayor said, I am Carrie Allen. And I'm Rose Kentish. We're co-founders of the Spark Change Beverage Company and owner-operators of Spark at the Whitmore at 317 Morfitt Street in the city. Since opening our doors on International Women's Day in 2019, I think the Whitmore has been a vigorous contributor to the cultural economy of the southwest corner of the city. We count many of you here in this chamber as personal friends, valued customers, supporters, and friends of the business. 
We've been well rewarded for the energy invested in our multi-award winning brew pub, which functions kind of like a 21st century public meeting house uh, instead of like a traditional pub. Um, and I think it's fair to say that our business flies in the face of national trends in the pub sector. We've also created and maintained 25 full-time jobs in our business, 45 headcount in all. Um, we intentionally selected our location on Whitmore Square. We didn't, um, we didn't land there by chance. Um, we, we welcomed the social, cultural, and economic diversity of that area. Um, we coexist harmoniously with our very broad community, and we, um, in keeping with our values of social equity, we continue to feed people uh, on the square by working with the agencies there. In other words, we engage. But as with many of the hospitality counterparts across the city, across the state, and across the country, we have been hit extremely hard by COVID-19. And that still continues to impact us heavily today. Our venue capacity remains at 208 out of our original capacity, license capacity of 636. So we are two thirds down in terms of our ability to generate revenue through customers. Like many of our colleagues, we've simply put our heads down and driven hard through the challenges and the restrictions. We have not whined. We have not shirked from our responsibilities or our commitments. And we have not come to you or to other agencies asking for help until now. We're here today because the ongoing works commenced by Council on the 27th of January 2021 without prior notice or any form of consultation damages us. The works will impact our ability to trade for many weeks and at a time when like most small hospitality businesses in Adelaide CBD, we are most vulnerable. While there is much for the Council to learn with respect to the significant communication fail that has landed us here today, that's an internal matter for Council. The solutions presented to us in our first formal discussion with Council employees yesterday focused on signage, coordination of working hours, adjustments to the staging of ongoing works, and replacement of lost venue parking and waiting zone spaces. They will offer valuable assistance, but they're kind of business as usual. We will come back to your executives with a summary of our requests, including marketing and event support, as well as rate relief. But these measures will not counteract the estimated 50% reduction in walk-in traffic that we're already experienced since the roadworks began. Our quietest ever trading days were last Tuesday the 5th, and Thursday, the February the 7th. As well as compensation, we need a different level of support from Council to help us through this perilous time. We need a different approach and one that consciously moves aside the bureaucratic barriers that will exist. We need collaboration that plays to all our strengths. For example, can you procure alcohol from, this, from us this year? We distill extremely high quality and award-winning brews and we also, we brew a thousand kegs out of our brew pub every year. Uh, that would be a sip in the right direction. Do you hold external events? An alcohol contract for your events over the next six months would help. When you offer competitive events in the CBD, such as the fringe activation of the Croquet Club, can you mandate their inclusion of a CBD alcohol producer? These events may attract people to the city, but they're our direct competitors. They take customers away from our venue. Can you stimulate street and square-based events of a high calibre around us that we can participate in? Do you have plans and strategies to reignite city life? Show us where the innovators are gathering. We'll show up. We'll help. Thank you. Can ladies, I'm sorry, that is time. So if I could just ask you to wrap up. Thank you. Oh, you didn't have to run away. I just, you just want to wrap up. That'd oh, right. We thought, we thought, wow. <laughs> You're going to go? No. Okay. 
We're proud members of Adelaide's CBD business community. We show up daily with resilience and vision. And in this instance, resi resilience alone will not see us through the next few months. We need your help and we ask for it at the most senior levels of council now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, members, the third deputation tonight is from uh, Mrs Debbie Sterry, which is uh, on the Tennis SA Centre Court Redevelopment Stage 2 project. Welcome. Thank you, Lord Mayor and councillors for the opportunity to speak this evening. In my role of CEO at Tennis SA, I wish to provide an overview of the proposed development for the Centre Courts and Precinct at Memorial Drive. Tennis has a vision for Memorial Drive to achieve, to achieve its potential as a vibrant sporting entertainment and technology hub. The vision embraces and enhances Memorial Drive's unique location while engaging the community and its riverbank neighbours. Over the last four years, two separate development projects have resulted in Memorial Drive coming back to life. A 10 million Commonwealth project refurbished all Memorial Drive's outside tennis courts provided two new pavilions, a sunken show court and international standard championship tennis courts. A 10 million South Australian government project with a further 1 million jointly from Tennis SA and Tennis Australia delivered the centre court roof, which was completed in December 2019. This project enabled professional tennis to come back to Adelaide with the new Adelaide International, which is a combined men's and women's event, normally held the week before the Australian Open. To achieve the vision of this project, the following will take place. The demolition of the North Stand and construction of a new Northern facility to provide state-of-the-art facilities for events, the Sports Innovation Hub and media. The construction of a new Eastern facility, which integrates into the Southern Plaza to provide a Federation Square style external space. This facility will be the home of high performance training and provide premium event spaces. New rigging points on the roof to cater for a variety of future events. Feature lighting to complement the vibe of the Adelaide Riverbank precinct. The outcomes of the vision will result in a venue of choice for tennis, providing a state-of-the-art 6,500 seat stadium in a prime location right here in Adelaide. A further five-year commitment by Tennis Australia, which will result in Adelaide experiencing 10 years of professional tennis events being played at the home of tennis, being Memorial Drive. A state-of-the-art 6,500-seat stadium complex comprised of construction of a new northern and eastern facility, each of three levels, common mezzanine with food, beverage and public amenities, community, media, entertainment and conference spaces, new seating in the south stand with the red brick arches maintained as a theme throughout the new facility, facilities that provide an exclusive, welcoming and accessible environment for all ages and physical capabilities. Integration with the Adelaide Oval Plaza and Lynn Falston Lawns. Home to a sports innovation hub, state-of-the-art athlete development facility, upgraded centre court platform. The venue will also provide the opportunity to hold non-tennis events, such as Adelaide Esports International, concerts, Adelaide Festival and Fringe events, opera, community arts, and events in conjunction with Adelaide Oval, including AFL and Test Cricket, through the activation of the Southern Plaza and the Eastern facility. The economic benefit to the state includes the creation of approximately 85 FTEs over the design and construction program. At its peak, over 160 jobs will be engaged and or contracted across 70 trades and skill sets. The majority of construction materials and resources will be South Australian based. Steel fabrication and concrete precast factories are based here in South Australia. Overall, a 40 million plus injection into the South Australian economy over the 19 months of the project. Improved facilities for the Adelaide International Tennis Event, bringing greater community support and spend. Financial injection into the state by tennis and other events of approximately 4 million per annum. Our timeline for the redevelopment is to commence in March and the facility will be event ready for the Adelaide International in 2022, with the project completion expected mid-2022. The key project attributes of the Memorial Drive redevelopment are a tennis facility that blends history with contemporary design features, two new spectator stands to the east and north of the centre court, new seating with great sight lines, food and beverage facilities and enhanced amenities, a new public concourse inspired by the red brick arches of the southern stand with access to seating and amenities in both the east and north stands, a multi-purpose viewing 
and event space located on level two of the east stand will integrate with the Adelaide Oval Southern Plaza, offering both internal views of the centre court and external views of the Riverbank precinct and the Adelaide city skyline. A media and sports technology centre in the north stand will feature TV and radio broadcast facilities, media lounge and space for high performance sports research and development. Most importantly, the faculty will remain a community-based facility accessible to the public to experience our wonderful game on the very courts that has been the home to the champions of the past and those that are gracing our courts now and in the future. Finally, it is significant to note that the exciting initiative in 2021 will be the centenary, yes, 100 years of the first major tennis championships moving to Memorial Drive and the establishment of the then South Australian Lawn Tennis Association tennis as we know it today. Our project will be fitting acknowledgement of the journey and that history. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation tonight. Um, the fourth deputation we have uh, is Dr Sandra Agagi, I hope I pronounced that correct, uh, Doctor, and also Heather Oxenham to talk to us about Place of Courage. Welcome. I've just got a folder here with our support letters that I'd like to hand around for people to look at. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to the past and the present. Spirit of Woman recognises the City of Adelaide's key role in our journey to date, and we applaud the admin team for tirelessly trying to make this happen. We'd also like to say um, thank you to the Deputy Mayor for showing her leadership in bringing us here today. The Place of Courage is about shining a light on family and domestic violence creating a socially and emotionally progressive city to recognise the important connection between art and healing and the potential for education. It will become a permanent reminder of the importance of addressing family and violence, family violence. There are over a thousand memorials in South Australia alone to conflict. Creating the place of courage shows the community that we care we understand and we value their experience. It is vital that Council stays engaged in this issue. On, November, on the 8th of November 2016, Councillor Priscilla Corwell presented a motion to this City of Adelaide Strategy Planning and Partnership Committee that Council investigate the establishment of a domestic violence commemorative sculpture. And the motion was unanimously endorsed. It is now February the 9th. I know why I'm here. I'm the daughter of Helen Oxenham and this is Sandra Robinson and her, both our mothers set up one of the first women's shelters down the south. I'm reminded every time I bring my mother to the hospital about her background in family and domestic violence. I'm reminded every time that she struggles during her life because of the trauma that she experienced about how important this issue is. That is why I'm here today. Why else would you work five years and not get any progress? I have to ask though, why are we here? Are we here because of a location? Are we debating a location here? Are we debating that you don't want to you don't want to acknowledge this problem in this community? Are we here because of the money? Because every conversation we have, people say we support this issue, but we can't afford it. And while we're in a pandemic, who is going to take leadership on this issue? We have done everything right. We have surveyed over 650 um, we have 650 surveys filled in by the community. We did a, we advertised for artists, we got three artists, we went through all the right protocols with the admin department in the city of Adelaide. We selected an artist, we picked a location in conjunction with this council. We don't understand what the hiccup is here. We don't understand 
why after five years we, st we still have no progress. I'd like to leave you with just one of the survey responses. Please make this happen. I'm a survivor and this is really important to me and many women everywhere. We have all been touched in one way or another by someone who's been affected by DV. Thanks. As you can see, we're very emotional about this because we both come from uh, a background of domestic violence ourselves and women who've been advocating against domestic and family violence for a very long time. And I think with the place of courage, what we're talking about here is something that is actually a game changer. It's a completely different approach to treating domestic and family violence. It's about establishing a tribute, a memorial, a, plant, a, a name for the victims and survivors of domestic and family violence, a place where they can go, a place where they can feel that they're acknowledged, where their pain and suffering is actually acknowledged where they can go and grieve, hopefully heal, share conversations, and actually move forward, be able to let some of that pain and suffering go. And public acknowledgement is really important, which is why we have so many war memorials. It's why the federal government is currently looking at establishing a memorial for the victims of institutional sexual abuse, because they know they work. They actually make a difference. They actually create healing. That public acknowledgement of someone's grief and suffering goes a long way to actually healing that grief and suffering. So we feel that the place of courage is a really important step, a strategy to dealing with domestic violence and actually breaking the cycle. But we can't do it without council support. We need to have that endorsement. We need to have something from the council that says, yes, go forward with this. Have a, have a place designated so that we can then go out, raise funds and actually make it happen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your deputation tonight. Uh, members, um, I might actually uh, start by welcoming, welcoming back Justin Lynch, uh, who some of you may know from before. Uh, Justin has joined us in the role of uh, Chief Operating Officer. Um, and also just to acknowledge that it's Rudy's last meeting with us tonight. He's smiling, can you see that? <laughs> and, um, but I know that we'd like to thank Rudy for all his work over the last <laughs> And wish him all the best. Um, I also, sorry, wrong I also, um, I think what I might do, because we've been going over time with everybody speaking, I might do a two minute warning bell and then you have a minute. So uh, hopefully it won't be too disruptive. We're trying to keep it quite low, uh, but we'll see how that goes for tonight, just to see if we can keep time a bit better. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I was wondering if I could propose a reordering um, of the agenda. If we could bring forward the, um, a proposal from Councillor Kouros regarding the Place of Courage Memorial, and if we could also bring forward the Tennis SA uh, Court Development um, proposal, um, and Councillor Martin's proposal on wage theft. I was conscious there's people in the um, gallery that might be interested in these matters, and I don't want them to have to wait um, till the early hours of the morning to, to deal with them. Um, Councillor Sims, I'm happy to bring the place of courage because that's right at the end of the agenda. And uh, given tennis is the third one in our um, uh, in our uh, reports for tonight, uh, hopefully that won't take too long. So perhaps if I can bring 17.6 forward, members, I'll just do 9.1 first, and then we'll go to 17.6, then back to item number 10. Is everybody happy with that? Could I just have a quick show of hands? Everybody's happy with that? What, what Thank you, members. Happy Sorry? What am I happy about? You're going... Uh, 17.6, which is the Place of Courage <laughs> Memorial, I'll bring forward. Yep. Uh, so, members, 9.1 uh, is the advice from the Audit Committee of the 5th of February 2021. I'll look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Martin. And a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak? Well, look, just uh, briefly, Lord Mayor, because uh, there's no context provided for this uh, report. Uh, as you know, we all need to take notice of the Audit Committee report. Uh, I remind everyone that the last one that came to us 
at QF1 uh, urged us to exercise financial prudence because we just overspent uh, by 0.85 of a million uh, in operating costs. Um, and so just three months ago, uh, that was the warning about financial imprudence. And again, the audit committee has warned us and says, uh, we have uh, overspent our operating costs by 0.99 or $1 million. Um, so uh, for the benefit of members, Lord Mayor, I just point out that the audit committee is waving a red flag. Councillor Carroll, did you wish to speak? Members, if not, uh, Councillor Hyde. Um, I just want to thank the administration um, and echo what the audit committee said, which is that they commended um, uh, the finding of around five million dollars uh, in savings, and that assists uh, our bottom line as well. Uh, but I also want to share with members that um, one of the one of the things that came up at audit committee, which uh, was uh, the sort of closeout reports of the audits done with the goal of place infrastructure works, and there were some very serious very serious um, findings there um, and one of them uh, we already know but one of them I, I wasn't aware of at least of course there was no contingency for that project and I've never seen um, I've never seen an infrastructure project that lacks a contingency um, I think that's a very very serious oversight um, uh, and furthermore as well there was no reference design done um, and uh, the reference design is key as you progress to your sort of final costings and then that informs what you end up budgeting um, so those are serious, serious failings, which uh, I know weren't done by this team, and I know they've uh, learned from that. Um, but I just wanted to flag um, the rather scathing assessment, as I felt it was, regarding that project, um, so that we can all keep an eye out for these issues um, in the future. Certainly, I will be looking for contingencies in everything. We should always have them. Um, to that end, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge um, uh, the Director of Place for bringing that forward for assessment by our external audit so that we could actually have some clear information coming back to the Council on that project and a few other projects. So uh, we really appreciated the fact that that was the project put forward so we can actually do a deep dive into what happened with that. Um, members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. Uh, some Thank man. you, members, to the vote. Those in favour, those against, that is carried. So, members, we're going to go to uh, item number 17.6. Um, I'll just have one moment. Thank you. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, 17.6, Place of Courage Memorial. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Do I have a seconder? Um, Councillor Abraham today. Thank you. Councillor Kouros, did you wish to speak to it? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, approximately 16% of women, and these are approximate figures, um, and 5.9% of men have experienced physical violence uh, from partners. Currently, 1 million Australian children are affected by domestic violence. On average, one woman and one male is killed per week by a current or former partner. These are statistics that need to be talked about as domestic violence has lasting effects. As you can hear the emotion from the deputation today, the place of courage is to be a place that will bring people together and bring them from out of the shadows into the light. A place for people to come together to reflect, a place for some of them to grieve, a place for education and awareness, a place to talk together for, for, for the greater awareness, awareness of the issue that we have. I'm asking for Council to bring this matter forward so we can discuss regarding a site to, for this monument. Um, I believe that there has been discussions previously in Council, which I, I, don't, I don't know what happens, so I can't really um, talk about that, but I would like to go forward to finding a site for the plain people, for a place of courage and um, for us to have a monument for victims of domestic violence. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Abraham,
Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, can I thank the Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Gross, for her leadership on this? And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity now, Lord Mayor, to thank the Spirit of Women uh, Committee for uh, pursuing this. It's been um, uh, five years, or over five years, and they uh, have not given up. Um, they're working hard to, uh, to, to shine a light on, on an issue that um, causes so much grief. Uh, and to, to build a public space that people can go to to, uh, to remember, to reflect, to, to think about uh, their loved ones or, uh, or themselves. Um, Lord Mayor, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest and frank, my place of courage and my place to remember my mother who was killed as a result of family and domestic violence continues to be the convention center. The Adelaide Convention Center, and I walk past this place every single day that is my place to remember. So I would urge all members to support this. We would like to finalise a location. We would like to, uh, to to try and wrap this up because right now it looks like it's um, there are so many pieces to this puzzle. Uh, and and I again thank the members of Spirit of Women for uh, continuing their fight and uh, trying to get us to a point where we can agree on a location. And hopefully from there on we can agree on a, on a design and, and the final uh, place for all of us to think about um, our own situation, think about our loved ones and, uh, uh, and reflect. Thank you, Councillor Abri. Today, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor, and um, I thank uh, Councillor Kouros and Councillor um, Abri Hemsdorf for their comments. Um, and look, I also uh, support um, this and, and pay tribute to um, the group that have been working to make this happen. Um, I think you know public art is so important in terms of, as Councillor um, Abraham has said, providing a place um, for people to to go to reflect um, and to acknowledge what has happened. It builds community awareness, um, but it's also a place of um, grief, which I think is really important. Um, over the uh, weekend, Lord Mayor, I was reminded of this when I had the opportunity to um, go to the unveiling of the uh, memorial for uh, the boat people, um, uh, the Vietnamese boat people memorial. Um, and that was a really uh, very moving um, event. Um, and it was clear um, how important that uh, new memorial is to that community. Um, and uh, it's clear that it's going to play a really important role in our city, and that is the power of public art such as this. Um, so I'm very supportive of, um, of this project, um, and uh, I hope that we can give it the, the green light today and finally see some, some movement happening on this. So um, I hope everybody will get behind it. Thank you, members. Councillor Donovan. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Of course, I'm very happy to support this motion tonight. And can I just ask a question of administration, um, a reminder, when previously we have discussed this matter, was it in confidence? CEO, acting CEO. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, not that I'm aware that it was in confidence. Um, there was a, um, a, a workshop that we did bring to members just to talk through some of the challenges associated um, with this project. Um, but there have been many reports on the public record for a number of years. And that workshop was not in confidence? It was in confidence. It was yes. in confidence. Yeah. So without breaking the confidence of the workshop, I would just remind members to reflect back on what was presented at that time um, and recognise that there would be a significant duplication of effort from this motion. And in fact, if in different situations, if members were to take on board advice from the administration, as is regularly given to us, as is provided over and over again from our expert advice, if we were to take that advice forward, then we would not be in this situation that we find ourselves once again. So I would hope not only for this motion tonight, but for several other motions that are coming up tonight, that we would take the advice of our experts in the administration, rather than rehashing different content so that administration are forced to pander to elected members in different situations. Of course, I will support this motion tonight. Councillor Martin, then Councillor Hyde. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Now, look, uh, let me say unequivocally, I, uh, I support this proposal and uh, I acknowledge the hard work of this uh, committee over some years. 
Uh, as you know, Lord Mayor, you don't allow us to ask questions of uh, speakers. And so the questions I would have asked of our speakers, I, I will ask of the administration, if I may. Uh, on a previous occasion, Council approved a $15,000 uh, grant to the organisation. Um, has that been expended and, and where has that gone? Is there a design and is that design current or uh, is that one now out of date? That's from 2018. I can see uh, there's several questions there. Uh, through the presiding member, um, my understanding is that was um, expended um, and it was in partnership with Art South Australia. Is that correct, Christy? Through the Lord Mayor, that's correct. That money was expended uh, on funding a designer for the original concept, which has been expended. And is that therefore what we are now being asked to approve, a location for that concept, or is there to be another concept? I'm not clear. Acting CEO. Through the presiding member, the motion asks that we work with the spirit of women to identify a preferred location for a proposed place of courage artwork. Um, I haven't personally been in discussion um, with the spirit of women group, but reading the motion, it looks um, like that would be the preference to use the existing artwork and work with the group to find a, a location for that. And the administration reports that there's a working budget of $250,000 um, is that council funds or is that funds that uh, the group is raising for this? Um, as per the memorial guidelines, um, that is the costed amount of that design and we'd be uh, working with the group around fundraising um, to enable that to be um, found to pay for the, for the design. So you're saying that that is to come from the organisation, not from council? Potentially, yes, subject to council um, contribution, which today council has contributed on various elements. Sure. And, and do we know whether the group has a substantial part or um, uh, all of it or? Through the Lord Mayor, um, I'm not uh, privy to the amount that the group has uh, raised so far. Thank you, thank you. Okay, um, well, that's made it a bit clearer for me. Um, thank you, and uh, I'll support this. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think I might suggest an amendment. Sure, and it would be to add a three that Council flags its intention to the State Government that it will provide funding for the capital expense of the place of courage of $100,000 on the condition that matched dollar for dollar funding is received from the state government. I suppose comma or any other any other um, government would want to exclude federal or what have you. So members, I need a seconder for now. Oh, thank you, Jesse Kerra, Councillor Kerra. Yep. Um, uh, Thank you, thank you, colleagues. And I think I could sense the frustration um, uh, in the voice during that deputation that this has gone on for so long. And, and my understanding is I don't think it's actually the councillor's um, uh, error in any way. I know that Councillor Abraham today and Councillor Koros, and I've met with um, the proponents as well. I know there was some confusion over the space and the scope and the size and, and what have you. Um, uh, but ultimately, we've all said some lovely things, but I think it's time for us to put our money where our mouth is. And I just confirmed from our, um, our associate director that the public art budget has a $70,000 um, underspent. Now, ordinarily, of course, I would like to see savings banked, especially at such a time. But 
Um, uh, this is because uh, that awful Terence Plowright thing is not coming into the city. Um, and while I know that the administration has characterised this as a, as a memorial, and, and certainly it is, um, I, I would like to think there is a public art element and value to it as well, if not um, just for uh, victims of domestic violence than for others in the, in the community too. Certainly the designs that I've seen um, uh, show that it's quite a tasteful um, uh, proposal from the proponent. So um, I think it's time for us to put our money where our mouth is, but also to acknowledge the reality, uh, which is that uh, we are not uh, primarily responsible for this policy area um, uh, and that we would expect the state government um, uh, to stump up uh, some cash as well for this incredibly uh, worthy project. So uh, I think it's time for us to, to finally move forward with this um, uh, and to get it done and to support all of those in our community and to show them that we have their backs. Um, I think this is an incredibly worthy project. Um, it has much merit to it. Uh, and, and, and I commend it to you. Councillor, could I just um, make sure that we've captured what you said? It largely is. does it not make sense or is there any clarity? Uh, no, I'm just checking the any other level of government. I didn't hear that when you were dictating. I'll just make it uh, from the state government or any other government. Look, if, if other councils, neighbouring councils want to contribute because they think there's value in it for their um, uh, residents or for their communities, that's, I, I wouldn't say no, is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, Councillor Kerr, did you wish to speak? Reserve my right. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, look, I'd warn you against this amendment. It sounds very generous, but actually it could leave this group with nothing. Because if the state government says no, then ours is removed. Um, I will vote for it because I don't want to sound churlish, but it is a dangerous and an empty amendment. The real amendment would be to give the $70,000 with no strings attached that we have left in the public art budget. That would give them some security. They could then go to the state government and say, we've got 70 grand from the council, what about you? And then they'll feel duty bound. But I think this, you know, I'll give you this much if you give me this much, is just showboating. And it, that means that probably they won't get anything. So if this fails, I will um, put on, on notice that we give the unspent money in the public art budget, no strings attached, goodwill uh, gesture to this group and not make this convoluted... Uh, do you want to move I'm not sure you can. I think this this should be ultra virus any because this is a, a amendment without notice. We usually don't make budget implications without notice. So Lord Mayor, I'd, I'd say you shouldn't have accepted this motion in the first place. But um, that could be explained because you're actually not committing any money from so the budget. Okay. My government's so advice my, is that would be, my government's advice, Council Moran, is that it's an amendment. So that is accepted. But it's amendment without notice. That's the governance advice. And would, you, would the governance uh, then approve that if I just said give them seventy thousand dollars? Well, look, look. If I put look, the, the rationale is if I put that in here now and the government sees that, they're not going to give you the hundred thousand, are they? They're not going to give it to you anyway um, because they'll say there are other memorials. I, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but you, it's getting blood out of a stone, I would say. So I would um, move a second amendment that um, if I get a seconder, that we just give the um, unspent money in the public art um, budget to the, um, to, towards the art piece for- um, Councillor Moran, I'll deal with this one first and then we'll come back for okay. a second amendment. Well, I urge people to vote against this one. It's an empty motion. Um, members to the floor, I'll have Councillor Martin and then Councillor Appium today. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, would the mover consider varying the amendment to accommodate... What Sorry, Councillor Martin, I can't hear what you're saying. Oh, I said, Lord Mayor... Um, <laughs> I said, I said uh, would the mover consider just varying it along the lines as has been proposed? Um, I, I think his intentions are honourable. No, but I'll address that when I sum up. All right. 
Well, look, Lord Mayor, um, uh, Councillor Moran is right. I mean, I, I, I respect that his intentions uh, uh, may be uh, good in this, but the, the problem always when uh, we move to provide matching funding on the basis of government approval is that the government very often doesn't come up with the goods and therefore the party which is the subject of the motion gets nothing. And I'm reminded of the uh, the grand gesture of Councillor Hyde in the last financial year when he proposed uh, funding far in excess of this for the Adelaide Zero project, conditional on matching state government funding. That funding never materialised and so the money never went to Adelaide Zero. In fact, it, it, uh, no, Actually, some of it did go to the Adelaide some, Zero some project. Some of it did, but the, the balance, the largest part of it, um, wasn't funded matching dollar for dollar by the state government and therefore there was a substantial underspend in the financial year documents. And I remember that very quickly. So that is the danger that the organisation will get nothing. And, and so if it is the intention of uh, the councillor to ensure uh, that there is an allocation to uh, the place of courage, that there is a real opportunity that that will provide an incentive to government and not only government but to those who may not have given a donation uh, for them to be able to see that there is that money there that this project has momentum i think a seventy thousand dollar straight out allocation is a much better outcome for the organization uh, and so look i i ask members um, to vote against this um, because it, it really isn't giving a place of courage anything Whereas we have the capacity here tonight um, to allocate $70,000 of unspent funds. And just before I conclude, Lord Mayor, I noted Councillor Hyde's remark that that dreadful Terence Plowright sculpture isn't going on the riverbank. This has not been conveyed. I don't think we aren't uh, discussing that tonight. No, no, I am asking uh, uh, administration. Perhaps, perhaps we can do that later because that's not to do with what we're discussing at the moment. Well, no, it, it is very relevant to what Councillor Moran has been speaking to and what I've been speaking to, it's $70,000. Is that definitely the case, just for confirmation? Acting CEO. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, my understanding, and I haven't had a response back, was the Lord Mayor on the instruction of Council wrote to the Premier, um, and I'm haven't actually seen a response to that, so I'm unable to confirm that for you tonight here, Councillor Martin, but I'm happy to take that on notice and provide a follow-up to members tomorrow. Thank you. Councillor Abrahams, no. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think this is what's wrong with politics, Lord Mayor. We have social issues at hand. We have things that we need to work on. Um, we need to collaborate on, but then it gets hijacked and it becomes politicised. The amendment before us has been put forward um, as, as a means to collaborate with the state government because we know we can't go out alone. We know the spirit of women can't go out alone. What we can do is work with state government, work with federal government, work with other councils, whoever that wants to join in. As Councillor Hyde said, it's not going to say no. no. Whoever that wants to be part of the solution can be a part of the solution. Members, let's not politicise this. Let's vote for this amendment. Let's collaborate, because I can tell you, two heads, three heads, four heads, five heads, or in this case, hands with money are better than one. Uh, members, if not, I'll go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up on the amendment. Well, it's amazing. I struggled to find a seconder, and now everyone wants to throw money at the problem. Um, but I'll just, just picking up on Councillor Abraham today's Points. I'm just so disappointed, Lord Mayor, that it seems personal issues have permeated into this discussion. Um, Councillor Martin's attacks, Councillor Moran's, even Councillor Donovan talking about the experts. That's, of course, an argument for, for other motions. But what I would say is the reasoning, the reasoning behind talking about co-contributions um, is because if we put money on the table and the state government will look at it and say, oh, we've got money. We don't need to put anything there. There's no, there's no incentive for them to contribute because they can say, oh, well, they've, they've got some money, um, uh, they can raise a little bit more and just do a smaller, do a smaller place of courage. Um, uh, if, we make, if we make this co-funding uh, or our funding a contingent upon their funding, 
uh, you actually really, really dangle a carrot for them to come uh, to the table with some money. Um, it is effective, and I would correct Councillor Martin that the majority of that uh, homelessness funding was expended. Um, I, I make, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to justify why the state government didn't spend the rest of it. I think that was wrong, um, and I've been working with the administration on addressing that. But um, uh, here we have a proposal before us, uh, which I think I, I do have faith, and I think we have an excellent. Um, uh, uh, minister or assistant minister, especially in domestic and family violence, um, uh, in Carolyn Power, and I think they would look favourably upon a project like this. It's a shame, um, if anything, that of course we were meant to be the first state, uh, the first place in the country to have uh, such a such a place of courage, um, uh, and then of course, and we started first, and then Melbourne um, came and beat us to it. Not that it's a competition in any means, but South Australia has such a long and proud history uh, of championing uh, social reform. Um, and I think it's time we played a little bit of catch up. This, I think, is the best way to do it and get a larger place of courage. Uh, thank you. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Council members, the division has been called on the amendment. With all those in favour of the amendment, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Sims, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Carer, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Abraham today. So, members, that now becomes a substantive. Is there any further discussion? Um, before Councillor Mackey? Um, uh, question three, three, the question through you, Lord Mayor. Um, given that that is the first variation uh, that has now been debated and voted upon, and one, whether Councillor Moran would still be of a, of a, of a mind uh, to add a second, the first foreshadowed second variation, to, so that we are in fact making a concrete commitment. Yes, that's Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, I'll move that if this fails, that we um, we donate or give the remainder of public art um, budget to this project. Um, we haven't got any other art. Sorry, sorry project. Councillor Moran. I'm just I'm just checking what we're doing because this yes. is the substantive. So we're doing point four. So yeah. when you say if it fails, you're talking if we're unable to uh, unable uh, to get match funding through the state government through that avenue. So if match funding is uh, unattainable or unable to be uh, secured, that the council donate the a balance of the public art um, budget of seventy thousand seventy thousand dollars to the project. So I had the deputy lord mayor. There, as the seconder. So, Councillor Moran, I'll just make sure that I've got the I've captured that. If match funding is unavailable to be to be secured, the balance of the public art budget of seventy thousand be donated to the place of courage. The place of courage, art installation, memorial. Um, sorry, Deputy Lord Mayor, you can't second. Uh, a point of order, Lord Mayor. Or, uh, just, just a moment. So by seconding the amendment, you're taking a spoken. I'm just actually trying to see who hasn't spoken. I just my... have a point of order, Lord Mayor. Bye -bye. What's the point of order? Um, and that is that isn't this amendment uh, fundamentally contravening uh, number three, which has been approved by the Chamber, um, in that number three is a provisory statement. This then becomes a, one of a better, better word, de declaratory, a provisional statement. This becomes declaratory. declaratory. It, um, th there's a fundamental contradiction here. I don't see that um, this amendment can be allowed. I will ask government's advice on that. Thank you. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, I think you'll find that it's contingent on number three not proceeding, so it's not contrary. It's if number three succeeds, number four does not apply. With, with respect, it effectively negates number three's provisional quality. 
Members, I do need a seconder who hasn't spoken. Councillor Mackey, thank you. Look, I'm, I'm not going to speak on this, Lord Mayor. I think I referred to it previously. I think this puts a safety net down. It assures them to go out and get funding. I don't think it necessarily uh, diminishes number three. Um, if the government wants to give money, they'll give money. If they don't, they won't. Um, so I think this gives some security and goodwill of actual solid, meaningful contribution. We haven't got any other big art projects. It is that money is annexed there. It can't be used for anything else. So we've got one screamingly obvious, needed, loved, organised. We have had workshops, as uh, Councillor Donovan said. We are ready to go. Um, so I think this, this gives, um, as I said, a safety net and security of some money. Thank you. So Councillor Mackey. Um, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I know that there are some who would want to portray this um, discussion uh, as a politicisation. I, I actually don't accept that. I think there is a large measure of goodwill uh, here in this chamber for uh, place of courage and, and your objective. Um, I was, I voted for Councillor Hyde's variation, but I'm very happy also to second uh, Councillor Morant's second uh, very amendment. Um, and uh, uh, in as a measure of my own personal. Uh, enthusiasm for the objectives and, and, and motivation. I'm also going to pledge $1,000 of my own elected member allowance to Place of Courage, unconditional, uh, to help uh, them. Very generous, lovely Councillor Mackey. Councillor Donovan, you next, and Councillor Martin. Just look, um, just briefly, I think the danger with this amendment, let's just think it through, is that it uh, may well have a practical effect of kiboshing $130,000, uh, which may otherwise go to the organisation. Um, that's my reading of the practical effect that this may. Thank you, Councillor Kerry. Councillor Martin. Look, Lord Mayor, I can now support this. This is a reasonable motion. Instead of saying to place of courage, here's a 50-50 chance that you might get $200,000, we are saying we will go to the state government and flag that we're prepared to extend $100,000. If you're prepared to extend $100,000, if the state government says, no, we're not, there's $70,000. This is a win-win. This is a really good outcome. And uh, I thank uh, also Councillor Mackey for his generosity this evening. Uh, that was indeed a fine gesture. And members, I ask you all, uh, to provide this chamber with an equally fine gesture and support this motion and support the place of courage. Thank you, members. I will remind you to speak through the chair. Thank you. I know we have lots of people in the gallery tonight, um, but let's remember we're in the chamber. Um, Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Well, Lord Mayor, this is absolutely fantastic. It's great to see a chamber working together to arrive to uh, a decision in which we can move forward and support um, this uh, monument. Um, it's been in the making for uh, quite some time and it, uh, it is really dear to the uh, spirit of women as we heard tonight. And I'd like to thank all the councillors tonight for working collaboratively together to arriving to uh, this decision. Thank you. Thank you. Members, um, Councillor Hyde. I just wanted to say this is the first time in my life I've seen one-upmanship actually achieve something. So look, I'm happy to support Thank you, this. Thank um, uh, I, I do. I do share Councillor Kira's concern. I do share Councillor Kira's concern. Um, but look, if there's an outpouring of support, then there's an outpouring of support. Let's Thank do it. Thank I will go to Councillor Moran to sum up. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Well, in summing up, I just think that's an absolutely reprehensible thing to say that people that are giving $70,000 to secure it are doing it for political and one-upmanship. Obviously, that's the way Councillor Hyde's mind works, but I can assure thee 
people that have been working on this and want it is not a matter of political one-upmanship. Um, so I think that's a really disgraceful thing, but it comes as no surprise from Councillor Hyde. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Can I have that noted as unanimous? Thank you. That now becomes a substantive. <laughs>
Those against? Those are carried. That takes us to 10.1, which is the city connector. I'll look for a mover from the floor. Councillor Martin and a seconder, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Martin. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. I, uh, I'd like to propose an alternative motion, um, and that is one, two, and three as are, and four is amended to read, asks the administration to review and to report to council by the end of June 2021 on proposals, comma, in partnership with DIT, DIT, comma, to better promote the service. Council, could I just get you to read what's on the screen to make sure we've captured this appropriately? Yes, and everything below that is out. So the authorisation is out? Yes, is it is. deleted? It is. <coughs> so members, I will look for a seconder. Councillor Mackey. Councillor Martin, if you'd like to speak to that. Yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, uh, here uh, we have uh, a survey which shows, unlike uh, just about every other uh, council run uh, endeavour, um, at, uh, at page 30, 91%, 91% of ratepayers think this is an important service and they think uh, they are very satisfied with the service. 91%, it's amazing. They like the routes, they like the stops, they like the frequency. Uh, nine out of 10 are saying to this chamber, do not touch, leave alone. Uh, and our administration was saying uh, that we should review the naming of the routes and stops to develop more tourist friendly and intuitive stops, review the timetables and patronage to reduce costs, review the whole service again in a year, creating all of that uncertainty that we've just put everyone through um, to come up with an answer that says 91% of ratepayers are saying, do not touch. Now, honestly, uh, any council that ignores that warning and asks the administration to go away and have a bit of a fiddle is just asking for trouble. Um, I just say to you all, um, the advice of the ratepayers is very clear. It says, leave it alone. And the only thing uh, that they actually agree on apart from that is to put some more stops in at the, uh, the Royal Adelaide Hospital and the Aquatic Centre. 10% say that's the only thing that they really want to see. And even the administration says that there's just no advantage. If you, if you have a look at the report, it says there's no advantage to changing the stops or the schedule because what you do is you have a knock-on effect uh, and at particular stops at particular times of the day, you mess up the schedule. So, uh, look, the only thing I, I say to you that um, we ought to agree is that the ratepayers are saying to us very clearly, don't do a thing, just leave it as it is. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Mackey? I would say one Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Councillor Kerr? Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. The other uh, problem with what's being put forward by Councillor Martin uh, is that Ratepayers, 91% are not actually saying do nothing. I don't know that 91% of them spoke on this. Uh, but what we do know about this uh, from the uh, workshop is that uh, prior to COVID, the problem with the service was uh, the usage of it uh, was such uh, the cost uh, per trip, uh, per use, per patron was $7 per trip on average. That's prior to COVID, $7 per trip per person. That is the equivalent of an Uber ride per patron, per user of the bus. Quite why we would remove a very sensible proposal to see whether we can improve and increase the number of patrons on this uh, bus service 
uh, when we've got a $7 per trip uh, cost at the moment is completely beyond me. Um, I'd urge councillors not to vote for this amendment. What was put forward was completely sensible. It should be made, uh, it, it should be improved at all times, uh, and it should be uh, the case that more people are using it so that uh, the trip per person cost goes down. Because right now, uh, it's very hard to see ratepayers justify uh, that Uber trip uh, cost. Thank you, Councillor Kerr. Councillor Hyde? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand. I just have a, a couple of questions. Um, does this does this have any cost implications, or it's not clear? So the forty five thousand extra that we need is that predicated upon there being no uh, nothing happening in five point two, for example, that you try and find some efficiencies? Is is there a budget implication from um, just this? a moment, and I'll ask administration acting C. Uh, through the chair, my understanding is um, yes, it was, but I, I could just ask Matt Morrissey to clarify, please. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, the 45,000 identified in item two uh, refers to an incremental increase through uh, the provider for DIT for the service. Yeah, I know, but I, I'm just saying. So is that is that on the assumption that you're providing the same connected bus service to June 30? That is? Through, through the chair, correct. Yeah, okay. Um, and I was just wanting to expand on 34 um, in the report where you talk about um, on all days, the first and last services carried few to no passengers. Um, what What is few? Councillor Hyde. Sorry, sorry. Thank Lord. you. What is few? Because I mean, no passengers is pretty obvious, but how much is a few? Okay. How much? How many people are we moving? Through the CEO, acting CEO. Uh, thank you, uh, presiding member. Uh, Matt, could you please respond? Thank you. Back through the chair. Through the Lord Mayor, um, the number refers to between zero and ten. Uh, passengers. Between zero and ten. So we don't have a. Don't have a we don't, Lord Mayor, have a. I, I think the question is answered. And, we don't and, have and, and when we're talking about the first and last, is that the very first circulation and the very last circulation? Or is it the first couple? Like to say? Well, no, because um, part, parts of the. Sorry, Councillor council Sims was confused. The, the, the problem is parts of 34 talk about services in the plural and parts of it don't. So is it the very first and last or is it? If we can get clarification on that, I can see. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, I think it's the first two and last two. Um, but first Matt, two. back through the chair, could you please confirm uh, with the Lord Mayor? Through the Lord Mayor, that's correct. The, uh, the top and tail of the service uh, runs in 15 minute increments um, and there's generally between zero uh, to 10 patrons uh, on the first two and last two services. And through you, Chair, do we have a, a figure on how many had just zero? Acting C, do we have a, a figure on that? Through the presiding member, um, it's an average, so a big part of the methodology of the survey. So it's I can't answer that. Oh, so, so through you, Chair, where it says few to no passengers, that's actually just a description of the range. It's not actually saying there was definitely no one on it. Okay. All right, um, understood. And um, noting that it's the first two and the last two uh, each day, does the administration have a cost per, like, what, what is, for the connector bus, what does it cost to go around the city? Do we have, if, for, you, if for we look at a cost per trip. For, for per route? Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. For, yeah. Per loop? Yeah, per loop. So two services at the start, two services at the end. Do we have a uh, through the uh, Lord Mayor? Um, I'll have to take that on notice. I don't have that tonight, um, and uh, some part of those costings have been shared um, in earlier sessions uh, with members, whether it was through um, workshops or committee reports in relation um, to the full uh, connector bus service. Could have, oh. Thank you. And just just 
finally, uh, Lord Mayor, I'm assuming reading this, any any review that the that the CEO or the delegate undertakes, I'm reading that it would come back to us anyway. Is that because we're not authorising action? We're just saying review it. Thanks, CEO. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, if anything does require a council decision, then obviously the Chamber is the appropriate place to make that decision. Would it, would it be the through the, the would it be the view, Lord Mayor, that any changes to it at all would require a council decision? Or? I think the authorisation, as it reads, is authorising them to review. Um, which, as the acting CEO said, if there were changes, they would bring it through the Chamber. Okay. Um, Councillor Martin, you had a question. I had two actually, Lord Mayor, for the administration. Um, can they confirm that the $45,000 increase uh, that is required in the QF3 payment for this service is as a consequence of the state government negotiating a new contract with a provider as a means of reducing costs for the services? Thank you. Um, acting Sphere. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, if I can draw members' attention to page, oh, pardon me, I'm on the wrong court. Page five, or page, um, page five of your papers. Yep. Reconsideration 45,000 to address a funding shortfall resulting from DIT's new service contract. Ah, thank you. That's that's good. That's what I wanted to know. And further, um, I heard the administration and the Lord Mayor just say that any matter that was contained in the original motion would come back to council. Could it provide an explanation for 4.2, which is to undertake a review of service timetables and patronage with DIT to identify and remove? Identify and remove. That's the CEO. Um, least utilised services from the timetable to achieve operational cost savings while minimising impacts. I'm confused. The administration says it's coming back. The motion that was proposed says it's with the CEO to remove. So, Acting CEO, would you like to clarify that in case I have inadvertently given the wrong answer? Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, and through the Lord Mayor. If I could um, uh, just clarify, my read of that was authorising the CEO or delegate to undertake um, a series of pieces of work. Um, I think you asked, would that come back to the chamber? I think my response was, if a, dis if a decision um, it warrants um, council approval, then obviously that would be brought back to the chamber for council consideration. We would use our judgment um, and our um, to you know to work out whether there was you know um, changes of a substantial nature that nature that absolutely would require um, a council uh, decision. Oh, so remove the least utilised services to achieve operational costs doesn't mean remove it means bring it back to council. Thank you. Not necessarily. Sorry, through the presiding member. Oh. Not necessarily. Councillor Hyde, did you have a question? Sorry, that's what I was trying to get my head around. At what point, uh, Lord Mayor, does it come? Back where to is you? the threshold for if you're renaming a bus stop? I can understand that not coming back to council. If you're removing a route, I would think that is. Or if you're removing a service, sorry. Or if you're altering the route, I just I have no clarity as to where the line in the sand is. Uh, but we're ultimately answerable for it. So, acting C. Thank you. Through the presiding member, it's the judgment of the administration to decide whether um, that requires a council decision or not. Knowing the community um, feedback that we've received over many years on the value that this service um, is appreciated by sectors of the community, it would be our judgment if we were to remove a route, change things as to whether it requires you know, council consideration. It would be our judgment. Members, no, Councillor Hyde. Sorry. Um, uh, in, in that case, I'm, I'm I'm very open to supporting this. Um, then Lord Mayor, given the answer to that question, but there was something that I was originally going to suggest, and perhaps it's a variation, and it's a follow-on 
from my community's issue with it. Um, can I suggest that variation yes, to it? Right. Perhaps government's probably term needs to be an amendment, but um, uh, five uh, requests administration prioritize work to locate a low impact layover stop uh, to mitigate to mitigate the uh, uh, livability impact of the current layover in Hurdle Square. Okay, so you're asking if Councillor Martin will take that as yeah, a variation? Yeah, no, no yeah. Oh, so, sorry. Um, Hurdle, sorry, Hurdle Hurdle I do also have to ask the second to Councillor Mackey. Are you happy to take that? Thank you. Sorry, could it uh, lay over on Halifax Street, comma, adjacent Hurdle Square? Okay. Thank you. Halifax, so members, so we have a, uh, uh, a variation to, to that in front of you. Um, Deputy Lord Mid, you had your hand up before. Did you wish to speak? Yes, I do. Um, thank you. I don't have a problem with number four or five. Um, it's, it's stated in the report um, that, um, you know, the bus service could be better promoted. Um, obviously, Councillor Hyde knows his area and knows uh, in regard to that. But I do think it would be irresponsible for us if we don't review but I do feel a bit conflicted the fact that you know he doesn't come back into council every time something is reviewed. Um, I think that we we need to always look at the bus stops, what we're doing, the patronage, what, what they have here. I think it's irresponsible for us if we don't. So if taking that away, does that mean that that body of work will stop and it will just be the bus service? That's it. Still got review merit as we ask you to review. At number four, it's asking to review and report to council um, to, to better promote the service. But which... Are we reviewing the points as in 4.1, 4.2, or what are we? What, no, just promotion. Just the promotion. I just would read that as though we're just reviewing the promotion. Not what, what, not what we're directing the council to review. My understanding that it's just reviewing the promotion, but not reviewing stops, we're not reviewing. Anything else other than promotion? Is that my understanding? Correct. So, is it any way possible we can add in what the, to remove? If I could assist, Deputy Lord Mayor, the only way that you could do is to change the words um, authorised yeah. rather request the following reviews to be brought back to Council. Okay. So, if you if you if you could scroll down a little bit. So the only way would be to request that those reviews are undertaken and brought back to council. But that's up to the chamber, whether that's what you want. Councillor Simmons. Thanks, Lord Mayor. And look, uh, through you, Lord Mayor, I want to praise um, Councillor Martin for um, picking this up. Um, he's so often a thought leader on this council, and I think what he's identified here is a really important issue because I don't want to um, be uh, basically giving administration the opportunity to reduce the um, service or the routes that are being offered here. I think it is a really vital um, community service. Um, it's one that uh, people across the city um, rely on, and in particular you know, visitors to our city, but also local residents, lots of vulnerable people as well. And we have talked a lot um, on this council about wanting to save the um, service. And I think what Councillor Martin is proposing really reflects that intention, a desire to lock the service in um, and to uh, save it going forward. And I think that's really important, so I support it on that basis. Members. Sorry, Councillor Mackey, then Councillor uh, Hyde. Uh, um, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm happy to uh, have second, seconded this uh, this motion um, without repeating everything that um, others have said. Uh, we know this is 
a vital piece of city service uh, that for people, for members of our community and visitors to our community for whom uh, personal private transport access is difficult or indeed for reasons of mobility, uh, uh, the personal mobility issues, uh, they, they uh, uh, find the City Connector bus actually does just that. Um, the vast response uh, to the survey uh, tells us absolutely, and I commend our administration for having uh, led and commissioned that uh, piece of uh, work. And I encourage all members to vote for it. Thank you. Councillor Hart, is that a question? Uh, no, I'm assuming that variation doesn't mean I've spoken. <laughs> Thanks. Just helping you out. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. I think that was just a, a number of questions that have come from you yeah. so far. Cool. Okay. Um, no, I just wanted to I just wanted to thank Councillor Martin for drawing that. Um, sometimes there are diamonds in the rough there, and that was certainly one of them uh, for drawing that out. I uh, this is such an important service to our community, and I I read that original recommendation as review and bring absolutely anything else back to us. Um, uh, it's very interesting to see that wasn't the case. Of course, I have absolute faith um, uh, in our administration to make which is probably the best decision. But I think it's ultimately a, a political decision. I mean, we know the service losing money doesn't even do justice to it. We know the service is expensive, um, uh, relative to like for like services in other capital cities. But it's a political decision of ours to say it's important to people, and it is very important to people. Um, and I've always held that view. Um, uh, and, and it's also important to, uh, to many uh, in my ward who uh, traverse between the various social services at either end of the southern part of the city. Um, uh, and, and it's important for them to have access um, to those services. So uh, this is, I think, a, a good motion. Look, I think, uh, and, it, and it follows on from when, I think I proposed an amendment to say that we reject Dipti's offer of negotiation. And this all stems from that. It was very important for us to take a firm stance at that point in time because, uh, because we needed to draw a line in the sand and say, across this line, you do not go. Um, uh, and subsequently, they largely haven't. The 45 grand is, I guess, a consolation price. Um, but I assume they're bearing 50% of the cost of that increase to the service contract as well. So um, uh, look, ultimately, uh, this is not too bad. Again, we can bring that cost per trip down if we increase patronage. It's, it's very simple. And, and just as I've said in committee, and just as I've said in council, that should have always been our aim, um, uh, to extract more, to send, spend the same money, but to extract more value from that money um, uh, and that funding by getting more people on the service. And, and I, I just reflect, and I know it, um, uh, Councillor Martin said 91% of people that use it are happy with it, generally speaking, but of course they're only, you, for the most part, they're only the people using it. I am still interested in talking to the remaining uh, the remaining many hundreds of thousands of people that do come to the city in any given week who don't use the service at all. And that, that's who I think um, uh, four is aimed at. Um, uh, so I commend you for bringing that as well. Thank you, Councillor Martin. To sum up. Just to overcome Lord Mayor, so I've summed up, thanks. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? Division. That is carried. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand. Remain standing till all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Sims, Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Abraham Zeddo. Members, uh, 10.2 is Recreation and Sports Grants Round 1 Program and Events. I look for a mover. Councillor Martin and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Martin, did you wish to speak? Just briefly, Lord Mayor, I, uh, I speak in support of, uh, of this measure and uh, I regret and I do apologise uh, on uh, behalf of those of us who feel strongly about it to uh, Football for Social Change for not being able to grant them uh, as they requested and as we have done three year funding. As uh, the Chamber will remember, we voted to uh, end training or funding for sports and community programs like this one uh, when Councillor Kira proposed it, I believe. 
um, at uh, uh, Council last year. Um, unfortunately, um, they are not they are not going to receive um, uh, the money that they deserve for what is a commendable program, but I'm just delighted they are to receive one year's funding. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Knoll? Councillor Hyde? Just to clarify, I think that was me that proposed. Was it just? Uh, oh, I'm trying to take credit for Okay, thank you, Councillor Hyde. Members, any other speakers? If not, go back to Councillor Martin to sum up. No problem. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Uh, 10.3 members, 10 SSA Centre Court Development Stage 2. Um, um, I have Councillor Moran and seconder uh, Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, I mean, the motion is self explanatory. Of course, we, uh, we want uh, Memorial Drive SSA Centre Court Development to proceed. Um, that's a no-brainer. Obviously, there has to be a market rent review and um, notes the statutory um, consultation process, process on the existing 42-year lease. So I don't wish to debate this. It, as I said, it's a no-brainer and good luck to them. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Abraham today. Uh, Councillor Hyde and then Councillor Martin. Um, through you, Lord Mayor, could the administration uh, update us as to whether or not when we approve the construction of the roof, which I suppose is sort of state one of these, um, uh, and that came to council, was that in confidence or was that on the public agenda? Oh, acting CEO. Uh, through the presiding member, um, you are stretching my memory. Um, I think it did come through to APLA. Is there a link in this report as well, which had the original? Um, detail associated with the first stage in the roof. Um, but you are stretching my memory a little bit on that one. Oh, sorry, I don't recall either, Councillor. Um, uh, that's right, I'll, I'll, I'll follow it up. I was just would be intrigued to see who voted for that original one um, then and, and compare whether or not support for the no, I'm not sure how that's relevant, but um, certainly you can. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Martin. Thank you, uh, Lord Mayor. Look, I'm, my recollection is that was confidential, um, but uh, I can't recall. I'm afraid. Uh, never mind. Um, look, can I ask the administration before I speak what's happened to the uh, amendment that APLA made to this very motion, which proposed um, that um, council requests opportunities for greening of the internal and external areas be further explored. It doesn't seem to have come from APLA into council. Uh, I thought that had been incorporated in point one, but I will actually go to the acting C. Um, through the presiding member, obviously um, that recommendation for APLA was noted um, at your last council meeting on the 28th of January. A recommendation one tonight picks that up. So you'll see there that we reference uh, subject to the project incorporating green landscape initiatives as per um, APLA's advice. Okay, but uh, APLA talked about internal and external. Yeah, that's what you mean as well? Um, acting C. In greening initiatives. Uh, through the presiding member, um, I don't have my APLA reports uh, with me tonight, so normally I would write verbatim down what APLA says. Um, I don't have that, so I can't confirm whether it's internal and external, but I'm happy to take that on notice um, and make sure that um, the um, detail that APLA did share with us um, on that week is incorporated. I'm, uh, I'm, and I'm delighted to hear that uh, you write down verbatim all that APLA says. Um, now look, uh, I want to commend uh, uh, the administration for coming forward with this proposal. Um, it will um, serve the city well. It will be an asset to the city. Um, I am pleased to see that the, uh, the lease will come back uh, to council um, because the, uh, the current lease of $16,000 per annum is a bargain uh, for that site. Um, and, and I know even uh, Tennis SA and Tennis Australia uh, would probably agree that $16,000 is the sort of money that even um, uh, Djokovic and others wouldn't even get out of bed for, for a celebrity tournament. But that's our uh, annual lease. So I think a, a, uh, 
a market uh, reappraisal of that is a is a good idea. Uh, and I think, you know, knowing uh, the people involved, that uh, they'd probably be quite happy to welcome that. Um, may I say uh, also that um, uh, this uh, retention in this design of uh, the exterior, uh, the elements that were so uh, discussed and debated in this last term of council uh, feature prominently in this new design. I am grateful to see them there. Um, that brick archway design uh, says Adelaide Tennis uh, and it forever will as a consequence of uh, this design. Uh, so Lord Mayor, this is great. Delighted to vote for it uh, and I commend it to other members. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm, uh, I regret that my tennis prowess was never quite up to um, snuff. In fact, it was never anywhere um, uh, other than the high school tennis court. But uh, for myself and so many of my generation, before the, the uh, convention centre, before the entertainment centre, when there was just a polo stadium and Memorial Drive and very, very occasionally Adelaide Oval for music, uh, pop music, rock music concerts, Sherbet, Skyhooks, ACDC, Ted Murray Gang, um, Hush, um, uh, uh, Annie Lennox. Susie Lennox's Quattro. And, uh, you, <laughs> Susie Quattro, um, Rick Wakeman. Uh, the, these were the soundtrack of my life. And, and it was all at Memorial Drive. Um, and um, I think uh, the, the enhancements of, of this really uh, valuable cultural facility uh, is uh, uh, is to the city's credit, and um, I congratulate uh, the board management of um, Tennis SA uh, for and the South Australian government, uh, of course, uh, for their incredible uh, contribution. I encourage others to vote for it. Thank you, members. If not, I'll go back to Councillor Moran to sum up. Councillor Moran. Yes, look, I've forgotten also to Sorry, Councillor Brown, just do your microphone, thank you. For the retention of the lovely brick archways. And I must say, I'm not quite sure whether you're interested in what people voted for, but this council has always been incredibly supportive of Tennis SA and uh, their contribution to the parklands. And this is just one more step up to the roof, and I think it's marvellous. And I have, in the many talks we had with them, they listened to us and um, compromised in some areas, and they've done a terrific job. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against. Um, could I have that recorded as unanimous? Thank you. Uh, members, that takes us through. Now, I'll just have to check. Uh, that takes us to 10.7, which is the LGA Ordinary General Meeting. Uh, council, uh, I think, Councillor Sims, what I might do is procedural. Oh, no, actually, Sorry, we'll go straight to this because it's not yeah, a decision. Thank you, so, Lord Councillor Mayor. Sims, I'll, um, are you moving? Or no, I'm just wishing to disclose a perceived um, conflict of interest because the recommendation to be considered for the annual general meeting um, relates to statutory rate rebates. I work for a university which currently receives such a rebate. So in light of that, I will leave the room um, for the discussion. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, members, I'll look. look. Councillor Mackey. Oh, oh. And thanks uh, through you, Lord Mayor, um, uh, to uh, Rudy. Uh, can we clarify uh, if, if Councillor Sims, uh, on the basis of working for a statutory uh, entity, uh, has seen fit to leave the room, whether, uh, as I am in the employ of a statutory authority, uh, whether that is appropriate Thank for you, me as well? Thank you, Councillor. will just um, advise. So, members, I will look for a mover and a seconder, uh, which will also look after the procedural, and then I'll go back for nomination. So I'll look for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Hyde, and a seconder, Councillor Knoll. Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak to it? Councillor Hyde, members? If not, I'll go to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? And that is carried. Um, 
Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Abbott here today. Uh, members, uh, we are looking for a uh, uh, now the nominations for the council delegate and also for a deputy council delegate. And I'll look to the floor for nominations. Deputy Lord Mayor. I'd like to nominate you, Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. I'll accept that nomination. Uh, are there further nominations? Councillor Abigail today. Deputy delegate uh, and deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor, do you accept that nomination? Yes. Are there any other nominations? Uh, if not, we no, I'll ask for a mover. But thank you, Councillor Hyde. Second to Councillor Abraham today. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Um, members, that takes us to, oh, I'll just wait for the council. If you could ask the council members to rejoin us, please. And we'll go to 10.8. Members, we'll, we'll have a um, break at the end of this, um, uh, at the end of reports. Thank you. Members, we're on 10.8, which is the Q2 Finance Report. Councillor Martin, second to Councillor Hyde. Councillor Martin. Um, uh, no, no, I did not uh, wish to move this. I wanted to ask some questions. I'm sorry. Lord. Thank you. Councillor Hyde, are you happy to move? Uh, members, I look for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Knoll. Thank you. Um, Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak? I only had questions as well, but happy to move. Um, may I? Ask some questions? Yes. Certainly. Thank you. Um, uh, I note that in committee uh, I asked uh, a couple of questions which I haven't seen answers come to through, so it's no, there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just wondering if there's been any work done. Um, the $13,000 for urgent bridge renewal works through your board now. Uh, acting CEO. Through the presiding member, um, apologies, we did um, send out an EU's. No, my apologies, today. you did. I um, so Th uh, that's apologies okay. if you that. haven't had time to read it. The 13,000 um, question that you had asked around the bridge renewals um, was um, in relation to some but that's um, okay. yeah. urgent work for um, one of the bridge projects. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank, Thank you, you. Councillor. Have um, other uh, questions, or are you speaking to? And well, I had another question around the one hundred and eighty thousand dollars for subscriptions. But did I get is that? Okay, don't worry. It's obviously all in the EU, so I'll just read that. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Um, Councillor Knoll, you second it. Did you wish to speak, Councillor Martin? You had a question. Uh, yes, I did, Lord Mayor. Um, the uh, the administration report um, mentions the. Uh, decision of council to ask the chief executive officer to identify $20 million in permanent operating expenditure savings this financial year, this current financial year. And it says, while good progress has been made towards achieving this target as part of our reshaping our organized our organization project, not all savings will be realized this year. Additional opportunities for achieving ongoing savings will be discussed with council as part of the 21-22 business plan. Um, could the administration tell us what is the proportion of the $20 million in savings which has not been achieved? Acting CEO. Uh, through the presiding members, it's due to um, mainly timing in relation to when the structure was implemented. Um, so when the 20 million um, decision was made, we placed that into the long-term financial plan for this financial year. Um, but obviously staffing costs um, were higher during the first six months than what they're expected for the second six months. Um, in terms of actual numbers, Sonjo, are you able to clarify or um, Nicole, please? 
through the presiding member, of the 20 million identified, we have achieved identified, sorry, approximately 18 million of that 20. And through the current financial year being 2021, we have identified approximately 13 of the 20 will be realised this financial year. Sorry, I missed that last bit. Could I have that again? So, Nicola, you have to repeat that. So, through the presiding member, of the $20 million for 2021, we will achieve approximately $13 million. Um, okay, I understand. So, um, is that seven million dollars shortfall reflected in a revised long-term financial plan? Acting CEO, through the presiding member, um, Nicole, could you please confirm? Um, through the presiding member, the full twenty million dollars has been attributed across the long-term financial plan. What we have is a provision for transition costs. Those transition costs will then be used to offset the shortfall we have in achieving the 20 million this financial year. I'm sorry, Lord Mayor, I just don't understand. If there's a 7 million shortfall, shouldn't that be reflected in the long term financial plan? Acting C. Back through the presiding member, I will need to hand to Nicole. My understanding is she's answered that for you, I, Councillor. I get it, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, one other way to do this, as always, is we do offer our finance staff the opportunity to sit down with members individually to just go through some of this uh, more uh, complex uh, financial account accounting treatment. So I'm really happy to continue to offer that service to all members. But in the meantime, could you please clarify again? Thank you, Nicole. Through the presiding member, of the $20 million um, target, we have achieved and incorporated 17 million ongoing. So we're short, oh, sorry, 17.6, we're short approximately $2 million. We have incorporated that target as an ongoing target in the long-term financial plan. The workshop, which will be conducted on the 23rd of February, will discuss with council members options in order to achieve and bridge that $2 million gap. Uh, no, I do understand that. I do understand that there is a need to have a discussion um, about how we realise that almost $3 million shortfall in the ongoing savings. But in the current financial year, the administration has said we have fallen short of that $20 million because of timing issues by about $7 million. And my question is, is that incorporated into the figures for the long-term financial plan? If you're seven million dollars short, it knocks on. That's that's the question. I think that was answered, but as that was there, answered as a yes. As was answered, it is in the long-term financial plan. So I think that was the answer to the okay, question. Okay, I didn't hear that. I yeah, sorry, I did. I hear did that. hear that. So thank you. And um, is it uh, correct? Uh, could the administration advise at page thirty under receipts? that the city intends to sell down uh, about $60 million worth of assets in the CBD in the next four years. Is that correct? Acting CE. Sorry, could um, the councillor provide, sorry, which page? I'm working off the- um, uh, Page council. 30. Uh, page 30 of the, uh, of the financial report. Um, I'll give you a page number. Oh, it's only page 30, page 130 at the top, and Appendix B, Long-Term Financial Plan. Is that is that correct or have I not added it correctly? That's $60 million worth of assets that we're selling in the next four years. Thank you, Acting C. Through the presiding member, that's correct. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, just one uh, uh, second last question. The QF1 uh, report shows borrowings for 29.30 at $126 million. I have that report here. That's the QF1, which I can show you if it helps. Um, page 28 of the QF2 report shows that amount has gone up to 150 million just on. What, why is that? I, I don't understand. Through the Pasadi member, that will be in relation to decisions that Council has made. Nicole, can you provide some further clarity, please? Um, 
through the presiding member, the papers with you this evening incorporate an additional year, so you get to 3031, QF1 only incorporated up until 2029-30, so 2029-30, based on the report tonight, is a borrowing of 111.4 million. So the, the 3031 figure that, or the figure I'm reading, almost 150 million for, it's 149 something, is for 3031. That is correct. That is what she said. No, that's great. I understand that. Uh, and just finally, I note from page 16 that the Quentin Kernahan play space was open to the public in December. Does that mean that the state government funds for that project uh, have been expended? Through the presiding member, that was grant funding. Um, presumably we received it. Can you please confirm, Clinton? Uh, through the presiding member, we have uh, received the funding, but um, we're still working through the practical completion of the project and the funds will be acquitted once that's achieved. Uh, and uh, just finally, in relation to that, I note that the project doesn't appear to be over. Page 16 shows two additional items which are uncosted. Um, could the administration provide an explanation for that? Acting C. Through the presiding member, I'll take that on notice and Thank provide you. that to members via e news. Thank you. Thank you. I have Councillor, I've lost track. I think Councillor Mackey had next. Uh, um, thanks, Lord Mayor. Through you, uh, just a, a couple of questions uh, for clarification. In uh, paragraph 13, um, uh, the references to an allocation of 0.9 million, uh, a stimulus program, and then there's a list of items. When I go into the actual uh, report, um, it appears those uh, those items add up to 1. Point, uh, where am I? 1.05 million. Can I just clarify that uh, through you, Lord Mayor? Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Um, acting C. Uh, through the presiding member. Um, that's in relation to a decision made back in uh, on the 15th of December in relation to the City Business Stimulus Programme. Um, we've reprioritised 150,000 um, from existing budgets to help fund that and then obviously allocated 900,000 of new money. Um, uh, thank you. And, and uh, through you again, Lord Mayor, um, I'm just interested if there's a sense of, of what evidence there is that property owners are passing on rate deferrals uh, um, that have been granted to their, their tenants. Acting CEO, are you happy to answer that? Uh, through the presiding member, that's an interesting um, question and I think um, I can't say hand on heart how that is occurring across the city. I think all of us here in the chamber have received anecdotal evidence from um, tenants around um, how supportive their landlords have been and from other tenants how unsupportive their landlords have been. Um, I don't know if there's any more data or insight, um, but um, you know it, it's mixed, but we do get feedback from many tenants saying their landlords have been phenomenal and they wouldn't be operating today without the support of the landlord. Uh, um, thank you. Uh, and again, through you, Lord Mayor, just an observation. So, uh, um, paragraph 18, the uh, North Adelaide Golf Course favourable income. I've never understood golf. Um, uh, but I, I wonder, I guess, given that our business is booming during COVID, whether this is something of a, the dividend of the work from home arrangements where people are availing themselves of the saved travel time and spending a little bit more time on the golf course. You don't need to comment. That's just a a, a tongue-in-cheek comment. And um, just a, a, a question in regard to Para 22, work in progress write-off forecast. And I do apologise for not asking this in, in committee. It just slipped my notice until a second read through. And um, just if some, if you could just explain what is the WIP write-off? So, uh, acting CEO. Through the presiding member, uh, we've been focusing on our um, work in progress a lot more dil diligently over the last couple of years. Um, Clinton, perhaps do you want to give an overview of the work that you've done together with your team? Yeah, through the presiding member, um, just in relation to councillor's question, 
um, the decrease in the WIP forecast is basically because of the, um, the timing of works. So $1.2 million worth of work um, has not been accounted for in quarter two, therefore that reduces our forecast right off for that quarter. So it's really just um, an early indication that um, our, our, our WIP write off uh, may be um, decreased at the end of financial year. Councillor Hunt, did you have another question? Uh, yes, Lord Mayor, now having read the e news, um, uh, I'm just wanting to clarify whether or not the 13,000 um, that is transfer has been transferred into urgent work for bridges was actually transferred because it's needed and it's going to be used for something. And if so, I think the crux of it is what is it going to be used for? What are the urgent works that require attention that that $13,000 will be used for? I can see. Um, through the presiding member, in a $200 million budget, I can't actually answer the $13,000 question, so I'll have to take that back on notice and um, send that out um, under uh, correspondence during the week. Thank you. That's, that's Thank fine. You. I just, that was the original, sorry, question in the committee. Um, uh, look, I'll save quest other questions for later. Members? Councillor Martin? Yeah, look, uh, Lord Mayor, it'll come as no surprise um, that um, I am uh, concerned about our financial position. Um, I do understand that uh, fees and charges have gone up two million. We made some savings um, through cancellation of events like Tour Down Under, um, Superloop, New Year's Eve and so on. Um, uh, they are changes um, that are short term, one would hope. And then uh, we are making savings by not maintaining assets. We are certainly well below uh, the recommended asset maintenance. We're cancelling projects. $1.2 million was just referred to in, uh, in relation to the WIP fund. Um, and um, th there are other matters too, which I think should be uh, at least contemplated when reviewing all this, as uh, the questions on notice uh, responses will show. Um, there is any any kind of provision for uh, what happens when the car park at the central market closes at the central market arcade when that's redeveloped and unquestionably the authority will come and ask us to replace that revenue um, there's no um, projection in here either for sorry, sorry the point of point of clarification lord mayor councillor martin's making representations about the authority and their intent with no standing or intelligence as to what they're actually intending on doing, and I can assure them they're not um, asking. Thank you, to Councillor Hyde. We'll let Councillor Martin continue. He was actually making a comment. No, look, I'm always happy to hear debate. Um, thank you, anyway. Um, and uh, additionally, um, you know, the, the proposal that was endorsed in principle here at Council at our last meeting, which uh, diverts revenue from the redevelopment uh, at the Central Market Arcade to the Central Market. It's going to cost us up to $7 million a year. And there's there's certainly no mention, obviously, of that uh, here. Um, and then there's the sale of assets, which is occurring. I mean, that's, that's pretty desperate, 60 million. So, uh, uh, Lord Mayor, um, it is not something you can really support. I, it's, it's a bit... Um, of a bad uh, result and it looks to me to be even worse so to be sitting here endorsing it and saying well this is you know something that I'm happy with um, I won't be able to do uh, I'm sure some members will but um, I think we need to start saying with these reports uh, when the financial position is not satisfactory that we don't endorse them. Thank you. Acting C, did you wish to clarify anything in that statement? Uh, through the presiding member, um, so just comments around the uh, Central Market Arcade um, and the um, Central Market Authority. There is a workshop um, for council members to be worked through um, on the 16th of February um, and I think members will have a clearer understanding of the implications around any sort of charter review and what that means for its financial position after that workshop. Councillor Hyde. I think that was more to clarify than that. Um, uh, the, the work in progress, is, is that, that 1.2 million, was that retimed or is that scrapped entirely? Or is it a bit of a mixture? Um, acting C. 
through the presiding member, um, my understanding from what Clinton said, it was around retiming, not stopping projects. Right. right. And that's that's the first of, of many things that were that were patently incorrect with what Councillor Martin said. Sorry, I'm talking now. No, no, no. Um, uh, because because there were just so many um, uh, incorrect assertions made in that address. Um, and I just remind councillors that had the motions that Councillor Martin brought to this chamber been carried, our position would be uh, at least this financial year around $35 million Thank worth you, of... Thank you, Councillor Hyde, we're Mayor, talking which, to which this motion, Q2. I, you know, you well, yeah, this, this quarterly report would be far worse. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Um, you um, are talking to the Q2 finance report. And, and moreover, 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 Lord Mayor, um, uh, the central market, when you consider it, uh, it is actually entirely uh, there on our books. Um, we don't have the ability to separate out something entirely. Um, uh, so it may be a little bit of a money go around, and I think we're looking to rectify that with the decision of council. Um, uh, but it all sits there anyway, whether it's debt or whether it's not, um, uh, it's all there. So to claim that we're going to be $7 million worse off is just wrong. It's wrong. Uh, to say that there is no plan for the car park is wrong. And um, I'll refer to, uh, I think, a recent news report from yesterday, uh, which highlighted the plan for another 400. Councillor, I'll give you a come back to talking but, to the motion. Well, well, I'm sorry, Lord Mayor, but if you're not going to allow me points of clarification and you're not going to allow me to debate the rubbish that's just been brought out into the chamber, then what, what, what are we supposed to do here? Um, uh, this report, this report uh, is a lot better than it could have been. Um, it's a lot better uh, uh, than it would have been if the operational savings that five out of 11 people here voted against uh, were actually unsuccessful. Um, uh, and, and, and our prudential limit would be fast upon us um, had we not done that. Um, uh, it's, it's a report which is actually $5 million better off, and I want to commend the administration for that. Um, it is no mean feat uh, to find $5 million um, uh, with, with six months left to go. If I could just have one more minute. Uh, it's, no, it's no mean feat uh, to find that. Our administration have been working incredibly hard uh, to do so, um, and I want to commend them. This is not a bad report. And I also want to commend the efforts um, of our financial team, our new financial team, as they are um, in many ways, uh, for bringing a report that is incredibly clear. Um, it is one of the clearest reports I have ever seen. There is a lot of detail in there, and I, I think it's a good thing that I can ask a question about $13,000 in a $200 million budget. I think that's a very, very good thing, and it means that this council is more transparent than ever, and that is because of the good work, um, uh, particularly of the acting CEO uh, as, as the relevant director in that space um, in recent times, um, but also of the other teams of council. So, uh, so I reject the notion that this is a bad report. This is a report of the facts as they are. There's no such thing um, as a bad uh, set of facts, unless we want to start talking about alternative facts, um, and that's certainly something that some people would want to do. Um, but Lord Councilor Mayor, Hyde. I want to commend Councilor this report. Hyde. I want to commend the team behind it. Thank you. Um, that's your time. And I want to urge them to find even more savings. Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Did you wish to speak? Thank you. Uh, just a quick question. One, this uh, proposed sixty million dollars that is going into a future fund, isn't it? Isn't that what the, uh, that is about? Acting CE. Uh, that's correct. Yes. So um, through council policy decisions, um, any um, result from a divestment of an underperforming asset goes into the future fund. Okay. And uh, we are having a workshop you know, on, on the finances and that coming up very shortly. That's correct. I've got a great night planned for you on the 23rd of February. Please do all join us. Okay, just like a couple of words on that. I mean, yes, this is a great result so far, simply because the amount of effort, et cetera, and, and uh, what great sacrifice that administration has done. Um, and yes, it is clear, and it's, it's, we're starting to really be able to get to uh, all, the, all this, the fine detail. But also, I mean, the, we are doing uh, projections 10 years out. So these are uh, uh, situations, particularly say the 60 million that we're looking at potentially uh, realising because they're not uh, making any, any money for us or not enough is what we should be. So this is just enabling us to make good forward decisions. Also, I mean, we've made lots of decisions of this council, not, not increasing the rate of the dollar, all sorts of things. So. These, this does reflect those sorts of situations, but the other side is that we are, it's incumbent upon us 
to support these these motions, uh, they were, so these finances, etc., by coming up with alternative ways of getting income. So some of it maybe we're you know, increasing the, the fees and charges, or other ways that we can uh, provide value to our ratepayers and the greater community, and that will support this even greater. So no, I do thank you know the administration for its work and the opportunity to really re redesign our uh, way of, of you know financing the council. Thank you. Members, I've got Councillor Martin first and then Councillor Sims. I'm sorry, Councillor Sims. Just a question, uh, Lord Mayor, in response to the administration's assertion that the sale of assets will go into a future fund, is it also the case that the future fund will fund the Council's construction costs for the Central Market Arcade redevelopment? Acting CA. Through the presiding member, um, no, I don't think it is, unless it's part of, no, that's correct, Nicole. Well, it's in one of the questions, uh, responses to the questions on notice, so it's changed since the question on notice response was filed. I don't have that right with me. We're talking about this report tonight. We can discuss uh, the future fund um, and the relationship to the Central Market Arcade. I'm happy, happy to do that. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Councillor Sims. In the interest of time, Lord Mayor, I'll uh, waive my speaking rights. Um, just before I go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up, I would also like to um, acknowledge the acting CEO and her team for the presentation of financial accounts um, and also the work that's been done to identify and find savings and efficiencies in this budget um, with a better than hoped for um, operational uh, deficit at the end of the financial year and also reduction in council borrowings. Um, Councillor Hyde, if you'd like to sum up. Uh, just briefly, uh, the uh, the COO, that the finance is set up to that position now, don't they? They do, indeed. Excellent. Well, I just want to flag that I was chatting with the City of Holdfast Bay Councillor today and uh, they speak very highly of Justin Lynch. And <laughs> even though we're only in his very capable hands for a few minutes, um, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very pleased. Um, and I would say, uh, you know, there is still plenty of room for efficiency. Um, uh, in that budget, and I'm very, very uh, eager to see uh, what is brought out, especially when a fresh pair of eyes um, is looking at it. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against. Division, division. That is carried. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand, remain standing till all names have been called. Councillor Ho, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Carer, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Abraham today. Uh, members, that takes us to 10.9 on the agenda, which is the ratings policy 21-22. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, again, I wish to uh, disclose a um, perceived um, conflict of interest. It relates uh, to point two, and to manage the conflict of interest, I request that um, the uh, points of the motion be taken separately. Yes, um, The conflict arises, Lord Mayor, because I work for a university which is named in point two. However, I remind members that it is only for noting. Um, so to manage the conflict, I will um, remain in the chamber, but I will not vote in relation to um, point two. Okay, thank or, you. Or engage in debate related to that item, but I will um, discuss the, the broader recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Sims, and I'm happy to take it in parts. Uh, members, I am looking for a mover. Thank you, Councillor Hyde, and a seconder. <coughs> Councillor Knoll, Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak to it? Um, Councillor Knoll, did you wish to speak to it? No, members? Councillor Martin. Uh, look, just to say, uh, Lord Mayor, that I won't be uh, supporting this this uh, rating uh, policy. Um, it is based on principles that I don't believe people should support. Um, first, uh, the premise that if it wasn't for all those bloody charities and churches, schools and universities, um, this council would be better off by $35 million. And, and let me say, I, I don't agree with charging rates to people who feed the homeless, 
charging rates to people who provide religious guidance and support, charging rates to hospitals who treat the sick. That's exactly what this is about. That you're saying in here, the principle is, let's charge the charities rates, let's charge the hospitals, let's charge the churches. That is the argument. We are financially incompetent, therefore we need this money. And I think that's just a, an odious response. In fact, I think it's pretty bankrupt, to be honest. Um, now, I think it's also pointless. These exemptions apply in every local government area, in every state in Australia. They are legislated by state and federal government. And it is a waste, an absolute waste of the chamber's time and the administration's time in writing to federal and state governments saying, oh, we're poor, let us tax you. It's just a waste of time. And the second reason uh, why no reasonable person would support this is because it proposes doing away with the current special discretionary rebate, increasing it by 50%. This has protected many in the community, including the elderly, who through no fault of their own are lumped with large rate increases and the special discretionary rebate allows us to cap that at 10% to provide them with the opportunity to get their financial affairs in order so that they can pay for those increases. That's going out the window. We're saying to the poor, to the elderly, too bad, we're broke. And the third reason is the notion that the city will look at introducing measures to apply a levy or a separate rate to fund special projects. And that, Lord Mayor, is also bankrupt. Councils for decades have been able to do that from their general budgets, not without resorting to going to the community and saying, we now need a special fund to do up O'Connell Street or to do up Rundle Mall. Lord Mayor, this is a dud. I won't support it. I urge members to not support it. Ratepayers will remember you supported this. Members, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thank you. Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, slight vari variation on the, the lens, but I have a lot of sympathy for some of the concerns that um, Councillor Martin has expressed. I, I do honestly believe it is disingenuous of this chamber to make a public statement that says that universities, churches, charities, um, people who have always enjoyed the protection of this rate rebate. And indeed, um, I understand also state government um, uh, owned land. We are a creature of state government. We exist because of acts of the South Australian Parliament. We're not a sovereign tier of government. And uh, I think that it is, uh, it, it, it concerns me that we're, we're we're creating a straw man that says we have, um, because of uh, these organisations that are, we're not charging a rate to, that we're 35.5 million worse off. It, it's actually, it, it, we, this, all, this council has always managed um, uh, without having to go to this place, which will create hostility uh, and um, uh, aggravation. Um, our universities contribute employment, retail, um, car parking, dare I say it, um, to um, a revenue to, to our city. Um, the, to embark upon a, a motion that actually um, uh, makes a point of um, uh, putting it up the nose of um, these organisations, I, I find disappointing and, and look, Regretfully, I also am very concerned about um, the uh, the rationale for the uh, change in the um, uh, payment uh, for the, or the, the concession for um, uh, pensioners and um, uh, self-funded retirees. Even though we can point to what other jurisdictions have done, local government jurisdictions have done, and even though we can point to the um, uh, the fact that the state government has, makes a, a, a different sort of payment than it did in the past. For the last five years since that payment was brought in, uh, the previous councils have seen fit to maintain uh, that concession. So for those who are, uh, would risk losing that concession, that is the same thing as an increase in their rates. 
Um, and um, for that reason, I honestly cannot support this. So I will remind members that this is a draft uh, for consultation that will go out with their bu a budget, um, uh, with the annual business plan budget um, that we are noting and that there were several things, amendments that were put forward, such as a consideration of a separate rate for specific funded projects and activities that were not endorsed by the council when we went through that. So, um, which is at 7.2 and 7.4. Um, members, back to my page. Did I have any? Thank you, Councillor Knoll. Just a, a couple of comments towards the uh, rate right policy. And one is, I mean, it is, it is a sort of a normal business practice anyway to uh, calculate the monies foregone, income foregone uh, for certain areas. And this is would fall into that simply because you need to value these things as part of the, of the city and, and how we see our finances. And nextly, when we look at that, we can say, well, how does this burden um, affect us differently? And we, we, I remember that we had a component in there uh, in one of the comments and that uh, we have between 21 and 22% of our potential rates, forgetting what the, the purposes are, as against Melbourne, which I think was 12.6. So when we're talking to our governments, when we talk to our, our, you know, people around us and federal governments and such, we need to be able to remind that we, we have the expenses of running a city, yet a large, a large proportion of our uh, potential income uh, or the expense of running the city is, is carried by a, a, a smaller number of rate payers. So this is just to keep that conversation alive because we are, you know, we do need to uh, remember what we, you know, that we are in a state that uh, has this sort of difference, and it is important that when we have a conversation with state governments, that they they uh, use that as part of the conversation to, because we are uh, excessively burdened, nearly twice as much. Thank you, Councillor Knoll, Councillor Moran. Uh, yes, I don't want to keep that conversation alive. These um, exemptions are brought about by legislation above us, so it's a waste of time saying, you know, I oh, wish we could uh, rate these people. We can't. And you cannot compare Melbourne to Adelaide. Melbourne, um, the hospitals and the universities and many of the things that are inside, we are lucky enough to have inside our council area two universities, uh, multiple hospitals, private and public, uh, schools, we're supposed to be the education city and now we're bitching about um, these places don't, we can't rate the rates out of them. Um, so you can't compare Melbourne and Adelaide, they're different and we're luckier because we have these institutions, they're not a burden to us, they're a gift to us. We are the, the we're like Cambridge and Oxford, we have, I knew that Junior over there would spark up here, uh, the constant refrain from the hard right is that the universities are run like a business. I can't really see anything wrong with that, seeing that the hard right's always also asking us to run like a business, um, and they should be rated. Who do you think is going to pay those rates? Do you think the university professors and, uh, and uh, the boffins there are going to uh, chip in their salary for the rates? No, the students are going to be paying it. So it's a ridiculous, and, uh, and because I used to respect Jesse's uh, views. I put up with it, but it is ridiculous. Camp Councillor Moran, you don't um, know Councillor Kerry. The students, views. we cannot be uh, encouraging students to come here and then rate the universities out of existence. They will then move into different areas where the land's not so valuable and they don't pay so many rates. We have no control over these exemptions. So what is the point of putting it in here? Because you know what it does? It flags that we want to rate them. We don't want to rate them. The, these rates will be passed on to the most vulnerable and to our students who also are our most vulnerable. So just put a stop to this nonsense, delete this part. We never get the income, we will never get the income and we never should get the income. Uh, Councillor Carra. I'm sorry, Lord Mayor, Look, given the discussion seems to be centering oh, sorry, primarily on the, the yep. rates um, exemption issue, I will uh, leave the room. Even though it is a perceived conflict, out of abundance of caution, I'll do it. Okay, thanks, Councillor Sims. Councillor Carra. I'll be brief if I can, Lord Mayor. Um, I, I, I think it's really much to do about nothing. I, I, you know, uh, there's a statement there, what effect that'll have, who knows. Um, I simply am compelled uh, to address uh, and to speak at all because of the just absurd rhetoric that's been thrown around. 
um, hard right. Councilman. Um, we're yeah. going to, we've heard from Councilor Mayor, what, what was it? We, we're going to rate them out of the universe, out of existence. We want them gone. Let's be at least a little bit sensible about this. And I, and I would draw uh, Councillor Mackey's attention to this as well. Um, there are shades of grey here. And I know Councillor Mackey has a history in government. Councillor Mackey, I, I know, would understand how taxation works uh, and would understand the problem when you've got very large distortions. What is happening at the moment uh, and has been happening is that universities, have, in particular, universities have expanded. Uh, they've expanded dramatically. They've taken over formerly rateable land uh, and they are not paying rates. And the effect of that is that they are being subsidised by small businesses. And the effect of that means that they are being subsidised by poor uh, and low income workers. They are being subsidised by poor and low income workers. That is what is going on. And to shake one's head uh, and to pretend that isn't real, I think, I think really demonstrates the kind of uh, ivory tower uh, uh, discussions. Uh, Lord Mayor, I, I do um, take exception to uh, this inference. It's fine for us to disagree and do so respectfully. I don't see any uh, occupation. Uh, I don't see any point of order here. Is there a point of order here, Lord Mayor? You're a, you have actually been asked, Councillor Mackey has called a point of order. Sorry, but I'm, I'm, what was the point of order, if you could clarify? Councillor Mackey. Um, Lord Mayor, the point I was making is that it is one thing to respectfully disagree. I, I do take exception to that being called plain politics. Okay. Uh, and I know that uh, Councillor Kerry is not the only member to do so, uh, have done so this evening. Um, but uh, to impugn by, uh, by the tone the occupation of a fellow elected member, um, I find disrespectful and I would ask him to withdraw that. Uh, look, that is noted. Uh, I would say in response to Councillor Mackey, I'm not seeking to impugn uh, Councillor Mackey's occupation, uh, but I was speaking broadly about slurs cast in my direction. Um, in particular, okay. the, statements, the statements that this is uh, uh, all hard right stuff and that, that this is uh, all about uh, not considering, um, you know, not considering all the good and all the benefit the universities uh, do. That I will, I will state again, that is ivory tower thinking. I will not resolve from that. I will not resolve from that statement. And if Councillor Mackey takes Mackie offence of that, if Councillor Mackey takes offence of that, well, take, so takes be, exception to what is being said. If Councillor Mackey takes exactly. that, that is noted. But I will not resolve from stating, as before, this is ivory tower thinking. Thank you. What I will say is that the Council Mackey takes exception to what is being said. If Councillor Mackey takes that, that is noted. But I will not resolve from stating, as before, this is ivory tower thinking. What is happening is the small businesses and therefore uh, low income workers are subsidising universities. Thank you, That's Councillor the Kerry. Your time that, that is, is the up. At the moment. Um, I'm sorry, Lord Mayor. I, I would ask for another minute, please. Oh, Councillor. Oh. Um, so uh, let's be clear, there is nuance to this. Um, yes, the statement is there, it's questionable as to whether the statement should be there about this at all. No one wants schools to pay rates, the universities in particular, it is not disingenuous for our ratepayers to know about this. In fact, they should know about this. Uh, they should be aware that what we've got is essentially large, expanding, private, almost uh, uh, almost pseudo-private, least private in motive in, in many cases, uh, expansionist universities. Uh, increasing their footprint and not paying rates. Why should a small deli uh, pay thousands of dollars in rates and a giant university pay zero in rates? That is the uh, important nuance here. And I think this should be better served with a lot less of this absolutely divisive rhetoric. Right. Members, I will actually bring you back. We are talking about the ratings policy. We can do so. Uh, in a manner that debates the topic without actually all having to cast aspersions at each other's views. And I will actually please ask you to remember that for those that haven't spoken yet. Councillor Abraham today, I've got you next, and then Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, just a couple of uh, just a couple of comments. I. Um, I, I agree with what Councillor Martin was saying earlier about the, the not-for-profits. Those that are doing good work, uh, not having to pay 100% of the rates, and um, uh, under, legis under current legislation, they get a 75% discount, which, which they should, because they do good work for the community. Universities, on the other hand, um, are, uh, are a different beast, and, are, and, are, um, uh, and I think Councillor Kira highlighted something important. I'm going to build on that. It's um, 
it's my understanding that businesses on university premises don't pay rates. So when you look at that, when you look at that setup, so you have a cafe inside a university uh, that doesn't pay rates, and then you've got a cafe pretty much across the road that does pay rates. Um, how is that meant to be fair? Uh, and I'm happy to be to be corrected here. So, Actually, uh, if I can correct you, yes, um, there are some businesses within the university, and they are rateable. So uh, a lot of the discussion here is making sure that the rates look set for public purpose on public land, and that there are when there's a change of use to a commercial um, that we can look at that. But currently, there are uh, a number of commercial uh, operations within the university in the rates. Okay, so some some businesses within universities do pay rates, and some don't. Is that? No, uh, businesses that are deemed commercial within the university pay rates. They all pay rates. But the university okay. itself doesn't. Okay. Pay yep. That, that's fine. I'm happy to be corrected. So let's let's wipe that off. Uh, but but really, looking at uh, um, look, looking at some of these universities, and I quickly googled one of uh, one of the universities and their uh, uh, you know the, the amount of profit they make. And this is pre-COVID, so I'm mindful that uh, international students' uh, numbers have been um, uh, have been impacted. But Pre-COVID for uh, uh, 2019, one university uh, net operating result for the year is about 40 million dollars. So um, uh, that's this. These are the sorts of uh, institutions and organisations that we're uh, that we're dealing with here. Um, and, and, and if I was to take one step further and look at universities taking over rateable properties, then it makes that property um, non rateable uh, so that's that's the sort of thing that uh, that we need to be mindful of here. Um, uh, I know there was some uh, conversation about state government agencies and uh, I guess Crown land not uh, not paying rates. Uh, uh, if if I can be a bit cheeky and just say that uh, uh, my workplace uh, uh, as a government agency does pay the rates, so uh, it's um, at least good to know that uh, some government agencies do that. Deputy Lord Mayor, and then Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, prior to coming on to council, well, I am still a rate payer, and I, I was always a little bit very annoyed when councillors would, uh, wouldn't allow consultation to take place. And this is what this is. This is a draft for a consultation to take place to go out to the rate payers. We're not making a decision here. Um, we're allowing our rate payers to speak for themselves and to let us know um, what their thoughts are. So I just want councillors to be mindful, though we, we are uh, debating who should and who should pay rates and who's a bigger empire and who isn't. I think at the end of the day, this is about sending out um, this consultation out there to the public to um, make a comment on them. I think they have that right to do that. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Yes, yes, Councillor Mackey, if there's a um, point of clarification. Thank you, Lord Mayor. It's just a point of clarification. Um, and I, I do understand what the Deputy Lord Mayor um, is saying that this is about going out to public consultation. I guess the reason I'm not going to support this motion in relation to going out to public consultation is that what we are proposing in many parts so is that's only not, going that's... to visit pain upon us. Um, and uh, that's point of, point of sorry, that's not really a point of clarification. But um, members, I have Councillor Ho. Roma, just a question though. Like, I, I hear the administration's answer to Councillor Opportunity done that those cafe and commercial shops within the universities are actually readable, right? Some of them, but yes. my, my question here are though, like, I mean. For the what, what what if like the universities, schools, churches, hospitals own some commercial properties and investment properties? Are they readable? Acting C. Through the presiding member. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Moran. <laughs> um, I think Councillor Moran answered that question. So if it's outside their footprint and it's used for educational purposes, then they don't pay rates. But what if it is not for educational purposes? Because I, I mean, like some, some of those buildings owned by churches, they're not, not used for churches. Are they readable? Uh, if they're used for commercial purposes, then yes, they will pay rates. Okay. Um, it depends on the public purpose associated okay. with Thank the you. That's all I need to know. entity. Okay. Members, Councillor Hyde. 
Thanks, Lord Mayor. I'm very happy to send this out to consultation um, because finally the City of Adelaide is trying to address an, an incredibly systemic issue with its budget. You see, on the one hand, we have universities uh, empire building within our CBD and, and chewing up rateable properties. Um, uh, we also have a huge amount um, of government owned uh, or government, at least government lettered land in the CBD, uh, which we cannot rate. Um, and that's that's things like like social housing, which you can understand a great holiday for, but it's also things like office space and what have you. Um, and there there is certainly an argument there uh, that that there should be at least some sort of contribution. Um, uh, I note that that at three we're talking about canvassing a number of options, um, and I would be very happy for our um, acting CEO uh, and, and other staff to canvass a number of options around what is a fair contribution. Um, because as it stands, as it stands, um, it is actually very unfair that our ratepayers, largely commercial ratepayers, uh, bear the cost uh, of subsidising uh, many, many other things that are used by other people. And, and, and I would also draw members to um, uh, as well, and of course, when you're talking about ratings and what's coming in, you have to also reflect a little bit on what's going out. And some of the serious structural issues with our budget, um, such as the fact that we are the local government area, um, because we do predate the South Australian government in its current form, we are the only local government area uh, in the state and one of the only ones in the country that has care, control, and therefore responsibility for maintaining all of its roads and infrastructure. You will not find another local government authority needed to fork out for a $60 million bridge, nor will you find one uh, for the weir either. And that's part of the reason why we need to have these chats. You also won't find one uh, that spends around $30 million a year um, on the parklands, beautiful as they are, but they are an asset for everyone. They are an asset for everyone. So if we have an ever eroding rate base, um, uh, particularly as well because Adelaide is uh, very much dominated uh, by the public sector um, and office space here is dominated by the public sector. So we have less uh, corporate offices, uh, privately corporate offices. To rate. Sorry, was that the bell? That no, didn't no, feel no, like. No. Oh, there's a, there's a warning bell. Oh, thank you. Um, so that's why I'm happy to send it out to consultation because I'm yet to see an alternative proposal, Lord Mayor. I'm yet to see an alternative proposal that addresses the serious and systemic structural problems with our budget. And of course, I miss the Aquatic Centre, another asset, another asset that we provide for everyone um, that our commercial ratepayers, by and large, are paying for. So that's why I'm very happy for the CEO to go out and have conversations about contributions. <laughs> I sort of share the cynicism around how successful those contributions will be, but it is the responsible thing to do to put them out on the table because I'm not sure that the city has before. And it's, it's very important that we do so. Thank you, members. To the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Division. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand. Remain standing. All names have been called. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Carer, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Abraham today. Uh, members, that takes us to off. Oh, first of all, could you please ask Councillor Sims to come back? Um, and that means, takes us to the last report for consideration tonight, the public report, which will be at 10.11. We've done the procedural, so I will look for nominations. Uh, there are six um, committees before you, um, so I will look to the floor. I need an, one council member and one proxy member for the Adelaide Airport Consultative Committee. Councillor Hyde. I nominate myself. So one for my Councillor Hyde. Are there um, any other member nominations? Thank you, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I nominate Councillor Martin. Martin, Councillor Martin, do you accept the nomination? I do. Do we have any further nominations? Uh, could I also ask for nominations for the proxy? Uh, I need a proxy nomination. Perhaps if there's only two, we could deal with them one after the other, because whoever doesn't get it we may want to be that. the proxy. Um, that takes us to the ballot. <laughs> Thank you. 
So, members, uh, I just need you to mark one, either Councillor Hyde or Councillor Martin. And this is for the Airport Consultative Committee representation. We'll get you some pencils, just a moment. <laughs> Has everybody got a pen? All got pens? Pens? Um, in the uh, hoping to save some time, we're going to put several uh, ballot forms on your tables as we uh, after we count this one. <laughs> Members, the vote is tied. We have to go to a second ballot. So we will go again. Thank you, Members. Uh, it is either for Councillor Hyde or Councillor Martin. If we could please uh, vote again and we'll collect your voting.
So we were discussing that in the uh, in the event of further ties, we will go to the one we put two into the box, two nominated people in the box, and the one that's drawn out is excluded, which is the other way that we can do that when it's tied. So uh, for this one, we have gone back to the count. But if that happens again this evening, we'll go to a different method. Uh, members, it's tied again. No. So we are going to uh, put the two names into uh, the box. I'll ask the CEO to draw one out and that person will be excluded. <laughs> Um, am I allowed to do that? Thank you. I've, I've got it. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so the drum roll and the, the not winner is. <laughs> is Councillor Hyde. It's Councillor Hyde. So congratulations, Councillor Martin. Yay. So Councillor Hyde, do you accept the nomination as the proxy member? Yes. Members, are there any other nominations for proxy? Thank you, Councillor Hyde. So we have Councillor Martin uh, and Councillor Hyde as the proxy. That takes us to 1.2, which is the Adelaide Convention Bureau Board. I'm looking for one council member and then we'll go to proxy. Councillor Sims? I nominate Councillor Martin. It looks like he's on a winning streak. Councillor right Martin, do you accept the nomination? Uh, no, I don't vote. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Abraham today. Uh, I nominate uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Deputy Lord Mayor, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Members, any other nominations? Councillor Sims. Nominate Councillor Donovan, Lord Mayor. Councillor Donovan, do you accept the nomination? Yes. Councillor Donovan, are there any other nominations? Members, and we go to the vote. Thank you. You should have ballot vote forms in front of you. Um, just one cross, please, either against the Deputy Lord Mayor, Mary Cross, or Councillor Donovan. No. Thank you. 
Go to the break after this item. Thank you. The uh, successful nomination was for the Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I will look for a proxy. Councillor Donovan, would you like to be the proxy? Yes, you accept the nomination as proxy. Members, any other nomination for proxy? If not, we have Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Donovan as proxy. Um, 1.3 is the Adelaide High School Governing Council, and I look for a nomination. Councillor Thanks, Lord Mayor. I nominate uh, Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hyde, do you accept the nomination? Uh, no. no. Um, members, any other nominations? Councillor Abraham today has done a great job. Councillor Martin, you've nominated Councillor Abraham today. Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, Councillor Martin. It's very nice. Respect Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I nominate Councillor Ho. Councillor Ho, do you accept the nomination? No. Councillor Ho. Councillor Abraham today. Um, Councillor Sims. Uh, uh, has been very active, so uh, yeah. All right, so. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I am very active, hence I cannot take on the role. Thank you. Thank you, members. Are there any other nominations? So, for lack of nominations, that one we will not go forward. Um, I think. CEO. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just checking because I think in previous times if we didn't have a council member we could nominate the CEO or representative. Yep, through the presiding member in the past um, that has been um, the CEO that has represented the council on the governing council of the Adelaide High School. Members, would somebody like to pass a motion that the CEO or its delegate represent the board? Thank Councillor Moran. Seconded, Councillor Martin. Uh, members, Councillor Hyde. Could, could I just ask that whether the CEO feels that they need to be on the governing council? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> through the presiding member, I'm really sorry, I've put a sweet in my mouth. <laughs> um, through the presiding member, my understanding is it's a requirement of um, the Adelaide High School itself. It's in their constitution that there's a, a council member or representation from the city of Adelaide on their governing council. Okay. Okay, and but you you feel that sorry through you Lord Mayor the CEO feels that they can appoint someone to be appointed. If it's part of the chart, it can be the CEO, the CEO's delegate. The CEO's delegate, that's fine. Okay. So Councillor Moran, you're okay with that? CEO, CEO's delegate, Councillor Martin, members to the vote, those in favour, those against. We've got the CEO or the CEO's delegate for the Adelaide High School. Um, the next one, 1.4, is the horse trials, and I look for nominations. Councillor Hyde. I nominate Councillor Kuros. Deputy Lord Mayor. No, I can't take that on. Sorry. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Any further nominations? I nominate Councillor Hyde. Councillor Hyde. Tick, 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 tick. Councillor Hyde. Thank you. Members, are there any other nominations? If not, Councillor Hyde. Thank you. Um, that takes us to 1.5, which is the Royal South Australian Regiment Council Incorporated. I will look for nominations. Councillor Hyde? That's one I would actually like to do. <laughs> <laughs> you nominate yourself. Yeah, are members, are there any other further nominations? If not, Councillor Hyde, looks like you are with the Royal Regiment. Um, 1.6 is the Royal Adelaide Hospital Auxiliary Executive Committee. I look for a nomination. 
Councillor Martin? Uh, only because I was asked. So you're nominating yourself? Yep. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Are there any other nominations? If not, thank you. We'll accept that as that. So members, what I need is a, a motion uh, to endorse Councillor Martin um, for the Adelaide Airport Consultative Committee and Councillor Hyde for the proxy, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor for the Adelaide Convention Bureau and Councillor Donovan for the proxy, uh, the CEO of the CEO's delegate for the Adelaide High School Go uh, Governing Council, uh, Councillor Hyde uh, to represent us on the Adelaide Horse Trials Management Board Incorporated, Councillor Hyde for the South Royal South Australian Regiment Council Incorporated and Councillor Martin for the Royal Adelaide Hospital Auxiliary Executive Committee. I have, is that, are you moving Lord, that? Sorry, procedurally, can we take that in parts? No. No, we can't. No, I'm going, well, I'm taking it as one. Okay, that's fine. Members, uh, thank you, Councillor Abraham, today. And a seconder, thank you, Councillor Knoll. Members, any discussion? It shouldn't be. Uh, Councillor Abraham, today. Thank you, members, for the vote. Those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, members, we are going to have a break. Um, I would suggest. Uh, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. So we'll be back in the chamber at 10 to. Thank you.
to speak to the motion? If not, go to the Councillor Knoll to sum up. Sorry. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against, that is carried. Uh, can I have a move and a second for motion to order exclusion for the item 12.2.1, which is the Capital City Committee update, Councillor Hyde and a seconder, Councillor Kerr. Um, members, do you wish to speak to it? If not, to Sorry. sum up. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Um, member of the public <laughs> and staff, uh, the, uh, if not associated, 12.1.1 and 12.2.1, I will ask you to leave the council chamber. The streaming will now cease whilst we consider these items and then we will reopen and commence, re uh, re uh, commence streaming at the conclusion of the last conference. It's our business in confidence. Um, we will now come out of confidence. Thank you. Members, that takes us to item 13 on the agenda tonight, which is my uh, presiding members report for February 2021. I'm going to try this. Xin Yang Kuai Le, which means Happy New Year in Chinese, because uh, last night I had the pleasure of joining the Consul General, Madam He, and the Premier in celebration of Chinese Lunar New Year. And we are now in the year of the Golden Ox. Um, since our last meeting, the City of Adelaide has officially been certified as carbon neutral. And this is a huge achievement and one of Council's key strategic outcomes. It's a great step forward in our efforts to address climate change. On Sunday the 7th of February, I attended the unveiling of the Vietnamese Boat People's Monument on the corner of Victoria Drive and Kintour Avenue besides Karawira Parry, the River Torrens. This is an important project honouring the story of so many of our Vietnamese community members who came to Australia as refugees and have made a life and a home here. Council proudly partnered with the Vietnamese Boat People's Monument Association over the past three and a half years to bring this project to fruition and in particular I'd like to thank uh, Tong Nguyen Go and uh, Min Nguyen, um, who were the co-chairs. The monument also demonstrates the power of art to tell stories, which we spoke about on Sunday, and, uh, and its power to engage, connect and unite communities. And we love public art in our city. It helps shape the experience of the city, it creates great places for people and reflects our unique identity, our people and our stories, along with adding vibrancy and beauty to the city. On 4th of February, I participated in a Property Council panel session discussing the latest office market report. Um, it showed that projects such as the Market Square and ADO O'Connell will make a dis big difference for the city despite the difficulties the CB continues to experience due to the impacts of COVID-19. Um, they were very positive um, at the Property Council in terms of where we are travelling um, as a city. 
And in addition to the jobs that are going to be created during construction is predicted with Market Square alone that we will bring an additional 1 million visitors each year. Other developments were noted, including Charter Hall's King William Street development, which will bring uh, 2,200 workers to the city by 2023. Um, I've also attended several meetings over the past couple of weeks with the state government, including the Premier, the Deputy Premier and Minister Wingard to discuss uh, our city shaping projects and initiatives. And I met this morning with the Federal Minister for Local Government, Mark Coulton MP, to discuss the impact of COVID-19 to our capital city and federal government funding opportunities. Can I have someone move the report to be adopted? Thank you, Councillor Sims. Second to Councillor Mackey. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against, that is carried. Item four on the agenda are reports from council members. And I will look for a mover and a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Knoll and a seconder. Councillor Mackey. Uh, members. Deputy Lord Mayor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, as you mentioned in your report, um, Council is now a carbon neutral organisation and we have a figure here. So this achievement shows how the City of Adelaide is taking um, real tangible actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address climate change. Thank you. Well done, City of Adelaide. And a big um, uh, thank you to, um, in particular, to, yeah, we can clap, sorry. Yeah. And a big thank you in particular to Michelle English and her team for all the work that they've done. Um, it was uh, great to actually bring all the carbon neutral partners together uh, for the presentation of that award. Um, members, are there any other things? Councillor Martin? Um, yes, uh, Lord Mayor, look, I don't uh, wish to diminish in any way from the achievement, but the report to elected members stated that in order to become carbon neutral, the City of Adelaide had purchased carbon credits can the administration advise how much was expended in the purchase of carbon credits to get our carbon neutral status? I think we can take that one on notice and circulate through E-News Acting C. Did you want to? Through the presiding member, yes, happy to take that on notice and okay. provide. Thank you. Uh, members, if not, Councillor Knoll to sum up. Okay. Members to the vote, those in favour? Those against? That is carried. Uh, members, we have several questions on notice tonight, um, and I'll look that those questions be taken as read from the Chamber. Those in favour? Thank you, members. They will be taken as read. Um, that takes us to item number 16, which is questions without notice. Um, Councillor Hyde. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor, and I wish to thank you for circulating the minutes of your O'Connell Street round table earlier today, but something jumped out at me. I noticed on the attendance list um, there's a number of precinct people and what have you, um, some absent uh, other invited guests, um, and listed under the category of others, Councillor Moran and Councillor Philip Martin. Uh, could the Lord Mayor expand on what, what the category of other is? And, and would, could, could you, Lord Mayor, confirm that Councillors Moran and Martin were actually in attendance? I uh, can confirm that councillors Moran and Martin were in attendance. Um, as you know, we brought that into the chamber before that I'm doing a series of um, engagements, particularly around main streets, uh, which are my Lord Mayor round tables. Uh, some of these have been going for several years, including the Hindley Street. Um, and we wanted that uh, the members that, or the people that were invited to the round tables uh, there weren't elected members present. Councillor Martin and Councillor Moran uh, decided to attend that meeting. And so is it my inference, Lord Mayor, that they weren't invited to that meeting? Uh, we've had that discussion in the chamber that um, my request was that council members don't attend the round tables because it's for the people at the round tables to actually have the conversations. Okay. And just to clarify, there was no change in policy position by you about that? Uh, no, there has not been. from that motion? No, and I motion. sent something out this afternoon to that end. Yeah. Is, is it your view, Lord Mayor, that the, the presence of councillors there compared to your other roundtables where councillors haven't been present changed the nature of the contributions? Of the uh, what we're trying to do is ensure that uh, the people participating at the roundtable uh, feel that they can actually say anything that they like. It's very open. They're working directly with our teams here. Um, and once we get to a stage where we're looking at 
what the vision is and the improvement plans, and we'll bring those back into council and open up for councillors. And, and so, Lord Mayor, a point, uh, point of order, Lord Mayor, the inference in what you said is that people couldn't be honest or open up if there were elected members apart from you in the room. Councillor Martin, my feedback from people that have been uh, to the various roundtables have been that they appreciate that they are able to actually talk in an open manner and they feel that they would not be able to talk as openly if uh, they had council members present. Uh, that is elected members other than you present? Correct. That has been my feedback from people that have been at the roundtables. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Um, I think that's enough questions on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any other questions without notice? Councillor Martin and Councillor... Uh, uh, sorry, Councillor Donovan. Um, yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, I have flagged this. Ratepayers have reported that the information sessions about the proposed development at 88 O'Connell to be held by Council beginning next week are, they claim, booked out and they claim they have been unable to register to attend. Could the administration advise if this is so, and if in the case that it is, it will schedule additional information sessions, and if so, when and where? Thank you for your question, Councillor Martin, Acting CEO. Uh, thank you through the Lord Mayor. Um, yes, Councillor Martin, uh, we do have a short wait list at the moment um, from people wishing to attend those two information sessions. Uh, we're working with the consultant to see whether there are ways, because there are information sessions, that we can perhaps um, either live stream um, the content so that people can um, still participate um, and get the information they need from those sessions. Um, and if that's not possible, look at um, holding additional sessions. So was certainly um, cognizant of the fact that there are community members that do wish to be able to receive the information um, and we're looking to find ways to try and enable that to happen. Uh, can, can I ask the administration to um, give preference to additional sessions rather than online streaming? The issue was raised with me by several people who are not um, capable in their view of uh, anything other than personal attendance. Acting C. Through the presiding member, um, we've had people um, ask uh, for the opposite as well. So obviously, um, we always do try to, um, <laughs> if people prefer face to face, we will schedule for uh, face to face, but we're also looking to find other ways to maximise the amount of uh, people that can um, attend these information sessions. Thank you. And Lord Mayor, I have a couple of other questions without notice, may I? Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, I referred to the deputation earlier this evening from uh, the proprietors of Spark in Whitmore Square uh -huh. who complained that their business had been affected by uh, City Council works. Could the administration advise what, if any action, it can or will take to assist the proprietors? Thank you, Councillor Martin, Acting CEO. Uh, thank you, uh, through the Lord Mayor. Um, Clinton is best placed to provide an update to members on uh, what's already been put in place and what's in train to assist that particular business. Um, Clinton, would you like to provide an update, please? Uh, through the presiding member, um, I'll bring elected members' attention to an e-news that was sent through today that outlines all of the um, work we have done with the proprietors at Spark and Whitmore. Yeah. Yeah, with E News, yep, that's correct. Um, uh, the work that we have done with the proprietor already um, to address some of the concerns around the work site uh, at Whitmore Square, and in addition to that, um, it also outlines some of the support activities for the business that we've undertaken to date and some of the future campaigns that we'll work with the proprietor on um, to ensure that we're supporting their business through this time. And just a supplementary are the proprietors happy with what's being proposed? I mean, have they expressed satisfaction at all? Acting Are they CEO. still expressing? Uh, back through the uh, presiding member, I think we had some more um, tangible uh, options to deliver tonight through the deputation that we might wish to explore um, in relation to, um, you know, purchasing of alcohol from uh, the company. That you know sounds like a great idea, Councillor Moran. <laughs> You're shaking your head. Um, but there were certainly things tonight that um, that the um, that the Spark owners were proposing that we could certainly take on board and consider. 
Thank you. And Lord Mayor, um, further to question 15.2 in the administration's answer, is it correct to say that in taking a $300,000 payment less than the current value of 88 O'Connell Street or, or a discount on uh, the value to the purchaser, was this a business decision of council to write off that $300,000 in favour of the purchaser or did the purchaser separately request that discount? Acting CEO. Through the presiding member, um, the original question was, was, you know, was it considered appropriate? And so that answers, the administrative response answers that. Sorry, and now you're asking whether... Oh, I'm asking a, a supplementary, which is not clear to me from the answer. That is to say, was that discount offered or did we um, uh, receive an uh, request a request from the purchaser for that discount. Acting C. Through the presiding member, um, I'd really appreciate if you could put that question on notice, please, for the next month's meeting of council. Yes, certainly. Uh, and further to uh, question 15.4, um, uh, the acting CEO uh, who prepared this answer says construction costs allocated to council are $27.74 million, whereas the contract here says the construction costs are $54,736. Um, is that an error on the part of the acting CEO or, or uh, would you like to correct your answer? That's the, that's the contract figure. It says here, the cost of the returnable works, the construction is 54,736 and the answer says 27.74 million. I'm just wondering. Acting CEO. Uh, through the presiding member, I'm reading it from here. Is that? Can you that your answer which says $27.74 million. Which the contract that the City of Adelaide signed with the partner, construction partner, says the cost of the construction of the returnable works will be $54,736,269. I'm, I'm just puzzled. Through the presiding member, um, you're holding up pink paper, so I certainly hope that's not confidential, page, Councillor. Page 62, um, the document was made public, public in yeah. I don't have that. This is what I'm referring to tonight. So this is the information I have. And just to clarify, when you said this was prepared by me, what it says is that I'm the contact officer. I don't have that information to hand tonight, Councillor. I'm really happy to take that offline and have a conversation with the appropriate associate director during the week. Or please put another question on notice. Thank well, look, I, I'd uh, be happy to have that. I, I just expected that the answer would be accurate. Um, Lord Mayor, just one the point of clarification here, Lord Mayor. The cost of construction that Councillor Martin is referring to is the total cost of the person who's building it for us. The cost that is there in the papers is the end cost to Council. Is the 27 million is the cost for Council, correct. Thank you. We will take that on notice and we'll bring the answer back. Point of, point, of clarity, point of clarification, Lord Mayor, that is not correct. Councillor Martin, we have already said we will take this on notice. I'm not taking any more he discussion on a question without notice. Thank you. Okay, and I have one final question without notice, which stems from an invitation from the administration earlier this evening. Um, in 15.4, the administration says, we have now commenced the process of the strategic property review and the proceeds of sales will be allocated to the future fund established for the purpose of funding income generating assets such as the central market arcade redevelopment. The administration said earlier that is not the case. I am puzzled. I am seeking clarification. Acting CEO, through the presiding member, um, I can understand your puzzlement because there probably should be a comma in there and a such as. So I think what we were saying in that paragraph is the central market arcade is income generating and that is what the purpose of the future fund is. As to fund an, projects such as the central market. As an example of as projects an, that we would you. fund. Sorry, I understand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Um, sorry, Councillor Donovan, my apologies. Thanks, Lord Mayor. This Sims. is a bit of a lengthy one. I did just send it through. I'm not sure. Yeah, here we go. So, um, <laughs> noting the USA consultation on the East West Bikeway opened in recent days. Part one, why does the consultation include the question, do you have any comments on the design approach for a two-way separated bikeway in the centre of the street as proposed by the City of Sydney? Noting, no information has been provided on a feasible east-west route where a transport planner has suggested this design option. It provides a lower level of safety to bike riders on roads with multiple intersections due to the increased risk of vehicular collision often due to confusion at intersections. A two-way bikeway in the centre of the street actually takes up more road, road space than a bi-directional curbside cycleway for the same bikeway width because it needs separation width on both sides as opposed to the width that is generally provided by the curb and the pedestrian access on the curbside. It provides a lower level of service to bike riders because it's more difficult to access intersecting streets and businesses along the streets. It decreases patronage of local shops and cafes because it's harder for people on bikes to stop. It creates more problems for emergency vehicles. The reference street of the City of Sydney consultation refers to a very specific case of Oxford Street on which there are very few intersections to consider because right turns are banned on most intersections. Continuing the why does the consultation, provide the comment in the supporting document, East West Bikeway Design Guide, page five, the City of Sydney has recently consulted with their community on a proposal to build a two-way bikeway in the centre of Oxford Street. The innovative design has been proposed to better manage the curbside space on a busy city street, including the bus lanes and stops, loading and parking, whilst improving safety and level of service for bike riders. Noting the latter part of this comment, whilst improving safety and level of, of service to bike riders is not stated anywhere in the City of Sydney's consultation document, is factually incorrect and is blatantly misleading both in general and in the context of this consultation. Part two, how does administration propose to remediate this factually incorrect and misleading information? Acting CEO. Through the presiding member, um, there's a fair bit of content in there. Thank you, councillor. Um, I will need to take this on notice, I'm afraid. That's can, okay. Can we have an undertaking to get a reply out to council members within the next week? Well, noting that the consultation closes shortly, it, it needs to be updated as soon as and possible. corrected as soon as possible. We will certainly action this yeah, tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. We're getting an undertaking from administration that will get an answer to your question without notice tomorrow. Councillor Hyde. Oh, sorry, I had Councillor Sims first. My apologies, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Another question um, further to the deputation we heard from um, Spark tonight. Can administration advise what the usual um, process is for notifying businesses when uh, significant roadworks are occurring? I think the uh, proprietor mentioned that a pamphlet had been put under the door um, just before the work was about to commence. Is that the standard consultation process that we adopt with projects such as this, or was there an error in the process? Acting C. Uh, through the presiding member, uh, it does depend on the um, scale of the project, where the project is, um, access um, businesses all along the street. So sometimes we have in the past employed um, someone in particular to manage the concerns. You know, so if it's um, Rundle Mall redevelopment, then obviously um, the, the length of time that project would take to put in place and the types of complex individual business needs that each business has. Sometimes we do employ um, specialists to help um, with those projects. Um, I think on this occasion we have certainly um, taken on board the feedback that um, perhaps some closer attention paid to the types of businesses that were going to be impacted and from this particular project um, we can certainly take that feedback on board and look to improve and rectify um, our um, ways we consult. Thank you, um, Acting CEO. Through you, um, Lord Mayor, is the reason why a consultant was not engaged in this instance? and because of the budget constraints that have been imposed on administration as a result of the budget cuts of this council? Acting CEO. Um, not uh, that I'm aware of, thank you, through the presiding member. And we often um, make sure that we would, where we think we do need that resource, we would push it within the full overall project delivery cost. 
And will um, the approach be reviewed in light of the feedback that we've received tonight? Through the presiding member, yes, it will. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hart, did you have a question? Yeah, could the administration please uh, detail, Lord Mayor, um, when, when the questions on the um, East West Bikeway consultation actually went up and were live, the, the latest ones, I mean, I know it was. For the consultation process? Yeah. Um, acting C, are you able to? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, Clinton, are you able to help, please, with this one? Uh, through the presiding member, uh, the consultation pack, um, including materials around concept designs and questions, was uploaded to the Your Say website at approximately 5 p.m. Friday night, just gone. Yep. And is the administration still intending to close the consultation on the 12th of February? 2019. Uh, through the presiding member, there are tight timeframes associated with this particular project. My understanding is that we'd be looking to close the consultation as currently publicised. Okay, and sorry, can I just clarify what is currently publicised? Is that this is the 19th? Through the presiding member, um, Clinton. Uh, through you, Lord Mayor, it is um, down to the 19th of February. Okay. So that's that's an extension of a week from what was originally. Okay, that's fine. Thank you. Members, if there are no further questions without notice, we will go to motions without notice. Um, um, that was easy. Motions on notice. We will go to 17.2. Councillor Mackey, uh, motion on notice, City of Adelaide's coat of arms. That's not right. Sorry, what is the problem? Jumping. Councillor Moran isn't in the room, so I have gone to 17.2. Oh, okay, sorry. And I have actually asked Kylie to go and find her, but she's on the phone at the moment. So, 17.2, Councillor Mackey, motion on notice, City's, City of Adelaide Code of Arms. Thank you, Mayor. Sorry, Lord Mayor, my uh, page is way out of order. Um, uh, I move that Council commences the necessary steps to trademark both the Corporation of the City of Adelaide's coat of arms or crest and the flag of Adelaide, noting there are currently no safeguards in place to protect them from the misuse. I have a second to Thank you, Councillor Sims. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Oh, sorry, Councillor, I'll just get you to put your microphone on. My apologies, Lord Mayor. Our flag and our crest are intrinsically a part of the heritage of the City of Adelaide, the corporation of the City of Adelaide. And uh, in my day job, heritage uh, is something that matters a lot. Um, and I was a little surprised to learn that we have minimal or negligible safeguards um, around um, the, 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 these two markers, signifiers of um, the city's uh, history and marking place in the, in the ground. And so I'd be very grateful uh, to learn uh, more. Uh, and uh, I have done trademarking uh, of um, other community projects that I've been involved with, the, the names and the graphic devices thereof. Um, I, I, I believe we should, we should undertake this. Councillor Sims. I'll reserve my right. Members, Councillor Hyde. I'm a bit confused, Lord Mayor. I'm, I'm not sure what's constituted by misuse, and I would hope, that, given the administration comment was, given the administration comment was one sentence. I'm sort of flying blind on this one. Perhaps if administration or the mover would like to clarify. Acting C or the mover, Councillor Mackey. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. If there are no safeguards um, around the use of uh, these uh, objects, uh, these these symbols, um, they could be taken up and, and uh, applied, commercialised. They there could be all sorts of um, uh, active actions that I would I would say constitute misuse. Question. Uh, oh, no. Sorry, I'll take this in order. So, Councillor Hyde, and, and then. 
and, and so, Lord Mayor, I'm still a little bit confused as to where the authority would then um, sit. So would it be the case that if the coat of arms is trademarked, every time an elected member wished to put it on, on something, that would, like, once it's trademarked, I'm assuming it sits with the corporation, not necessarily with the elected body. Would that be the administration? Um, acting CEO? Through the chair, that would be my understanding. And so were that to happen, um, uh, if an elected member wished to use the, uh, the political logo, the crest of the City of Adelaide, they would have to approach the administration for permission. Acting CEO. Through the presiding member, I expect we develop um, policy to um, provide guidance to council members. It, does that, would that policy bear similarities to the motion that was brought at the last council meeting regarding the standing orders of the crest? Acting C. It's too early through the presiding member for me to say what that policy would look like or what it would contain. Okay. Um, I'll just speak uh, now, Lord Mayor. I think it's I think it's pretty clear that this is um, uh, another attempt, as was brought last week, uh, to regulate the use of the City of Adelaide Crest. Um, I've never seen any misuse of the City of Adelaide Press. <laughs> and uh, and I think what's what's very sad, Lord Mayor, is that um, this is a this is a veiled swipe at obviously communication that I put out to, to ratepayers of the City of Adelaide. Um, uh, not that and and okay, well it's not veiled, it's very clear then. All right, well, well there you go, Lord Mayor. Um, this is an attempt to regulate members' use use of the crest. Um, of the City of Adelaide, which is the city that we have been elected to represent. You will not find such behaviour in any other chamber of government anywhere else in the country. Look at the Premier. He uses the uh, the coat of arms uh, either of the, the House of Assembly um, or the South Australian uh, Piping Shrine. Look at, look at ministers that use the federal coat of arms, members of parliament that use the federal coat of arms. Um, uh, all of them are entitled to do so, and there is not one restriction placed on their use of that coat of arms. Yet here in the city of Adelaide, we appear to be uh, so bereft of trust in our fellow elected members that we would seek to wrestle away, wrestle away what is the political crest of the council chamber and hand it to the administration through a legal instrument being a trademark so that elected members will have to go to the administration and beg and grovel and say, can I use the crest to communicate with my ratepayers? And the administration, uh, as the custodians then of that trademark, are well within their rights to say no. This, Lord Mayor, is actually a gag. It is another form of a gag, <laughs> and it is so disappointing. It is so disappointing to see, to see this uh, motion before us when it was obviously defeated last week. This is, this is, this is a, a member of council seeking to place restrictions upon the communications that another. If I can have two more minutes, please. You know, to, one, place, you know, to, place, to place restrictions on the communications that other councillors can put out. Um, uh, all because, and, and I would note, Lord Mayor, that this, there has been no discussion that anything that I distributed uh, contained misinformation. Um, and obviously, it incensed people enough that if it was untrue, uh, there would have been discussion around that. So even though I'm here uh, industriously uh, distributing information to ratepayers and putting it on uh, on letterhead so that it is official because it is an official communicate from me as an elected member of the City of Adelaide, and yet other councillors, instead of actually perhaps doing it themselves, then seek to stifle my right and my ability um, to do that. Um, it's obscene, Lord Mayor. It's anti-democratic. Um, uh, I would, I don't want to say this, but it seems quite personal as well. No, um, uh, given given this motion has come multiple times, and this is just another form uh, of trying to shut down other elected members, <laughs> trying to stifle <laughs> debate. It's it's very, very sad to see this motion before us. It should be resoundingly defeated. Um, uh, it is not something that any other chamber in this country does, or, or any other Western democracy that I can think of. Thank you, oh, Councillor Kira. Councillor Moran, you can bring your hand up if you wish to speak. Just, uh, just have a question for the administration, uh, maybe for Rudy, this final meeting here. Um, are there, are there, in the absence of uh, a trademark protection, are there already uh, passing off uh, provisions in, uh, for example, the Trade Practices Act uh, or in common law uh, in general that would apply? 
uh, in the case of uh, misrepresentation, uh, in the case of fraudulent use of the crest and similar activities. Okay, acting CEO. Uh, through the presiding member, Rudy, I will need your help with that. Thank you for your one last night. Go for it. Through the Lord Mayor, um, we haven't specifically looked into that uh, because that's obviously another um, part of the of the question. Um, I can advise that we have liaised with a leading IP lawyer in Adelaide about this who advised us that it needed to be looked into in further detail. So before doing so and expending um, money on, on legal fees, we've decided to await the outcome of the decision of council on this matter and then take it further with all the relevant questions on that. Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor. Oh, I had you. Well, that's fine if you don't want to. I had you first and then Councillor Sims. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor, and thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, look, I'm a little perplexed by the, um, the opposition to this. So I think Councillor Hyde, through you, Lord Mayor, has hit the nail on the head when he talks about the crest being the political logo of the City of Adelaide. I don't regard um, the crest of the organisation to be the political logo. I um, regard that as being a non-partisan symbol of the organisation. Um, and I think what Councillor Mackey is seeking to do here is to ensure that the integrity of that symbol is protected, not just from um, the use of uh, councillors, but also um, from the use of uh, private entities that may seek to use the flag or the crest as part of their own individual promotions. And I think to see the, the crest being corporatised in that way would be out of step with uh, the traditions and history of um, our city. It's also not correct um, when Councillor Hyde uh, asserts that. Is on the web for history of our city. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Councillor <laughs> Mackey, what are you doing? It's an AI. It's a, a new artificial intelligence counsellor. <laughs> Um, Probably better than <laughs> might make you redundant potentially. Um, I think, <laughs> I think though, um, I think though, uh, Lord Mayor, to, to go to the point Councillor Hyde raises around um, restrictions being placed on elected members at other levels of government, it's not true to say that um, there are no restrictions that govern um, printing and letter distribution for other elected members. Um, members of Parliament do have to follow protocols around printing entitlements. Um, well, certainly that's been the case when I was a Member of Parliament and I'm happy to tutor Councillor Hyde on the provisions if he's um, interested. I understand why um, Councillor Hyde uh, may think that this is a gag, um, having been a, a key uh, architect of the attempt to gag members of this council and prevent them from talking to um, the media about their motions, but he's wrong on this, Lord Mayor. This isn't a gag. It's simply a protection for the symbols of our organisation, those symbols that should be above politics. And I hate to hear people talking about our city crest as a logo that is a political logo. I'm sorry, that shows a complete misunderstanding of how our city should operate. Members. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I was really hoping to hear something in this debate that I could actually um, understand and vote for this, but I, I'm sorry, I'm just not finding anything that I can say other than um, it's something that one councillor feels that another councillor didn't use the uh, coat of arms appropriately in some communications. I would think under that circumstance, if that is the case, then it will be a code of conduct. You could bring a code of conduct against that councillor if you feel that there was a misuse of communication with the use of that crest. I don't really want to go down that road of going into legal, spending money on something that could be just because one councillor didn't like the communication of another councillor. I'm sure other councillors here didn't like that communication either. We had Councillor Martin that wanted to print a whole bunch of letterheads when, when he saw the press that um, Councillor Hyde uh, uh, had presented in part of his communication. We had Councillor Moran that wanted to put the print buttons on it. It was just a circus in email trail. And now we've got this. I don't want to be 
a part of it. Um, there is, as uh, Councillor Kerry said, a Trade Practices Act that, you know, in regards to the use of a crest. Um, I don't want to be one of these councils that, that bicker over all of this, so I'm not going to vote for it. Members, Councillor Martin. Yeah, look, thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm not surprised that neither Councillor Hyde nor any of the other debaters, including the Deputy Lord Mayor, can hear anything in all of this. Uh, their considerations and their arguments are, quite frankly, self-serving. Self-serving politics, that's all it is. And they ignore the advice of the administration, which was plain. The administration told you all, we have had advice that there could be a problem. There could be a problem. Oh, sorry, point, point of clarification. Can I just ask um, the acting CEO, was there any communication to say that was a problem? No, I didn't say that. Through the yeah. presiding member, I didn't actually hear Rudy mention there might be a problem. Sorry, Councillor Martin, if you have No, no, I'm happy to have uh, Rudy's advice. I heard it clearly. I'm happy for him to repeat that advice. I'll sit. Acting CEO. I didn't hear Rudy say there could be a problem. I think, Councillor, you just said that you thought you did hear him say there could be a problem. Okay, well, what I heard Rudy say was that there had been a discussion with uh, a legal expert and that that discussion, uh, which flagged that the issue needed further discussion, was held over pending this debate in this council. That is, that is what I heard, Lord Mayor, and, and if the administration wishes to deny that's the case, go for it. Acting CEO? I'm not sure what to... Well, that's, so that's, what's the problem? Why sorry, problem? I can't... I, can't, I have that legally... I actually don't understand what the problem I am saying, Lord Mayor, for the benefit of these councillors who have no idea that there are issues associated with this, there are issues. They they do not understand that the use of a corporate logo, as they describe it, to distribute political material. And let me tell you, the information that was distributed by Councillor Hyde contained contestable facts. Contestable facts on a city of Adelaide logo. Lord Mayor, and well, we are debating whether we want to actually go that to a trademark. I'm going to actually just stop that. If we can't, the debate is about whether we actually commence steps to go to trademark or not. Um, was there any other comment that you wanted to make, acting CEO, Lord Mayor, in that's terms not of the process? Lord Mayor, that's well, not Well, I'm just going back to what you, you actually asked. You are asked. just debating, interrupting me. I am, I am interrupting you, you Councillor. If you wish, if you Councillor, wish to Councillor, I am interrupting you, and I'm saying we are debating whether we want to commence trademarking the corporation. Well, I'm speaking trademark. to that, and you're stopping me from speaking to it. And I remind you again, Lord Mayor, that Section 29 of the, uh, the standing orders make clear that this is not appropriate. Let me finish debating, and then you can do as you please. Councillor, I am the presiding member, and yes, I actually do know what section 29 is, and I will interrupt if we are not talking to the motion, because if you are not actually speaking on the subject, in the meeting regulations, number 15.5, I can actually call a point of order and ask you to speak to the motion, which is what I'm asking you to do. And I'm asking all the other members to speak to the motion before them, whether we want to take the necessary steps uh, Councillor Mackey has put forward to trademark our corporation Lord, code of arms. Lord Mayor, you are debating me. I am saying to you... I'm not debating you. I am calling your point of order, which I can respond to, and asking you, within our meeting regulations, to talk to the motion. And I am saying to you, Lord Mayor, that there has been a communication to ratepayers with the, the corporation of the City of Adelaide coat of arms that contained contestable facts, one of which was a list of learned councillors. It was a very short list, and when you apply some criteria... I'm sorry, I still do not believe that it has to go to whether we want to go forward with trademarking. I and we can actually Lord talk... Mayor. I'm sorry, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm sorry, Councillor Martin. But Lord, Lord Mayor, I ask you... Please allow me to debate this. Whether you disagree with me or not is another matter. Let me please conclude the debate. If you can actually discuss this in a respectful way and talk about whether we go to trademarking or not, oh, please continue. 
One moment you say to me, I'm not addressing the subject, and the, the next moment you say the problem is that I'm not being respectful. I have a feeling you're making this up as you go. No, I'm not, Councillor Martin. I'm asking you to debate the motion before you. Well, I'm saying to you, Lord Mayor, that this use of the coat of arms for personal political material, which has occurred, has the potential, has the potential to create misuse. Imagine a circumstance in which an elected member with the City of Adelaide coat of arms sent a letter to ratepayers saying that, for example, a rating increase was not appropriate. Don't pay your rates. What if another letter went out saying, uh, you know, the, the best thing you can do at the coming election with the City of Adelaide coat of arms is vote for this person? That is the kind of abuse, the kind of abuse that is possible unless this coat of arms, unless this coat of arms is trade, trademarked and there is some adjudication about when and when it Embers, is not appropriate Embers. to use it. Now, I hear what the Deputy Lord Mayor is saying. I hear Embers, what please. Councillor Hyde is saying. Uh, their comments are self-serving. The interests of the city would be served by trademarking the coat of arms to prevent its misuse. That's all I'm saying. And I thank you very much for allowing me to complete it. Councillor Moran. Look, in 25 years, I've never seen a councillor put out a, um, a missive that wasn't actually in line with the council's policy and listed five councillors' names, clearly pointing out that these were the good councillors and these people will be sympathetic to your, to your argument or your complaint. This is about the separated bikeway. Now, it is clearly so out of line that no other councillor in the whole history of council would think that was okay. Um, I was, I jokingly said I would have uh, um, ordered 19,000. Now, why shouldn't I? What if Phil and I put out a North Adelaide one saying, vote for clarification, Lord Mayor. There was no joke about it. There were many, many demanding emails from Councillor Moran to the CEO. I'm happy to produce them and take them. Oh, I can assure you it was a joke. And for so a, a, I actually, don't to, a, to, to, to just to clarify, the CEO was contacted about that and he responded to all of you saying there was no misuse of the use of the crest and that council members are entitled to use that well, in I'm communication about council business. Sorry, Sandy, I'm, I'm entirely in disagreement with the CEO that was by putting out a political message and picking out Team Adelaide, sorry, Jesse, uh, on it to call them. If he, if he put it out as a, con a, a, a consultation and put all our names on it, might have been a bit, but coming from an individual member, and then he didn't do that, he just put Team Adelaide excising Jesse off. Uh, that was clearly a factional letter going out. Many of our ratepayers complained. Now, Phil and I decided to, and the 19,000 was a joke because it's so outrageous. I just wanted to exaggerate it so you could see the ridiculous thing that, uh, that Councillor Hyde was doing. If he can do that, we then can indeed get 19,000 with the crest or copy the crest on ours and say, vote for us, don't vote for Browns or someone. And that would be in the same vein as covertly, that's what that letter was saying. So if you open this floodgates, I indeed will be using the crest and I will send things out about 88 O'Connell Street, Jeffcott Street, and I'll list Phil, me, Rob, <laughs> Helen. We do that, but we do it without the crest. So it's clearly not coming from the council. Many people thought Councillor Hyde's was indeed a message from the council. And that's why they contacted Phil and I saying, is this, has, has the council changed its mind about separated bike paths? And we had to say, no, this is a, a missive from an individual councillor who's put the crest on it. So it's very confusing. Now, Lord Mayor, you know this is wrong. It is so massively wrong that if you don't uh, put safeguards to protect the uh, misuse of the of the coat of arms, I do not see why Phil and I can't put our newsletter with a great big glossy, and indeed we will. Councillor Abraham today. Mayor, I just have one quick question uh, through you to our administration. Do we know whether if um, 
other um, um, local government jurisdictions do this as well? Not? No. As in if, whether they've trademarked their coat of arms, um, acting CE? Um, I don't have that information tonight, I'm afraid, Councillor. Okay, just, um, okay, well in that case I'll make one quick comment. I've um, uh, researched probably about five or six different um, council jurisdictions and uh, none of their logos or, or crests are um, trademarked, you know, they don't have the little TM or the little R, they don't have any of that stuff on there, so um, I uh, don't know what makes us so special, but I'll wait for further debate and uh, possibly um, the closing uh, debate to um, highlight anything that I may have missed. Deputy Lord Mayor. Uh, I just, if this is not about, this is about misuse, if another councillor feels that the uh, information um, that was written on that letter with the coat of arms is uh, misused. Can they lodge a code of conduct? Can they go down that road? And we all know the rules around a code of yeah. conduct. So I just want that to be heard. That that's what they can do if this is what they feel. This because this is what it's about. It's not. It's not. About, it's, not okay. about, it's about. I've, all I've heard is the debate. Debate. So this is a question you've already spoken. So you can't Sorry. speak. I'm yeah. sorry, you can ask a question, but you've already spoken. So they can go through a code of conduct. Correct. Okay, thank you. Members, if not, I'll go to Councillor Mackey to sum up. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Well, I, I didn't anticipate that this would be um, as controversial as um, it has, and, and I respect colourful debate. I also respect the icons of the corporation of the city of Adelaide, of which we are temporary governors. Um, the, uh, the flag uh, the flag has only been in existence, I think, as an official council uh, flag since about the early 1980s, 1982, something like that. Uh, the crest for longer, and in the entire history of this council, the use of the crest has been uh, exercised in uh, very, very careful uh, judgment. My concern, and therefore my question about trademarking, is if one person or another person can uh, take uh, one of the treasured items of this corporation's history um, and uh, use it for their own devices, then quite honestly, what is the point in actually having the crest. Um, I, quite frankly, I would um, simply hand back my council cards um, and uh, go to a, a plain card. I, I, um, I, I, pre I understand and, and I've listened to the, the, the debate, both supporting my motion uh, and, and not. Um, this is not that we are in the business of policy. We govern this corporation of the city of Adelaide and we make policy. Um, now, a couple of weeks ago, um, it was the view of the majority in this chamber that we wouldn't make a policy about the use of the, the crest. I accept the majority decision, but my concern is actually deeper than one particular incident. My concern um, is that we lay open to the potential for very egregious misuse not necessarily by somebody in this chamber now, but by the next the next council, um, and it would be a break my heart to see this um, uh, that legacy, the heritage of, of the corporation of the city of Adelaide, uh, demeaned. So, um, councillors, I, I I do ask you uh, to consider this very practical and sensible step. Members, to the vote. Those in favour. Those against. Division. That is lost. Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, Councillor Sims, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Martin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I will go to Councillor Moran. We uh, missed your 
motion because Sorry, you were um, momentarily I'm moving the rescission motion. Uh, I, know, I know it will fail. Um, my point was that because this council is so factionalised under Team Adelaide... Can I ask for you to find a seconder for your motion first? Thank you, Councillor Sims. Uh, as you can see, all the paid positions are taken up by Team Adelaide members. As you could see previous to this meeting, the unpaid, you couldn't give away an unpaid position. So I think as we're in midterm, we're in the hump that we should uh, rescind these motions and put them up properly and play fairly. Uh, I don't wish to debate this, I know it will fail. The Team Adelaide members will cling to their pay positions and exclude the uh, independents. In my whole time on council, when uh, the Lord Mayor was a GM and a, and a Deputy Lord Mayor, we always saw that the positions were equally and fairly divided. This is the first council in 25 years that I've seen such blatant grabbing of external positions. As I said, I know it's failed, so I'd, I'd rather not hear some of the councillors' pathetic excuses. Um, to add insult to injury, uh, it was added that they were, um, what's the word? So I don't really want to debate this. I move that the motion be put. Uh, you can't, you've moved the motion. Um, so can I also just, for, for clarity, um, of the five that you've put up, only one of these is um, compensated or paid for, the rest are voluntary. Um, Councillor Sims, did you wish to speak? Um, Councillor Hyde? Uh, just a quick question, uh, Lord Mayor. Do we have a representative on the Stormwater Management Authority, is that what it's called? Yes, we do. Is that a remunerated position? Yes, it is. Which councillor is that? That's Councillor Donovan. Cool, thanks. I, I can't get you can't you've already moved uh, deputy long mayor um, I just want to declare since this was um, really about something else team Adelaide um, I've been bundled in that by um, Councillor Martin constantly calling out team Adelaide including me in his newsletters and on team Adelaide okay. I'm not on any of these boards so I don't know Thank you, Councillor Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry, Councillor Martin. Um, yeah, just a, a question, Lord Mayor. There are a number of positions mentioned here, but there are others, including the Adelaide Festival, the Adelaide Festival Centre, the Adelaide Economic Development Authority. Were they not part of that decision on that date? Uh, sorry, this is. Uh, I, I don't know whether they were or not, Councillor Martin. But that's not the motion before you. No, the the motion before me is to rescind, to revoke the decisions of that date. I'm well, asking you, Council. Were, were the Festival Centre, the Adelaide Festival Board? I, I couldn't tell you, Councillor Martin, but that is not the motion before you. The, the motion before you are, are the decisions that Councillor Moran has put forward. Okay, all right. Well, look, uh, I would like to speak to this momentarily, if I could, uh, Lord Mayor, just briefly. I understand the frustration of uh, Councillor Moran, uh, and it is. It's, Funny, it's a bit like the previous debate. It's about fairness. Um, and there is an unfairness about the way in which positions have been allocated in this council. Uh, positions where there is remuneration, they have been allocated without exception to people associated with the dominant faction, the dominant Team Adelaide faction, as the advertiser calls it. And Lord Mayor, um, that is unfortunate because it's not only creating an impression out there in the community that unfairness, inequity is a reasonable thing if we practice it in a place like this, but it's unfair to ratepayers because what it does is it ensures that people are slotted into positions whether or not they have the skills for that role. And I note with you know, a sense of, of uh, angst that Councillor Sims has proposed on multiple occasions that wherever a position becomes available, and particularly where it involves remuneration, that there should be a process by which a merit-based decision is made. Even proposed that people actually put forward their qualifications before the appointment so that there could be a valid decision made. You okay? <laughs> Look, I know how you feel. Every time there's an appointment, I too, I too choke. But uh, Lord Mayor, um, this is denying ratepayers fairness uh, in the interests of a, a select few. Uh, and 
I'll vote for this. I know it'll go down because self-interest always wins in this chamber. Self-interest prevails in the City of Adelaide. Lord Mayor, Thank you, Councillor I will Martin. vote against that this. Plenty. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I, I will support this. For me, this highlights the, the issue that I have raised many times in this chamber, and that is uh, the lack of a merit-based appointment process for um, boards, um, particularly those that involve a remuneration. I proposed uh, around this time last year that we set up a process whereby um, the relevant boards uh, who were seeking a nominee um, be uh, given the opportunity to make a recommendation for council to consider around who would be appropriate for consideration. That was knocked back. I've even proposed that if someone wants to represent this council on a board or committee, they um, be invited to speak at council for a few minutes about their qualifications and eligibility to represent the council, or that they be given the opportunity to provide a written submission. All of those um, proposals have been knocked back. There has been no effort on this council to seek to tap into the broad range ranges of skills and experience of elected members. No effort whatsoever to ask elected members what they may be interested in and how those interests can be accommodated. Um, and I think that's a very disappointing thing. When I was on the council previously, there was a collegiate culture that meant that there was an effort to try and share around some of the opportunities for elected members, in particular, um, those that involved remuneration. Um, but this council has not adopted that approach. It has been a winner takes all, and um, those who aren't part of the dominant group their views don't count and there's no effort to try and take on board or accommodate those skills. Um, and that's disappointing. So I do hope, I suspect this motion will go down, but I do hope with um, you know, less than two years um, remaining on this council term, that at some point consideration is given to how some of those development opportunities can be shared across the council. I look across the room, Lord Mayor, and I see people with very diverse skills and experience, and yet, sadly, only some representatives are being given the opportunity to serve. Councillor Kerry, did you wish to speak? No. Uh, Councillor Abraham today, and then Councillor Hyde. Thank you, Lord Mayor. If, um, if I can just uh, uh, address what Councillor Sim said about the merit-based appointments. I think we've had this conversation in the past where uh, you speak about merit-based and then I've, uh, uh, and I've highlighted the fact that, um, you know, I've used myself as an example, well, I've got a design and construction background and I sit on CAP. Councillor Moran has a teaching background, so maybe we should put her on uh, um, Adelaide High School or, or some other school. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, if, if, we're, if we're looking at it like that, then that's, that, that's, that's the best way to, uh, to, to look at it and assess it. And let's compare apples with apples, right? I'll put a law you can sit on nothing. I mean, you know. And members, Let me just say this as well, Lord Mayor, if I can. Um, one thing that uh, uh, that lacks in this council is engagement with with fellow elected members. I myself, I myself um, do have uh, do have conversations with elected members from uh, from time to time. Um, you know, if, if there is a if there is a uh, you know a position, if there is a motion, if there is something that's of interest and they want to uh, gauge where I sit on certain issues, then they they do approach me. Can I, uh, Lord Mayor? Can I can I encourage? That you know, if, if if there is a if there is something of interest to a particular member, and if they are interested in a in a position, then maybe they flag it. Then maybe they go on they go on to talk to their fellow elected members and say, "Hey, I actually wouldn't mind having a crack at this." Councillor Abraham, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Hyde, members, members, Councillor Hyde. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I, I just remind I just remind councillors that when we're talking about this merit-based um, proposal that Councillor Sims had, on the one hand, he was suggesting that we assess people based on their merits, and on the other hand, he had a, a short shopping list of identifying factors about them, uh, including uh, gender um, and other things. Um, and so it, the reason that was voted down is because you either have merit-based or you have affirmative action. You can't. You can't make both. You can't have both. No, 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 no. It really confuses the approach. I'm not saying that you can't seek to have gender parity, 
But I'm saying you, you, either, you either have a merit-based approach. Or when you're no, no, no. When you're selecting, opportunity to speak. When you're selecting from a pool of eleven people, very different if you're putting out a massive EOI and anyone can apply. Certainly, you have a lot more flexibility um, uh, to give preference to gender um, or, or race or ethnicity or whatever. Uh, but not when you're selecting from a pool of 11 people. Okay. The argument that was put, Lord Mayor, was, was just was just nonsense. It was pure nonsense. Pure nonsense. Can we go and back to this motion before well, us no, no, instead no, of previous motions that okay, have already okay, been okay. debated in the chamber? So we are talking about whether we support the revocation or we don't. And well, well, I just wanted to make that point, Lord Mayor, because others made um, points in favour of it. But I would also say, I would also say, um, I haven't heard any councillors suggest who's not merit based or who's not meritorious or who's not who is not qualified to be on the boards that they're on. <laughs> okay, well I challenge I challenge them too. I challenge them too. If you think it's a matter of the public interest, say it. I'm saying it. Say okay, it. thank you. Lord Mayor, I'm thank yet well, I'm yet to see these arguments no, living. So councillors Thank you, members, to members indiscriminately rip people off off their positions without actually saying why. And uh, and Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor, I would also, I would also noting that much of that was interrupted. So I'll just have another thirty seconds. Uh, if I may. No, actually, I'd like you to wrap up. I think. No, I'd like I'd like to see a show of hands, if I may, Lord Mayor. Highly offensive. Given, given the bellowing that was occurring. Members, do we want to continue? Did you say it brings it to, and then you have another minute after that? Sorry, another minute. Yes, yeah, yeah, another minute. It's another minute. Another minute. Another minute. Anyway, Lord Mayor, I'll, I'll just remind councillors that at the beginning of this term, um, councillors Donovan, Martin, Sims and Moran were appointed to APLA. Oh, you're not going to they were appointed to APLA, which is a remunerated position. Councillor Moran was appointed to CAP. Um, uh, it was not for two months, it was for far longer than that. And also, Lord Mayor, I really condemn this thinking that it's about the money. I mean, these councillors coming out uh, you know, in the bowler's hat, swinging the cane around, saying it's all about the remuneration, it's all about the money. This is the worst paying job I've ever had. It's not about the money. I can assure you of that, Lord Mayor. You don't sink hours and hours and hours into it um, for a poultry on area because it's about the money. It's not. It's about the community. It's about service. That's what it's about. So for councillors to come in here and say, and say, and say, that despite the fact that non-factionally aligned, to borrow their words, councillors are also in paid positions and they were in paid positions, for them to come in here and say it's about the money is quite frankly offensive um, and it's beneath them and I encourage them not to. Uh, Councillor Canal. Um, just then again, a couple of comments. And we, if we're thinking about uh, revocation and about fairness and I think back to uh, some long-serving councillors that that I know have been 10 years on various uh, committees and boards and and almost their entire term on certain uh, you know bodies etc and so the, the argument about giving people an opportunity when you think about it we're only two years in to this term, two years, and it's been a mixed bag of, of people with positions, etc. And a number of these have only been at 12 months, a bit over 12 months. So I don't understand this ripping uh, off of uh, you know, positions simply because you feel aggrieved when the same people have been in certain positions uh, for very, very many years, decades to, to longer. And, and that's acceptable, yet these members have been, in many cases, only 12 months on a, on a particular position, and that's not acceptable. Now, I mean, that's a bit disingenuous uh, to try to do this just because it, it was a political agenda of people sitting with this. And, and truly, um, it is, it's certainly not demonstrated by their own um, you know, uh, to say, adherence to that philosophy. I think that's unfair and unreasonable in its own right. And I think the revocation is just to, to bring out another uh, political opportunity. And it is not, it, it hasn't given people an, an, actually an opportunity to it, to serve on these boards, etc. I was on one and, and, and uh, voted for another body that uh, removed it. And I'm happy for that because this is a, a, how we do improve things. And I think it's quite funny when we talk about, um, you know, people's skill sets, etc., and, and, and uh, apportioning to boards, doesn't that by its own uh, direction uh, uh, you know, exclude people from being able to go to those. So again, you're not talking about fairness. Um, and we are an elected body, we're on positions because it's elected, and we're there because we are councillors. 
So it's not about your skill set, it's about us representing our council on those, those bodies. That's what this is about. And they're all elected. So, you know, again, the majority of councillors vote for these individuals. <clears throat> Members, if not, go to Councillor Moran to sum up. Uh, yes, uh, uh, France, it is all about our skill sets because your faction brought in the merit based. And it sounds like the only merit based people, I haven't included all the positions here, as uh, Rob's pointed out, because it really was just a pointing that the powerful positions, the important board positions, and the paid positions have all gone to men on Team Adelaide. And I really almost couldn't stomach what Councillor Hyde was saying, that we can't have female affirmative action and have merit base. I am so shocked at that statement. Uh, and yes, you might have a degree, but I've also an accredited assessor. So in my experience, and to France, Sometimes being on something a long time gives you a very good skill set. Now, I was happy to give up some of them, but it doesn't make sense that there's the independent faction who got many more votes combined than the uh, Team Adelaide did has no skills. That's basically what we're saying. No woman here has skills. Mary became Deputy Lord Mayor because the independents voted for her. Uh, excuse me, it was unanimous. Yes, because the independents voted for you, Mary. So we showed a non-factional vote. Um, so there's not a woman here on council that's worthy of a position on any of the important uh, positions. And that will stay for another two years. And that's a terrible shame because Sandy and I were on a council that had equal men and equal women. And that council shared the positions between the dominant faction and the, the independents. This council has gone to a misogynistic uh, view of Councilor, women. Councilor, Councilor Lord Mayor, Mayor. That, that is, is, that's taking that is completely I'm inappropriate. Sorry. That is so reprehensible. I that needs to be withdrawn. We have a Thank domestic you. violence campaigner here in the chamber. For her to claim Councilor that this Moran. is a misogynistic Moran. council Moran. is well, disgraceful. Could Councilor I say Moran. Councillor Hyde's Moran. suggestion that you don't have women on any of any not just some Lord Mayor, that was any not of them my suggestion. That is not my suggestion. The policy and of, if uh, Moran wishes for me to back. clarify. He said that. that. You objected to it. You looked upset. He said, Lord Mayor, Lord I Mayor, did not resolve from I, that. I did obviously, not resolve from members, that. please. I need to the point Stop. that I made. This is a If it's a point of order, make a point of order and then sit down. Yes, the point of order is I've been completely misrepresented. Thank you. Councillor Moran, I did say, I think so you've got to state it. I would like you to, if you could are, apologise, that uh, would be great. No, I'm not going to apologise. This is a, a council Lord Mayor, she can't continue that hasn't she's appointed any for that women comment. on any important things. And he said it's because it's skill-based. Now, it doesn't take a great brain to feel that the women on this council are so stupid and so non-skill-based that we can't get any Councillor Moran, that's not what was said. Councillor Moran, we are talking, you are summing up on your revocation uh, motion. Councillor Hyde. I'm not going to sit down until she withdraws her remarks about me and about this council chamber being I said it's a misogynistic chamber. I didn't personalise it to Councillor Hyde. I said his oh, comments well, led to that belief. I did not say he was personally misogynistic. Well, well, well then if she could withdraw them for the That's clarity of the law degree, he'd know the difference. Yeah, look, how much abuse we've been Oh, good Lord. So your point of order has been noted um, and Councillor Moran has decided not to withdraw that comment. That's, and that so is as far as I can take it, Councillor And Hyde. regarding clarity as a point of clarification as well, am I able to clarify it? Because you can say what your point of clarification is. The point of clarification is that it is very difficult in order to practice affirmative action and merit-based selection when you're dealing with a very a small pool of 11 people. Difficult, near impossible. That is the point. Well, I'm sorry, that ex it completely underlines what I've said. He said there's a small pool of women here and none of them are able to go on any senior position. That clarifies my point. Councillor Moran, that's not, Moran, what, I, that's not what, what I said. said. Members, that members, 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 please sit down. It's not what he said, Councillor Moran. 
um, what he if you would like to finish summing up, I think you have about five anyway, seconds. Anyway, as I said, sometimes having been somewhere a long time, you notice the changes and the difference in the way people behave. It's always been a factionalised council, as we know. There's always been a T bad load or whatever it was called. I think it was the unity ticket for a long time when Sandy first came on. There's always been a dominant faction. And I've never seen the unfairness never of never. distributing the senior positions at all. So I'm sorry, I find this. And as the um, there are two women in the uh, independence, we have get nothing. We, we are valuable women, we're good politicians, we get nothing. So I say this is a misogynistic council. Councillor Anne, your comments have been noted, please. Sure Take your seat. <laughs> Members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Division. Division. Council members, a division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand, remain standing until all names have been called. Councillor Moran, <laughs> Councillor Sims, Councillor Mackey, Councillor Donovan and Councillor Martin. <laughs> Members, I'm going to have a five minute break. Thank you.
policy. Councillor Sims, can you take your seat, please? Roll the shutter policy for business frontages. Councillor Martin. Uh, uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, I'd like um, to suggest that um, we uh, that I withdraw this, and um, I will represent it to the next meeting of council with uh, some additional words. Thank you. And I also have that withdrawn. So 17.3 withdrawn. That takes us to 17.4. Uh, Councillor Martin, wage theft policy. <coughs> um, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll look for a seconder. Thank you, Councillor Mackey. Okay. Um, can I ask, uh, before I begin, uh, Lord Mayor, can I ask the administration a question? Uh, and the question is, has the Funty premises on Guja Street, whose proprietor has admitted paying a staff member just $10 an hour, been the beneficiary of any council financial or other support, for example, the recent program to subsidise the installation of CCTVs? Acting C. Through the presiding member, I can't answer that question. I'm afraid, I'm sorry, I don't have that uh, level of knowledge around which premises um, were recipients of that CCTV program. Um, could I ask the administration to find out because it is fairly important? Uh, through the presiding member, what do you, what do you mean find out? Right, right now? Would no, 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 I can I'm go and have a look through our system. Yes. Okay, yep. all right. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll give an undertaking through the presiding Councilor member. Mackie. Can you use your microphone, please, Councillor? Apologies. Um, Lord Mayor, through you, um, Councillor Martin, before you speak to the motion as the second, uh, I'd just like to ask, would you be willing to consider uh, a variation? Um, and if you, uh, through you, Lord Mayor, if I can read that out, um, and then Councillor Martin, you can consider. Um, so as a, uh, as a preamble to your uh, motion, uh, I would like to uh, propose that the, the motion starts. Council affirms the right of all workers in the City of Adelaide and beyond to feel safe in their workplace and to enjoy protections against wages exploitation. You might want to slow down with that one. Of course. Um, we got as far as affirms. Council affirms the right of all workers in the City of Adelaide and beyond to uh, feel safe in their workplace and to enjoy protections against wages exploitation. And then I'd also like to ask Councillor Martin, would you be willing to vary the body of your text to remove the reference to the Adelaide Economic Development Agency um, and that, that replace that either with council or the administ administration? Um. You'd have to take out the words as principal city economic advisor. So, um, it would just simply read asks council administration. Thank you. Or Thanks. that, uh, or yeah, asks council administration or requests. Maybe requests. So uh, it's one, two, basically, is what you're proposing. So that it's a preamble. So um, no, it's an affirmation. So is it a one or a two? It's a one and two. Do you want to take that as a variation, Councillor Martin? Um, yes, I'll accept that. Yep. No, I have a second. Okay. Um, thank you, um, uh, Councillor Mackey. Uh, um, I'll accept that. Um, look, I, I'll uh, begin speaking by asking you to, uh, to read the comments that have been provided in relation to this because I, I am quite frankly taken back by it all. Um, it basically says it's not the role of council to define wage theft. And, and I just find it extraordinary that we have people demonstrating on the streets um, 
There's been shocking violence in a workplace here, uh, which was shown on television. Uh, we have a, a whole precinct in the city which has been stigmatised, I'd argue, um, because of allegations that have been made. A city councillor has threatened to sue a student for defamation. And uh, a parliamentary select committee has previously provided recommendations to South Australia, to local government, on what to do. Now, I, I contend that the, the commentary here is part of the problem. Um, I, I know that this is a big issue in South Australia. The select committee, which is investigating wage debt and which has completed a report, quotes the uh, McKell Institute calculating the cost of wage theft to 2018 in South Australia was half a billion dollars. And 50 to 76% of workers, the McKell Institute says, have been the subject of underpayment. Now our parliament, the, uh, the select committee that is, um, concluded that Fair Work Australia is ill-equipped, ill-equipped, unable to deal with wage theft. So what are we to do as a council about this underpayment? Do we uh, allow people, as I heard uh, uh, it suggested this week, do we allow employers to shit on the face of workers and walk away? No, we do not. We do not. We stand up, Lord Mayor, and we do something because it's destroying lives. It's destroying the lives of the people of this city. It is particularly appalling that very often it is people who come from what are called migrant backgrounds in the Select Committee report, who are the targets of un under underpayment. And it is incumbent on all of us to root out this evil and do something about it. Now, you will hear tonight arguments saying, oh, but it's not in our jurisdiction. Well, let me tell you, Lord Mayor, that the Select Committee on Wages Theft in July last year recommended that, and it had us in mind, that federal, state and territory and local governments promote compliance by excluding businesses culpable of wage theft from their procurement and grants program. Correct. Tenders should only be afforded when a contractor complies with all applicable industrial legislation. And it recommends better oversight of supply chains and plain language that details severe punishments for wage theft incorporated into our local government contracts. That is what the Select Committee of South Australia requires us to do. Councillor Martin. We cannot sit on our hands. Thank you. Councillor Mackey. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Um, just some questions, Lord Mayor. Uh, particularly noting what um, Councillor Martin has put forward, does, does the administration have any means to, do they have access to a list to see who, which businesses have been found guilty of wage theft or underpayment or? Acting CEO. Through the presiding member. Do I have access to a list now or what you asking? Could the administration, has there been any thought given to that? Not at this point, councillor. Does the administration have um, any powers? Does, does local government have any powers um, to find people for wage theft or? Acting CEO. Through the presiding member, not that I'm aware of. And uh, when it comes to compliance, do we have any powers to audit people? I'm particularly focusing on the punitive action, but I'm just trying to establish what we can and can't do. Through the presiding member, our powers are mainly driven through legislation or through bylaws. So if wage theft is currently within any legal framework and within our bylaws, then yes, we do have powers, but if it's not, we, it's unlikely that we would. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I just wanted to confirm that first uh, because I do have an amendment to it. Um, and I'll put that on the screen now. And, and could I just, could I suggest slip also that, away, could I just suggest that we incorporate Councillor Mackey's affirmation into that as well?
I'm happy to read it out or um, it's time to. I'll seek a seconder if I may. Can I look for a seconder? Thank you, Councillor Ho. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, uh, in, of course, members would know, and they were in the correspondence where I asked Councillor Martin quite politely relative to, to the communications in this place. For further information, uh, I commend you on bringing the report through. Unfortunately, I haven't seen it, nor have the ability to digest the entire report um, now. But it's very much why I was seeking to understand, uh, particularly when the previous motion spoke about punitive action um, and taking the big stick approach um, uh, to what is what is a completely unacceptable uh, economic crime, essentially. Um, uh, but through my through my research, it's shown that this is ostensibly an area for federal and state governments uh, to regulate and to also police. Um, at the City of Adelaide, and I refer to the administration comment, uh, has such limited and actually no role um, in regulating such affairs. Uh, and to bring uh, to bring a punitive motion into the chamber, whereby we are going to go and punish, and we will go and prepare a report with a long list of the ways and means with which we can punish businesses in the city, um, I don't think is, is, is terribly productive. Um, uh, and I know, I know as well that upon uh, me trying to get further information around Councillor Martin's thoughts, and I think the words were, I want to know how we fit into all this, um, there was nothing forthcoming. There was nothing forthcoming. And so um, I went and looked at the matter myself and thought, what can we as a city of Adelaide do? Instead of taking a punitive and negative approach, um, how can we take a more proactive approach uh, in getting out there? And instead of seeking to reach beyond our remit to fix an issue that we have no jurisdiction in or resources to manage whatsoever, after the fact, um, how can we do our bit as a local government to ensure uh, that people have the maximum opportunity for compliance beforehand, before it becomes an issue. And that's that's really what it comes down to, Lord Mayor. Our role uh, as a local government, uh, in large part, is to connect communities with information and their obligations. Um, uh, and that's what this motion is about. Uh, it's about uh, providing education, providing seminars, allowing us to put our resources into it so everyone understands what their obligations are. Um, uh, because the fact of the matter is that while some definitely uh, may try and uh, avoid their legal obligations and the award rates. There is probably a lot of wage theft that occurs where it's, it's unintentional or they don't understand the penalties that are in place. So it's incumbent upon us, particularly where there are multilingual uh, backgrounds involved, to do our bit to educate um, uh, and promote uh, proper, proper workplace practices, adherence to industrial relations policies and reform. And I know the administration comments was, were, were quite scathing um, of the motion as it originally was, um, uh, they basically said the agency has no jurisdiction, it has no resources to manage this. Um, uh, we, of course, do have a partnership with Business SA who does have the expertise in house um, and who does, uh, the, the organisation does have the ability to go and educate from a position of trust and to talk to businesses about what their requirements are. Um, that's what this amendment achieves. It's a positive approach. Uh, uh, instead of a, a completely opportunistically punitive approach to manage this issue. I actually think this will lead to better outcomes for those workers. Councillor Hyde, did you wish to speak? Yes, Lord Mayor. <coughs> well, thank you, Lord Mayor. I would like to support the amendment. And indeed, I was going to support the original as well. And but I think the amendment would make more sense as it's been more practical. It's not about power. And it's not about not about if we can really make a change. It's about how we set our position, how we position ourselves. However, as we all know, most business I mean, as we all know, most business in Adelaide and North Adelaide have been suffering from the pandemic. They are they are really seriously they are they are, they are in a very bad position at this moment, Lomel. I believe 
your control should rather support more support to business, but not the punishments. Councillors, let Councillor High finish. Indeed, please. indeed, indeed. If you log on to Fair Work as a website, the website can be viewed in 37 different languages. And they are actually the body who should provide support and give all the employees a fair go. It doesn't matter who are these people and where they come from. Hence, I think Councillor High's amendment make a lot more sense. We could work together with Business SA to provide sufficient education to all business about their obligations and about their obligations of being a responsible employer, not just wages, but also all other important responsibilities, including workplace safety. As you know, the current CEO of Business SA, Martin Hazy, former lawmaker of the City of Adelaide, who has great connections with city business and he's still well respected. It is very important that we work with someone who know, who know how and who have resource in the hand to really find the solution and protect our city business reputation. So I, so I encourage members to support the amendment, please. Thank you. Councillor Hyde, Councillor Sims. Oh, sorry, Councillor Mackey. I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Just a procedural question. Uh, understanding and appreciating the, um, uh, the the shift in focus of Councillor Hyde's variation, I do wonder and I ask a question in the sense that Councillor Martin's original motion, uh, as uh, augmented uh, and uh, um, amended. Not, I mean, as augmented by me, was talking about the ability of counsel where an employer has been found guilty uh, and been charged of the offence um, of wages theft, that we, withdraw, that we withhold their access. It's not about fining them, uh, which we don't have jurisdiction, it's about withholding access to grants and other forms Sorry, of assistance. Sorry, Councillor Mackey, are so you speaking or are you asking a yeah, question? The procedural question is, is it ultra-virus? Is, is this ultra-virus? Is, is the amendment ultra-virus to the original intent of the motion? Through you, Lord Mayor. Um, no, Councillor Mackey, an amendment can, can change the content clearly. It's on the same subject. Um, so it wouldn't be ultra-virus or um, an inappropriate amendment in this case. It's it's fine. It's just it is an appropriate change to the issue. Sorry, Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Look, I'm um, completely uh, against this um, amendment. I think what uh, Councillor Hyde has done here is uh, shift the responsibility off to a third-party organisation and say this council could totally wash its hands of um, this matter. And in doing so, he is arguing um, that council doesn't have jurisdiction over this issue. Well, Lord Mayor, it didn't stop Councillor Hyde from proposing this council form a position on land tax reform, which relates to taxation, clearly the remit of state government. And yet it was backed by a majority of councillors. Councillor Abrahamson, you, you as well. I think you were the, the key protagonist, but Councillor Hyde was behind you, along with uh, Councillor Kouros, Councillor Ho, uh, Councillor uh, Canal, I'm oh, sorry, Councillor Kouros, you're away, Councillor Kira. Um, all of those councillors wanted this council to oppose land tax reform, a matter for the state government. Also, Councillor Kira proposed this council form a position on sex work. Um, again, not an issue that is usually um, one that's dealt with no, by the Point of order. Uh, sorry, point of clarification. Sorry, Lord Mayor, apologise. I apologise. It's been a, um, a long night and I've had a, um, a work day, so it is difficult discussing these matters at uh, 11 o'clock at night. But it was Councillor Hyde who um, proposed uh, this and um, proposed that we, as a council, form a position on sex work. Again, a matter that is in the jurisdiction of the state government. Um, and indeed, this council has often formed um, positions on issues that relate to other levels of government, and we have done so so that we can lobby for change. We're a city council. So this idea that we can only ever get involved with matters uh, relating to state or federal government when Councillor Hyde proposes them is wearing pretty thin. 
The other huge deficit in this amendment, um, Lord Mayor, is the, the suggestion that there is some kind of rational explanation for wage theft. It seems to be implied in this motion, an employer may not understand their obligations and they're getting it wrong. Well, that definition um, has been rejected by the parliamentary committee, the state parliamentary committee that looked into the issue of wage theft. They said those cases are not wage theft, Lord Mayor. The committee defined, and I encourage Councillor Hyde to read the, the report, defined wage theft as being employers deliberately not paying employees their full entitlements. Just a minute more, Lord Mayor. Employers deliberately not paying employees their full entitlements, including superannuation, award and penalty rates, leave and other employers' entitlements. We're not talking about people making uh, a, an error here, Lord Mayor. We are talking about people deliberately ripping off vulnerable people in our city. Young people, people with disabilities, migrant workers. These are people who are most vulnerable to wage theft. And there's been a considerable amount of work done on this. It is sadly widespread in our city. And it is not acceptable for this council to say, oh, off you go to Business SA and do a bit of education, go and attend a few seminars. I don't think that's really reflecting what the community wants of this council at this time. We can't simply turn a blind eye to the exploitation of vulnerable people in our city. And we certainly shouldn't be doing it under the guise of this isn't our business, this is a matter for Business SA. What a joke. It's time for us to step up and show some leadership on this important moral issue. Councillor Kerra. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, the outset, I'm a little bit troubled by some of the tone uh, that's coming from some of the uh, particularly elder councillors in this chamber. Uh, really, this idea that if you oppose the motion uh, in any way, you're somehow supporting wage theft. No one in this chamber supports wage theft. It is, as Councillor Sim says, 100%. It is about the exploitation and uh, the underpayment of the most vulnerable people, uh, often uh, young migrants. Uh, nobody wants uh, wage theft to occur. You have to ask yourself with this sort of uh, endeavour, what is the net practical effect you're going to have? Are you going to help the problem uh, in, uh, on balance or are you going to make no difference or make things worse? Um, the original motion had elements of uh, punitive, uh, a, a requesting the administration to undergo, undertake punitive action against businesses uh, who have been found to have engaged in wage theft. This is, with great respect, a, a real can of worms. Uh, businesses, uh, look, businesses can get sold. Uh, what happens when there's a finding against a business? It's then been sold. You've got to, you, you end up with a, with a quasi sort of tribunal uh, effect within the administration itself. Um, these, these are the, this is just one of the many problems, one of the many um, uh, worms that will come out of this can if we start to go down this path of utilising council in this sort of uh, punitive way. Um, moreover, there is a real problem with the reputation of the council. We have to, as a, if we are all grown up in this chamber, if we are grown up in this chamber, uh, we will, we will uh, accept that there are, this is a balancing act, there are pros and cons. One of those cons is the effect on the reputation of the council. We would be incredibly naive to think that the federal government and the state government aren't looking at this incident already, uh, given the extraordinary publicity that's taken place. Um, we would also be very naive to think that uh, our rate, that not just ratepayers, the entire constituency, uh, the entire constituency of the city will, will not uh, consider whether or not we are being uh, really reaching, uh, engaging in overreach. They're going to say to themselves, we know this is a state and federal issue. Why is this council, who by and large are delegated by us to take out the rubbish and sweep the streets and all that, why are they putting their hands in this stuff? Will they really have an effect? This damages the reputation uh, of local government. Yeah, and, and that is why we've got to be careful and mature and sensible about this. I think that the amendment uh, is actually a practical step forward. It will actually say, let's engage. It is true that a big problem at the moment is uh, education. There is, there is a clear issue in migrant communities where there is a lack of awareness, uh, awareness of, uh, of, of uh, industrial law. There is a lack of awareness of industrial law. Uh, the, uh, engaging 
and educating first has got to be something that's got to be treated sensibly rather than leaping to characterise anything of this nature as simply being supportive of wasting. I would hope that some of the elder councillors in this chamber would be a little bit more mature about this. Thank you, oh. Councillor Karen. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Councillor just said shut up. Which I'm going to ask him to withdraw. No, no, absolutely not. I'll, I'll leave that up to you, uh, Lord Mayor. Is that uh, reasonable behaviour in the chamber? Yeah. Yes. Is that to say shut up? Okay. No, it's not reasonable. If we could actually just all be uh, respectful this evening well, and like debate the motion before uh, us. Like Councillors, thank you. Um, I have Councillor Hyde, you had a question? Uh, it's not a question, actually. Councillor Donovan suggested something that's quite sensible. Um, can I vary it myself or no, does she have to? Can he vary his, can he vary his minutes? Oh, you've already spoken, so Councillor Donovan will have to suggest the variation, and then you can decide oh, well, whether you we, want to. We sort of can she speak vicariously through it. Um, it was uh, no. Councillor Donovan has to suggest the variation because you've already spoken, and you can accept the variation if you want to. That's fine, Councillor Donovan. Just to add in uh, after on point three after employer, so educated business on their obligation mm -hmm. being a responsible employer and workers on their rights. Okay. I think the workers know their rights. Mm. That's why they want to I think they do. Okay, okay. members, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Um, Councillor Hyde, do you want to accept that? Councillor Hyde, are you willing to accept that variation? Thank you. Um, Councillor Donovan, do you want to speak now? Sure, Lord Mayor. Only to say um, I completely support uh, Councillor Martin's initial intent. I do think this gives a practical uh, flow on of some of that intent. I appreciate it. it's only a component of that. Um, I think in terms of, and I take Councillor Sim's perspective and his point about the evidence shows we don't need to put so much effort into educating businesses. We need to ensure that workers understand their rights and understand the mechanisms that they have available to them to enact their rights. So I think that's the important part. I think Business SA is a good partner to do that. Thank you, Councillor Donovan. Councillor Martin, did you have a question? No, no, sorry, I saw your hand first. And then well, we'll go to Councillor Knoll. Um, Yes, I do wish to speak. Oh, you wish to speak, yes. Thank you. Um, Lord Mayor, look, uh, I need to address Councillor Hyde's remarks that he invited me by email this morning to provide him with a justification for this motion. When he did not receive anything, he decided that he would oppose it and uh, put on uh, 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 the agenda an alternative motion, uh, an amendment, basically. Um, he decided that because I wouldn't debate with him by email, it had to go. This is the arrogance of Team Adelaide. This Councillor is Martin, an illustration Councillor Martin, of how Councillor Martin, works. Councillor you Martin, I won't line. accept it. I'm sorry. Lord I, it's a performance for uh, um, our colleague in the uh, in the in the gallery. As, as much believe, as he wishes so. to be, Councillor Martin is not in my head. He doesn't know. What okay, I'm thank you, Councillor Martin. I'm happy for you to. Uh, debate the amendment before sure, you, absolutely. rather than um, your colleague. Now, uh, I've heard the discussion from my colleagues uh, from the faction that we do not mention, and they are saying no one supports wage theft, but no one in Team Adelaide wants to do anything about it. They want to propose an alternative, and the alternative is that we pass it to somebody else. This is the height the definition of a gutless motion. Yeah. This is not standing up for the people in this city who are underpaid. Wage theft is non-compliance. It is illegal. And there is no way this council can endorse any aspect of any employer's action that leads to the deliberate non-payment of wages. If this is about theft and to meander around the issue, to pretend that it's not such an issue, is just despicable. And look, I would like to say something about Councillor Ho's comments. I will not, because I know he's litigious, and I will not risk that. 
But Lord Mayor, let me just say, I profoundly Councillor disagree. Martin. I profoundly disagree with Councillor Ho and as much with Councillor Hyde. Um, Lord Mayor, um, this business of um, somehow uh, proposing a punitive package is just a nonsense. Uh, Councillor Hyde hasn't read, nor has Councillor Kira, the motion that was proposed. The motion simply asks the administration to go away to have a look at definitions of definitions of uh, wages theft and to come back with recommendations to this body about how we might deal with it, including but not limited to punitive measures. And it outlines those. Now, to suggest, as it has been suggested, that somehow this is highly irregular, ignores uh, the report of the Select Committee on Wage Theft in Australia, on which there are members of Councillor Hyde's own Liberal Party, including the Honourable Jing Lee, who have said clearly in their report, and I will read it again because clearly Martin, it is not understood. You, your three minutes is up. Uh, well, I'll, I'll finish by saying, Lord Mayor, this document tells us to do something about it, not to hand it to business as a. This is duck shoving, it's appalling. Councillor Knoll. I mean, looking at the, uh, from looking at the two motions, I mean specifically about this, having, uh, one, if we're trying to prevent uh, wage theft, obviously, which is, a, you know, it's an abhorrent uh, practice, Doing something after the fact is not actually contributing to prevention and all the rest of it. So let's think about that in the first instance. If we don't want something to happen, we have to do something to prevent it. So if we're looking at what is it we can do, then I look at a motion like this and I mean, Business as A has all the uh, infrastructure and that in place, all of the, the legal expertise to deal in this area because that's the sort of uh, uh, services that they provide their members. So that is a good place to go for getting real valuable uh, um, you know, information and guidance, etc. how we do with things. So we look at that in the first instance, we're going to the uh, right people who are there for these sorts of purposes and, and can uh, assist us in how we can do things. Um, and we look at uh, you know the legislation, all the rest of it. We, we don't have any particular uh, ability to punish or anything uh, businesses other than uh, uh, not give them things. But that's always after the fact. I mean, I love the, the bit about the workers' rights because I mean they're the ones who we should be really helping. And and I mean it's part of our uh, bringing in to uh, enable them to understand their rights and how they're able to uh, do and look after themselves when they're being oppressed because again they're also in a vulnerable position so those are the sorts of things that enable them in a democratic society that we have and many of them come from other countries where it's not quite so uh, where they're not so protected but they're able to um, you know ex uh, express themselves and also find uh, you know, assistance when they're being mistreated and I think um, you know and the, the idea that we can help um, in general one remind businesses about the things that, uh, that you know, if they get caught, all the things that uh, will happen to them, because obviously these are major uh, problems. And it shows you, even in this last incidence, where the actual business is, is you know, can, uh, could potentially just go under simply because uh, if this is all correct, then they are going to they have, you know, you know, uh, people won't go there anymore. Anyway, the simple fact is, is that. This will at least work part way. If we need to do more, that we're able to know that we can do more, that would be great. Then we can come along later and say, well, this is by the guidance we're going to get, uh, that we can do something that's going to be more tangible. Councillor Moran. Uh, Councillor yeah, Mackey. Look, um, I obviously support the initial motion as it was, and I don't think we resolve from punitive to handball it to a private body like Business SA is ridiculous. It is our jurisdiction, it's our city. And we are after the fact, and that's why we need to respond quickly. Um, if we were before the fact, we would have done it before, but it wasn't quite clear to us. Education, do you seriously think these businesses thought they could not pay people and pay people um, a fraction of the legal uh, pay? Do you think they didn't know that? Do you think that the on the podcast of the disgusting thing we saw, Counseling. that the workers didn't know their rights? Do you think when the man kicked him that he was thinking Councillor, we're not talking about that. Rights? That is a matter with the police at the moment. We're not referring to that. Yes, I'm, I'm allowed to say that. That's in the public forum. It's in the advertiser to tomorrow. Um, we have seen the result of a business owner who 
appeared to object to a, a worker asking for their fair pay. Now, it's, it's right being shoved in our face. It, it's not a matter of education. It's not up to business SA. The law is the law. I think most of us know, have known that this has been going on for a while, but we haven't had something as clearly shown to us as the other day uh, in, in Chinatown with this incident. It is absolutely imperative that we take a strong stand. And with all due respect, Helen, pop popping in workers and their rights into this pathetic motion is, uh, is making a deal with uh, a very wrong motion. We, it is our jurisdiction, as uh, Rob Sims pointed out, to, to, to throw that in our faces when this is to, this uh, team Adelaide's talked about land tax and all sorts of other things that really are out of our jurisdiction. This is our job. It is not business essays job, it's our job. And I know this motion will get up because team Adelaide always votes together. Um, and it will get up as night follows day. Thank you, Councillor Moran. It's Thank a you, weak, Councillor Moran. Pathetic motion. Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, a, a procedural question first. Um, am I right to think that effectively Councillor Hyde's amendment is one and the first amendment that uh, is being considered against Councillor Martin's original motion, albeit? Uh, uh, improved upon, I would like to say, um, in my seconding. Um, I, I'm going to, I, I can't move the second amendment because I seconded the initial motion. Correct. But I would like to just test, uh, try something out on our colleagues because we should all be rowing in the same direction here. There's a very important message to reach our business community, to reach our workers, to reach uh, the state government and the state parliament uh, of where, about where the city of Adelaide stands and the values that it extols with regard to a prosperous, dynamic, happy, healthy, safe workplace. I'm wondering if there is a, a, another elected member who hasn't either moved or seconded the substantive motion or the amendment, whether there would be any mood to uh, adopt as the fourth point Councillor Martin's initial um, motion, because then um, what I'm hearing is uh, Councillor uh, uh, Hyde and um, others want a uh, want a want the, the carrot, um, and they clearly feel that Councillor Martin's um, uh, motion, perhaps uh, because of the word punitive, uh, evoked stick. Um, there is a message for push and pull. There is a message uh, for a, a role for us. I, I'm a little bit concerned about uh, suddenly engaging and paying for a third party to deliver uh, uh, training uh, and development. I, I believe there is a place. There is a place for the chambers of commerce, uh, in, including, dare I say, uh, Council Ho, the chamber of Italy, uh, in ensuring that your members have an understanding of the law uh, and the rules uh, that apply in our jurisdiction. Um, and so therefore, um, I, if there is another uh, person and uh, another elected member and colleague who would be willing to entertain that, I actually think we could end up with a motion that is uh, somewhat even more uh, substantial. So, so just so I'm clear, you're, you're asking someone else yes. to move that that point is included? included in the amend amendment. Um, of course, of course, Lord Mayor, if, um, if Councillor Hyde uh, and his seconder were of a, of a mind to consider incorporating that, then we get there even faster. Councillor Hyde? No? That's up to Councillor Hyde and then the seconder. So Councillor Hyde said no. Is there any other member that wants to move that from the floor? We have to do with First Amendment first, which we have to anyway. Well, if it's, yeah, if, yeah, it's not a variation, so we'd have to move to First Amendment first. Uh, so, members, uh, I will go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up. I'm curious, Lord Mayor, I wonder if the Chamber could indulge me. Could I see a show of hands of those who have experienced and been the victim of wage theft? 
Oh, there's a couple. There's a couple. That's good. My dad on the plane. That's good. That's not really what I was thinking, Jess. Um, no, that doesn't No, count. and, and I, I, I am a victim of wage theft. Um, two jobs I worked in high school. One, uh, at a fish and chip shop uh, doing deliveries. It's the only fish and chip shop I've ever known to do deliveries. I got $10 an hour and $2 per delivery. Um, uh, and then the next uh, the next high school job I had, uh, I found out after the fact, well, after the fact, there was no superannuation pay ever at all. Um, uh, despite the fact I was entitled to it and it was meant to be there. Now, the superannuation, I did know that was against the law. Um, the sort of cash job, you know, when you're 17 in high school, uh, I didn't realise that that was below the rate, although arguably Uber drivers get even less than apparently that's okay. But um, uh, Lord Mayor, I can I can tell you now that if, if I'd known where to complain to about the superannuation, I would have done so. If I'd known about the initial job and that being uh, underpayment and wage theft, I would have complained about that. Um, and so I think it's really, and that's why I was very, very happy to include the workers' rights um, point that, that Councillor Donovan made. Um, uh, but uh, to Councillor Mackey's point, I know he said, of course, I wouldn't accept the original. And, and that makes sense. If I, if I liked it, I would, have, I would have had it in there. The problem I had with the original version, the reason I didn't accept that variation is because it's not going to achieve anything. It is not. And it's not going to achieve anything um, uh, because how many bubble tea shops does the City of Adelaide have a contract with? Or how many bubble tea shops do we offer a grant to? How many other businesses um, uh, who, are, who, who may be engaging in wage, wage theft do we actually have any sort of financial relationship with other than levying taxes on them? Look. Well, Councillor Martin, if he has a list, please, I, I implore you, put it out there in the public realm. But, 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 but Councillor Martin, please, Councillor. So, so, but this is my point, Lord Mayor. Up. The only grant programs we've done for businesses uh, are the outdoor activation grants, uh, oh, and the Christmas shop front um, as well. Both of those are two of the only grants we've done in the last couple of years. Um, and, uh, and, and Lord Mayor, we need, to, we need to bear in mind that the original motion was ineffective ineffective. It wouldn't have achieved anything, notwithstanding that you as Lord Mayor and the administration do not have the power to go and compel the production of these, of these, uh, uh, of information that would, that would suggest wage theft or otherwise, nor do you have the resources, nor do you have the in-house expertise, nor do you have any legal authority to do that. Um, but how many instances are we getting, are we, are we, how many instances are there where we're giving these businesses money? I, I would submit to you barely any. Barely any, and that's why the original motion was going to achieve naught. This, on the other hand, uh, is more fitting with our role. This, on the other hand, engages experts in industrial, in industrial relations. We are not experts in industrial relations. Again, we see councillors coming here, uh, uh, beating their chest and, and they're claiming that they have all the answers. Well, they don't have all the answers, Lord Mayor. And to think that they do, to think that they do, um, it, it, it's arrogance. It's the height of arrogance, Lord Mayor, to think that they can come here with all the answers and dictate unto others what the solution is to other levels of government, which have been grappling with this matter for many years. Many, many years. Uh, Lord Mayor, I commend this motion to you. This is a positive motion. It will actually yield results. Members, to the vote. Those in favour? Those against? Division. Council members, the division has been called on the amendment. All those in favour of the amendment, please stand. Remain standing till all names have been called. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Kerr, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Appleton today. Thank you, members. That now becomes a substantive. Councillor Sims. Thanks, Lord Mayor. I wonder if the um, now that this has become a substantive, whether we could deal with the motion in parts. There are some uh, segments of the motion I have real concerns with. Um, I'm quite I, I, it's up to the mover and seconder as to whether we take it in Who parts. are the mover and seconder? It's Councillor Martin and Councillor Mackey now. Correct. It? So would they be open to taking in parts? Thank yes, you. I am. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Mackey. Well, the reason for me... Um, point, point of order, Lord Mayor, um, is this actually a severable motion as it's presented now? Yes, I it believe is. it actually it has, has to be. be. Yeah, Aren't to be there contradiction? Uh, members, uh, members, we've asked the question, the question's been answered. Councillor Sims has Thanks, Lord Mayor. And I, if Councillor Keir would permit me to explain um, why... I've no, Councillor Sims, if we can just... Well, I'm just explaining um, 
why I've requested to be dealt with in parts and, and why um, I'll be voting differently in the different elements. One of the reasons for that is I have real concerns with um, point two, which I think um, seems, to, uh, seems to be trying to explain away um, wage theft in the city. Um, notes the complexity of industrial relations law and the many consider considerations factor into individual agreements, including the type of employment. That to me is a totally superfluous statement. And it appears that its inclusion has been to try and um, create the, the impression that there's an explanation for this kind of abhorrent conduct. Behaviour that, that this council, in uh, supporting the first principle, says um, is totally out of place in, in our city. So that's why I'd like the matters to be dealt with um, differently. I'm disappointed, um, Lord Mayor, that we're not going to go um, as far as Councillor um, Martin proposed. Um, I think uh, that would have been a really sensible way forward in terms of Council showing that it was taking this matter seriously. Um, and showing leadership on this issue. Um, instead, what we're doing is outsourcing leadership to um, a third party. And I think that's a missed opportunity. And again, I reiterate the point that I've made earlier. It is simply not the case to say that this council does not deal with matters that are outside of um, its jurisdiction. Um, there has never been an issue with this council forming a position on complex matters like land tax, um, like sex work reform and other issues when it suits Councillor Hyde for us to do so. But whenever another councillor suggests that there be action on a matter um, that falls within the remit of another area of government, whether it be climate change, renters' rights, or a range of other areas, we have to uh, endure this nonsensical argument that somehow it's beyond our jurisdiction. And let's put that to bed um, tonight. But I'm disappointed we haven't gone as far as we could have, Lord Mayor. Members? Councillor Martin, are you, are you summing up? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Lord Mayor, look, I, I, um, I more than um, share the uh, sentiments expressed by uh, Councillor Sims. I'm, I'm bitterly disappointed, uh, not just disappointed. Uh, and the reason is, uh, and I will vote for the first part of this, I accept uh, the first part that's proposed, but all that follows um, does not accord with what is required of this council. Um, wage theft, it's implied, may arise because of complex employment arrangements, whereas it's quite well defined. And in fact, there was a report, uh, and I'm reading uh, from the report of the uh, Legislative Council report that summarised it, wage theft or non-compliance is the deliberate non-payment of wages, superannuation and or legal entitlements. It includes familiar workarounds like cash in hand payments, disingenuous volunteer or internship agreements, and more innovative forms of exploitation like sham contracting, a term used to describe the increasingly common practice of employers illegally hiring workers as sole contractors rather than as employees, as a way of shifting administrative costs and responsibility onto the individual. Now, that pretty much sums up the capacity for all of that to occur by noting the complexity of industrial law. Um, a sham is a sham, an illegal practice is an illegal practice. And this actually continues the, the falsehood that somehow this is complex. It's not complex, it's theft, it's illegal, it's criminal, and it ought to be prosecuted more often. But uh, the authorities are simply unable to do so. And the Select Committee notes that. Now, we're proposing to send this matter to Business SA. Uh, Business SA gave evidence to this Select Committee um, it is not quoted in the recommendations of uh, the Select Committee. Um, in fact, it's not referenced in terms of uh, the solutions that are required. Uh, and my guess is, I'm not certain about this, but my guess is that the Committee didn't agree with Business SA. Um, it preferred other evidence in reaching the conclusions. So here we are saying that it's all right to have full-time, part-time, casual and other sorts of employment. We don't mind that. And we're going to ask Business SA. We're going to ask Business That's SA. That's time, thanks, Councillor Martin. 
I understood that the bill would go at it, it, two That minutes. was the second bill. That was the second bill. Oh, Lord Mayor, I'm hearing know, bills all I the know. time. Every time Councillor Hyde speaks, I hear bills. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's almost like round two or three beginning. Okay. But thank anyway, you, Lord Mayor, thank you. Um, Mem members. You will allow us to vote in parts? Uh, yes, I'll take it in parts. Thank you. Uh, members, we're going to take it in parts. Uh, so, those in favour of part one, raise your hands. Those against, Councillor Hyde, are you voting? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Can we? That was a that was a vote. Yes. Thank you, uh, members. Those in favour of part two, please raise your hands. For and against. Division. Council members, a division has been called on part two of the motion. Could all those in favour of the motion please stand and remain standing until all names have been called? Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Carer, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Abraham today. Members, those in favour of part three, please raise your hand. Those against? Division. Division. Council members, the division has been called on part three of the motion. All those in favour, please stand and remain standing until all names have been called. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Ho, Councillor Hyde, Councillor Donovan, Councillor Carer, Councillor Canole, and Councillor Abraham today. Thank you, members. That takes us, we've got two to go, members. That takes us to 17.5. Councillor Hyde, motion on notice, gum tree. Sorry, Lord Mayor, would it be possible to remedy the air conditioning? It's incredible. Oh, we've already done that. Yeah. Have you? Yes. Okay. Thank I was you. watching everybody. Um, yeah, it's just yeah. not really hot. Mm -hmm. uh, Councillor Hyde, 17.5, gum trees. Yes, uh, I move it as printed and I seek a second. Please. Thank you, Deputy Lord Mayor. Councillor Sorry, Hyde. just give me one moment to fire up my machine. Apologies. Right. Um, Lord Mayor, so. This issue has been such a lightning rod for the community because it's uh, it's pulling together two issues which people in the community feel very strongly about, and that is local government and their regulation or lack thereof, and their general approach um, uh, to managing gum trees and similar trees. So um, it was with uh, some concern that I received some complaints um, from businesses and residents um, in North Adelaide uh, and along in the western part of the city, that uh, many gums suddenly popped up um, uh, in the area. And the ones I saw from North Adelaide, I thought, well, it's sort of in the parklands, you know, um, uh, what have you. Uh, but then I saw the repeat uh, practice of us planting them without speaking to uh, uh, or going to a decision uh, with council first. Um, obviously, in the median strip, there were 40 put in there. Um, and that's when I sort of pricked up and thought, well, this is a trend. Uh, maybe there's an issue here. And of course, that was around um, the time we saw those tragic deaths um, uh, in Adelaide. And I know, um, obviously, both caused by trees, but one of them was caused by a gum. And I realise that's not the gum tree um, here. But of course, there was also the matter of a crushed car on South Terrace. That was in the city. No one was injured, uh, as far as I know, uh, thankfully. But um, ultimately, Lord Mayor, uh, trees will always cause risks. Um, uh, and we know that gum trees will always cause more risk. It is understood and accepted uh, in the community uh, that they will. I've had uh, conversations with three arborists over the last two days. Um, uh, all of them thought this was a common sense motion. All of them uh, collectively actually had uh, probably around 70 years experience between them all um, uh, dealing with trees. Uh, and each of them said that they've seen some shocking examples uh, where, where gum trees have caused a damage or where they've been provided, they've provided a report to a resident in a metropolitan area um, uh, in an attempt to uh, mitigate the risk caused by gum trees and they've been knocked back by councils. Um, it's really a lightning rod for the community here, Lord Mayor. This motion before us um, will actually save most, if not all, of those trees uh, and relocate them uh, accordingly into the parklands away from uh, areas of high traffic flow, which is where these trees will cause risk. Um, and I also know that it's not just the risk of falling limbs. Uh, gums also have uh, a lot of leaf litter, uh, gumdrops, they have bark um, and what have you. Um, and of course, the gumdrops probably most 
most egregiously can cause a tripping hazard. Um, on the footpath. And I note as well that there are many other councils, and I refer to the Knox City Council in Victoria, um, which took uh, preemptive action and removed hundreds of uh, Carimbia maculatas, uh, mature ones, uh, because they felt it was too much of a legal liability. Too much of a legal liability. Uh, they spent many hundreds of thousands of dollars doing that. Now, I'm not suggesting we go uh, and start looking at, if I can have a minute more, please. Uh, I'm not suggesting we start looking at our mature trees. Um, I have faith in our administration to manage the risks that they pose, noting, of course, that incident on South Terrace and hoping we don't see it again. Um, uh, and in fact, I've had requests from residents suggesting that we look at those trees, and I've said, no, no, I think we've got it again. Um, uh, but what I am suggesting we do is look to take the underspend from this project, contribute it to removing these trees and putting them in a parkland setting where they're more appropriate. In doing so, we end up with a net 100 trees in the parklands uh, and we can pick other more appropriate trees to go along our city streets and squares. I also know that in my discussion with these arborists, um, they highlighted the concerns that they have around the planting um, of where these trees are. Along Prospect Road, they're planted uh, too close to already mature uh, uh, trees. Um, they're actually going to grow specifically outwards up to the sunlight and over the over the footpath. Uh, I know that the feedback on the gum trees on Grove Street is that they are far too close together um, uh, and that will also cause concerns as well. That's the feedback I've had from yep. Arborists um, uh, who are offering their offering their advice on this matter. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, I, I also just, if I can just have 10 seconds more, want to highlight that the cost in the in that the administration has outlined uh, is clearly far too high. Um, I've actually had an independent uh, assessment done, uh, and I'm happy to provide that quote to the administration, and that is of $92,000, which is far, far lower than the $324,000 uh, which the administration provided. And I noted that they were required to do that in quite a hurry uh, regarding the administration comment. Thank you. Deputy Lord Mayor, did you wish to speak? Uh, Councillor Brown. Uh, yes, look, I vehemently oppose this motion. Um, it was voted on by council. It was moved by Sandy Wilkinson, seconded by me, and uh, the Lord Mayor voted for it too, as it was unanimous. Um, I think that the uh, junior councillor has laboured under misapprehension that they were lemon-scented gums, which of course we would have all agreed um, are great limb droppers. Uh, and then when he found out there were spotted gums, which had been okayed by all our um, arborists and our common uh, trees in the city. Uh, we might all know the large spotted gum right outside the museum, which is an iconic tree. Uh, there are spotted gums we included in, um, in the North Terrace development, and indeed we included them along the roadway in Victoria Square. There is a, a, a misunderstanding um, that spotted gums are dangerous. They are linked, as uh, the junior councillor said, with uh, lemon scented. That is not the case. Um, uh, we have, they have been cleared by our arborists. I mean, I don't really know in the debate, uh, why don't we all just go home and send our arborists home and ask Councillor Hyde to, to provide us with the, uh, the costs. The costs are over $300,000 to move these. The prospect road trees are in the parklands. And as I said, the previous council voted unanimously. So it's wrong of the councillors to say that this is just an administrative decision that we weren't asked for. We were asked for, and the Lord Mayor and I voted for it, and as did the rest of the council. Um, gum trees are, uh, have to be chosen very carefully for urban streets, because we know some types drop limbs. Spotted gums do not. Nord Parade has a fine row of iron barks along there that the uh, community loves. They were an inappropriate tree because they actually lift the road surface. But when the uh, community of Nord was asked should they chop them down and put other trees, uh, they unanimously and overwhelmingly said no. Uh, I don't know where this um, upswelling of, um, of concern from the electorate from the South Ward councillor. Um, it's not even in his ward. Um, if you follow this haywire logic, you'd have to remove all the trees up Montefiore Hill because if the little trees are a risk, the mature trees are even super risk and they are lemon scented. They are managed by careful um, uh, tree husbandry 
um, as these would be as well. But really what I really object to is the micromanagement, the, the arrogance of I know better, the administration doesn't know how to cost, um, cost the works, I know better, my arborist. We have an arborist, we have it in our report, and he said the trees are safe. I'm not a complete fan of, um, of natives in urban settings, but obviously when I, when I read the report of the previous motion that we all supported, it was clearly stated that that's what the local precinct group wanted. The arborists said they were totally safe. The cost of $300,000 to move trees around when we have businesses closing, we're up against the wall, wouldn't it be better to spend that money helping the small businesses and the struggling ratepayers rather than shifting trees around? It is ridiculous. I totally think it's a falsehood that there's an upswelling of community outrage. There is not. Uh, Councillor Simpson. Thanks, Lord Mayor. A few questions of administration, um, if I may. Can I ask through you, Lord Mayor, what is the process that administration undertakes before um, planting trees? And specifically, what was the process undertaken in this instance? Acting CEO. Uh, thank you, through the presiding member. Um, obviously, um, the council endorsed um, Green City Plan is the uh, mechanism through which um, we uh, design and plant trees. But Clinton, um, would you like to just talk the council through that approach? Thank you. Through the presiding member, the the process um, harks back to probably 2017, councillor, where. Um, Council requested for the ability to us to for us to achieve some of the tree planting objectives in the previous strategic plan, which have also flowed through to this strategic plan, that we um, develop a green city plan. And I think that's the reference document that we've included in the admin response to the motion tonight. Um, that um, was requested of us to incorporate um, other council policy documents, such as the Adelaide Design Manual. Um, the green infrastructure guidelines, other sustainability policies and relevant strategic plan objectives. So when we talk about the Green City Plan, that's the reference document that we use um, or administration uses to then uh, guide how we go about um, landscape architecture and designing um, into the streets um, what types and, and selection of species that we use, noting that there are various types of species in the plan. Um, we leave that to our qualified landscape architects to, to pick and choose landscape designs that suit um, the requirements of uh, individual locations or streets. And is it the case through you, uh, Lord Mayor, to administration that there is no um, policy or, or guidelines in place to determine the kinds of trees that should be planted? Because I've heard that statement um, being made in the media. Is that the case? It sounds like there is a policy framework that you follow through you, Lord Mayor. I can see. Um, through the presiding member, um, under our um, corporate policy framework, there's a range of different documents um, that we use. So we have strategies, action plans, policies, operating guidelines, um, standard operating procedures, all of which um, we use um, when it comes to making decisions. Um, I referenced a green city plan. Um, that's an action plan, not necessarily a policy. But that has the effect of, in, of determining or informing the decisions that are made around um, trees that are planted. Is that correct? That is correct. Can I also ask, was there a risk assessment done in relation to these particular trees or a safety assessment done um, as, as part of that process? Acting fee. Uh, through the presiding member, um, Clinton. Um, through the presiding member, the, the risk assessment um, in terms of the Green City Plan um, when selecting the trees, um, the team of gone through different criteria such as the location and character um, of the area where we're planning on planting, the form of the trees, the scale, underground, underground conditions, street characteristics and whether um, the trees need to be evergreen or deciduous. So 
um, that that's incorporated into the Green City Plan, which is effectively a risk assessment that enables us to pick and choose particular streets for particular um, applications. And through you, Lord Mayor, the trees were assessed as being safe to plant in that particular area. Through the presiding member, I'll be confident in saying that will be a yes, Clinton. Yeah, by virtue of including them in the Green City Plan, that's correct. Thank you. So thanks, Lord Mayor. That's really um, helpful because it highlights that what we're talking about here is flouting the advice of our experts, um, our administration, on the whim of a councillor and saying we're going to rip up healthy trees, many of which um, will die. Um, in fact, the report that has been presented here states that um, in our opinion, the trees located on Prospect Road and those in Light Square cannot be successfully transplanted and would be lost if removed. The possibility that the trees located on Grove Street could be successfully transplanted, however, um, there is an extremely high mortality rate. So really, you know, let's cut to the chase here, Lord Mayor. What Councillor Hyde is proposing is actually ripping up perfectly healthy trees at a time of climate emergency, at a time when residents and ratepayers are talking about wanting us to green our city, at a time when people are talking about how can we improve street canopies. We've got one councillor saying, on the basis of no uh, expert evidence, let's just rip up trees we've already planted and start again. Now, my view, Lord Mayor, is that we should only ever remove healthy trees when there is a very clear public health imperative to do so. And that means clear advice from our administration that it is not safe to plant trees in a particular area, or, might I say, very clear advice that a tree is at risk. And I note in the report it's mentioned that we have ongoing monitoring of our trees. And the trees that have been planted at the moment are well off uh, maturation, so there's certainly not going to be any risk in the short term. Um, so this does not sit well with me, um, Lord Mayor. I think um, councillors have sometimes got to uh, stay in their lane. I know um, Councillor Hyde is a great expert on many things and um, he's very fond of reminding us all of that. Um, but, you know, he's not an expert in this area, um, Lord Mayor. That's why we um, pay our administration um, and uh, we ask them to provide us with expert advice. And as much as I respect Councillor Hyde, um, I will be following the advice of our experts and uh, putting my trust in them. And if they say that this is safe, and if they say that there has been a risk assessment, and if they say that council policy has been followed and complied with, then I will support that assessment and I'd encourage other councillors to do the same. It would set up a very alarming precedent in this council if we start removing trees simply on the um, will of a city councillor devoid of any evidence base. Councillor Kerr. Uh, well, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, this has been described as a whim. Um, I don't think potential death uh, of individuals, I don't think potential deaths are a whim. Lord Mayor, I think in fact they're extremely serious. Um, Councillor Moran has talked about the cost of it. Well, once again, what is the cost of a potential death? Um, look, the fact is that Councillor, Councillor Sims has talked about well, the you know, administration common sense says a procedure is being followed. That is because we haven't changed the procedure. Uh, once we change the procedure, then it will be followed. And the next comment will be then we are following the procedure, which is to remove, to reduce the risk which is to reduce the risk. And again, we've, we've got sort of chortles and stuff, but once again, I'm talking about uh, potentially preventing deaths. We know gum trees are dangerous. The sooner gum trees are removed from high traffic areas, whether by foot or by vehicle across the city of Adelaide, the better it will be because sadly, uh, too sadly, uh, the vast majority of deaths uh, and, and injuries at the hands of tree falling and tree limbs have been due to gum trees. So I say to those who, uh, some of the other councillors who may be concerned uh, about the removal of trees, um, uh, think back to the uh, furor whipped up uh, by uh, certain councillors in relation to the uh, trees on North Terrace, uh, which were removed for Lot 14. Think back to that furor and think uh, to the future of that section where the new trees will be much better, there'll be a, much more of them, 
Uh, and I can assure those councillors who may be concerned, uh, you know, maybe sort of on the on the borderline here, uh, we are in charge. We can ensure that there is a, a, a an even better treescape in place as a consequence of this. Don't be bullied. Don't be afraid of this. At the end of the day, safety should come first. Members, Councillor Mackey. Uh, thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, Councillor Moran has been around long enough and has the, uh, many of the same memories that, that I do. I was um, uh, an elected member uh, at the time of the North Terrace redevelopment and the spotted gum uh, that uh, the councillor, Councillor Moran refers to, it's actually in front of the art gallery, not the SA Museum, but we know, we know exactly the one. They were in fact actually chosen by Taylor Cullity Leth Lee for a triple row right the way along North Terrace, specifically because their growth, their growth shape is such that they're not prone to, even with big winds, to dropping boughs. Um, not to be gums, not all gums are gums. Gums ain't gums. Um, we have, uh, of course, eucalyptus, we have uh, citradoras, the actual lemon scented gums, and they are quite um, uh, adventurous when it comes to uh, uh, um, wind vulnerability and, and a branch shape. But the spotted, what's you know, colloquially called the spotted gum, is a very, very safe native specimen that works well in urban settings. Um, and I, 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 I'm, I, I don't doubt, and I don't wish in any way to impugn Councillor Hyde's motive, uh, but I don't share at all the belief that these plantings constitute a, a risk, not now, not in 10 years, not in 20 years. Um, and they will be very, very handsome adornments to our city and they'll provide great shade because that's the thing, a small crown uh, up closely planted together, you get a nice consistent block of shade and they're massively attractive to native birds where of course what we have in North Terrace and I know that it's sort of lovely and leafy and London Plains or, or some Cypress Plains and what do we get? We get pigeons and more pigeons. I know we love the pigeons now, especially the still ones, but um, I, I encourage councillors to uh, uh, stick with the advice of the experts who gave us uh, these recommendations and that we planted in the first place. Deputy Lord Mayor, do you wish to speak? I just, um, you know, uh, just, I don't think this is a war against greening. We all want greening. Um, but as elected members, um, we, our responsibility is to ensure that um, our streets are safe and it's safe for cars, it's safe for pedestrians and safe for everybody. I mean, when this tree branch crashed in South Terrace, I mean, we say that we regularly check the uh, trees. This, luckily, there was no one in this car and it didn't, um, it didn't kill anyone. But yet, here is a gum tree that has crashed on a car. Um, what this, what Councillor Hyde is asking is that the trees that we have planted, not the ones on Light Square, but the ones recently in Grove Street and on Prosper Road, are removed um, in the, and replaced, but not removed and cut and disregarded, but to be put back in the parklands where they are. Um, and where they uh, are all placed. But I don't believe by statistics and what I've read and what I have researched, there isn't anything that tells me that um, it won't be inevitable that some branches might fall and cause some damage. It keeps on going that there has been con continual discussions in local governments um, about the use of gum trees. Um, falling limbs uh, have resulted in serious injuries. Um, it's been tragic cases of um, lives being lost. They actually are called um, widow makers, these trees. Um, and they are, are subject to a lot of damage um, to property as well. Um, we, are, uh, we, we know that. And I um, uh, have first been one that has seen these trees damage properties and actually um, have uh, caused a lot of destruction. I think it's about preventing that from happening. We can't foresee the future. We can't say that they, will, that they won't um, be a problem. And as Councillor Moran pointed out, they do lift up, the roots do lift up and they do cause damage to the, the um, structure that we've already built. 
there on Prospect Road. Point of order, I said iron barks do. I didn't say spotted guns do. Well, they they do have a history of it. I've googled it that they do actually do have the same effect. But you know, I am I'm not an expert, so I'm not professing to be an expert. I'm only going by what I'm reading. As a compromise in regarding Prospect Road, I am very concerned about these gum trees in the centre of the road. Um, the ones that are on the side of the road, which um, I put in with the um, parklands, um, I'm willing to say if, if Councillor Hyde is willing to amend it to look at the ones that are in the centre of the road, um, where there is uh, a lot of traffic um, and a lot of cars, um, and you can't um, foresee something falling. Um, you can probably when you're walking, but not when you're in your vehicle. If he's willing to amend it to uh, do the ones that are only in the centre of the road. Um, uh, I would. Is that a fair There's none in the centre. Oh, Prospect Road. People walk on the side of the road. Sorry? The size of the dangerous ones. Why don't you chop all the trees down, do you think? And it's where the, where the members. Where members. Well, I don't really, I don't think it's about really removing the trees and throwing them out. We are going to replant them in the parklands. Um, and the way, there are ones that are already on the side of the street that are in the parklands. But I'm, I do understand that these trees are, do cause a lot of destruction. If you Google them, there is a lot of problem. Girls seriously um, injured by fallen tree branch in Parkdale in Melbourne, um, by eucalyptus trees in um, suburbs um, are causing a lot of debate. There is a problem in the foreseeable future. If, if our job as elected members is to keep everything safe, then why are we why are we why are we looking at this as though it's a uh, you know a war against trees? Deputy Lord Mayor, Deputy Lord Mayor, your time is up. It's actually against safety. Thank you. Okay, could I just for for clarity, for point of clarity, can I just draw people's attention? Well, Deputy Lord Mayor, if I can just draw your attention to point two, it does say and also removes any other gum trees planted on or adjacent to city uh, streets and six. Parks. Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't. I meant to vary that before I moved it. Can you delete anything oh, after okay. and? <laughs> is that okay? Oh, no. And because uh, that that is a massive undertaking um, and would denude most of our city. There are some people that contacted me that wouldn't mind that, but. Um, oh, so sorry, uh, Councillor Hyde. No, um, honestly, because no. it was it was mistranscription. It was meant to say uh, within the last six months at the end, but it's created so much confusion. Please. Yeah. Okay. And can I check with your second deputy Lord Mayor? Are you happy for that variation? Can we clarify the ones we've listed? So it does say removes the gum trees recently planted. Oh, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, Councillor Martin. It's not extraordinary, Lord Mayor. Um, it, it says much about the way in which the motion has been framed that the penny only dropped when you raised it and pointed out that, no, no, that no, Councillor Hyde. Interrupt anyone. Uh, look, Lord Mayor, uh, Councillor. he's debating again, uh, as oh, so often Councillor Hyde, please. He's, he's put up a proposal that actually proposed removing all the gum trees <laughs> along the parklands, as, uh, just as a matter of interest. I walked down the McKinnon Parade on my way here today, counting the gum trees that he was going to remove. I counted about 35 just in my immediate vision. And he didn't even notice, and nor did the team. But nevertheless, I'm pleased that that amendment has been made. Um, I, I am a, a, appalled by the arrogance of this, that um, you know, the previous council and the one before that and the one before that spent uh, so many hours crafting policies. This one in particular, which was the culmination of many, many workshops and heated debates. I remember them well, Alexander particularly, being uh, quite forward about what species of trees needed to be planted. Hassam Abiyat entering the debate. In fact, your mentors, mentors here, Hassam Abiyat, Natasha Milani, all agreeing that this was the document. This was the one we could agree on. And so on September the 11th, um, uh, 2018, we agreed to this. This is the policy. We all agree. And it went forward and it's been our policy until young Alex Hyde uh, comes along and says, let's remove the gum trees from Grove Street and Prospect Road and also all the other gum trees in the parklands 
um, on the edges, of course, um, without reference to any kind of history or any considered view that is the result of the opinions, the professional opinions of arborists, debated thoroughly backwards and forwards. And uh, the contempt in which uh, the, uh, the councillor holds that report is such that the Conservation Council of South Australia, the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects, uh, Trees for Life, TreeNet, Nature Conservation Society of South Australia, the National Trust of South Australia, 20 Metre Trees and SA Active Living Coalition feel bound to write to council and say, well, what a bunch of drop kicks you are. There is absolutely no sense in this. There is no substance to what the, uh, the councillor has raised. Um, this is something that should be defeated. Well, Lord Mayor, it's not going to be defeated. It's going to be carried. It's going to cost $300,000. And you can bet your bottom dollar, the audit committee will point it out again next month. Here's some more crazy decision making from the council uh, to correct something that doesn't need correcting and, and which will simply uh, uh, further diminish the view that the community has about the city of Adelaide. Um, I think, look, uh, politically, I just can't imagine why you would do this, um, but I gave up trying to explain the actions of Team Adelaide long ago. Councillor Abraham today. Lord Mayor, um, uh, I'll make it brief. There's uh, two points I want to make. One is that the uh, Green City Plan um, document is a very thorough document. There is lots of information and lots of uh, plans and, and uh, photos. There's actually a photo of uh, former um, uh, Councillor Alex Antic in here. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. um, so I, I, I would just like to say that um, if, uh, if the problem is uh, uh, the Green City Plan and if this is something that we need to look at and review, then that's, then that's something that uh, we'll probably need to do rather than uh, uh, I guess you know, uh, um, do anything with the, with the trees at the moment. That's that, that, that's one point. And then my next point is um, the, uh, the the roots of the of the trees um, is a uh, is a problem for me, and I think it is going to be a problem in a few decades. Uh, and who knows? Maybe in a in a couple of decades, I'll have another child and I'll chuck it in the back seat and I'll drive on there so I can go on a bunker road and he can go to sleep. But uh, they're, they're really the two issues that I want to highlight here in the chamber, and I think uh, it's worthwhile for us to, uh, uh, to definitely explore that um, Green City Plan uh, and possibly review it uh, down the track. I have a question, Sarah. Uh, question. Uh, Lord Mayor, I wonder, as you are allowed to, um, give your views, whether you would share your views with us. I will before summer. Councillor Moran, Deputy Lord Mayor. I just, I'm looking through the Green City Plan guideline. Um, does it say specifically in here, I can't find it, that we would plant um, gum trees in the centre of the road? Is, is that part of the strategy? Or is it just generally a choice of trees that you could use in the centre of the road? Acting C. Uh, through the presiding member. Um, I think Clinton did explain it earlier that it gives you um, a suite of options and it's depending on risk, location, landscape, um, design outcomes um, and then the plan informs um, our landscape architects with regards to which tree plantings um, go in. So it doesn't... Okay. Sorry, Councillor Donovan. Thanks, Lord Mayor. Um, look, I think it's completely reasonable that if a member of the public comes to a councillor and says, I'm worried about the gum trees being planted, that we then take that further. We go to our, um, our staff, our administration, we ask the arborist, we ask, ask the area responsible for some information. That's completely reasonable. So the starting point of this motion, completely reasonable. To get to this point is beyond ludicrous. Uh, we know, and, and the issue that is clear from the discussion that is being had in the chamber tonight, is that we are conflating a myriad of different trees under this little title of a gum tree. 
So we know that the trees that have been planted along growth and prospect are Carimbia maculata, which have been specifically selected within the Green City Plan, within the design guidelines, because they are extremely low risk. And then because of their other characteristics, as the acting CEO has said several times, as per the plan, as per the different characteristics of the street. So the points raised by Councillor Kouros in terms of the Wikipedia or the Google that she specifically said eucalypts, these are not eucalypts, they're a different species and they've been specifically chosen for this location because they are so safe. How many of these variety of trees have dropped limbs within the city of Adelaide, within South Australia, that have caused any injury to anyone, including any death? zero in the past five years, which is the recorded history that we can look back to, probably zero in a much longer period of time. How many, Councillor Kouros again specifically said, we're looking at safety, we want to make sure our cars are safe, she said, and our pedestrians are safe. Well, how many pedestrians have died from car accidents in the last five years? 57 within the LGA of the City of Adelaide. <laughs> of course we can control that. So zero, nothing to do with the trees. So coming back to the primary issue, let's not get caught up in anything, any of any other factional or other types of decision making. This is actually a really, really significant motion that we're looking at, removing over a hundred trees for no reason other than we're conflating the types of trees. We have one of the most qualified arborists in South Australia on our staff who has provided advice that has contributed to this information saying that they are a safe choice, they're a good choice, and they are not problematic in this location and have been specifically selected because of their safety and other characteristics. Let's not get caught up in anything else other than looking to the evidence that we have and making sure we're not conflating information about a whole variety of different trees that we've got here. In terms of the Knox development that was referred to, that was a, that was a property development. That was why the trees were removed. It had nothing to do with safety. Um, so look, I really hope that councillors do not get caught up in this notion of gum trees dropping limbs and that instead we look to the specific information that we have been provided with. It is our job as councillors not to take um, not to take random information and use that to create hysteria, but to look to the information that we have, all of the information that we have, and to make sure we're making good decisions and not wasting money and not making claims about safety issues when none exist. Yeah. Members, so um, before we go back to Councillor Hyde to sum up, um, I was here on the last council and both as part of APLA and as a part of the council that went through the Green City Plan. There was an extraordinary amount of work that went into it. Um, not all gum trees are the same. There's over 800 species. Um, I believe the species that have been selected uh, have been selected appropriately. Um, and I would be really, really sad to see us denuding Grote Street and Prospect, Street, Pro Prospect Road, um, with, particularly with the information that we've been given by administration that it's very unlikely that those trees would survive a transplant. Um, nor have we spoken to what trees would be planted to replace them. Um, and, uh, and the third part to that is the cost in doing that. Um, I do appreciate that there has been a lot of reference to the deaths um, in South Australia, um, but they were from different species of trees. Um, and so in terms of um, my personal opinion, um, I, I don't support the removal of those trees. Um, I'm happy to have another look at the Green City Plan with this council so that we are really clear as to everything that is in the Green City Plan and that they can actually, and, uh, can actually have a deep dive into the different planting that we have all over the city. Um, uh, some of the members or some of the people that actually wrote to the council this afternoon uh, and uh, Craig Wilkins is obviously a board member of APLA um, plus the other um, organisations that wrote have a clear view as well. Uh, so members, I will pass on to Councillor Hyde to sum up. And of course, I'm always happy to receive feedback, Lord Mayor, um, uh, like the many dozens of members of the public that have contacted me about this very matter, endorsing my views, uh, which is that we should be far more sensible about the trees we plant uh, in heavily patronised areas with high traffic flow. 
we as a council should always prioritise safety. And yes, I appreciate uh, some, some of these varieties uh, are less dangerous. Some of these varieties are less dangerous than others, but they are still dangerous. It's like Lord Mayor, someone suggesting uh, of which, uh, which sort of debilitating illness do you want? Well, the answer, Lord Mayor, is I do not want a debilitating illness. I would rather we regulate uh, the safety and mitigate the safety issues here as much as possible. And the fact of the matter is, whether it's a citrodora, an angrophora, or, or, a, um, uh, or, or a eucalypt, uh, something like a London plane tree has a far lower, if not completely negligible, completely negligible uh, 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 risk of limb failure. That's that's not no no no. I just wanted to sweep the, sweep the streets, not get rid of the plane trees. Um, a very simple, very simple thing, which we're still not achieved. Anyway, the point is, the point is, Lord Mayor, um, uh, that t as we meet tonight, as we meet tonight, two thousand homes, two thousand homes in the western suburbs are out of power. Why are they out of power? And roads are blocked off. Why are they out of power? Because a branch from a gun has collapsed on a power line. Thankfully, no one died. Thankfully, no one died. It doesn't matter because when you don't when you don't manage your trees properly, you have these risks. And I have utmost faith in our teams, but of course, we still had a branch fall and crush a car on South Terrace. And and the problem is the problem is, Lord Mayor, why are we going around uh, and planting risky trees in the ground? We shouldn't be. We shouldn't be. And the policy, well, the, sorry, the guidelines. The guidelines are just incorrect. The guidelines are incorrect, Lord Mayor. So members have before them the opportunity to vote for a common sense proposal that will save the trees. We'll actually see a net increase of trees within our local government area. And at the same time, at the same time, at the same time, they can mitigate the safety risks that these other trees currently pose. Now, if they choose not to go down that course of action, they'll ultimately have their communities to answer to. They'll ultimately have their communities to answer to and the public. Now, this, of course, isn't going to be an issue for this council. This is going to be an issue for three, four, five councils' time. And, and it, it really, it, it just goes to show the lack of vision, the lack of vision, Lord Mayor. <laughs> The lack of vision, Lord Mayor, and the fact that we're just going to allow this can to be kicked down the road. Now, I'm happy to take the political points and deal with something before it actually becomes an issue. If other councillors opt uh, to push this off into the never-never, to push it back, to say, oh, it's not my problem, they're not going to kill anyone yet, we'll just leave them there. If they can opt to do that, I think they're doing uh, South Australia and all the people that use these corridors a massive disservice. Uh, I would urge them to vote on the side of safety. Safety should be our number one priority. Thank you, Councillor Hyde. Members to the vote, those in favour, those against. Division. That is lost. Uh, Council members, the division has been called on the motion. All those in favour of the motion, please stand and remain standing till all names have been called. Deputy Lord Mayor, Councillor Hyde and Councillor Carer. Members, that takes us to the last item on the agenda tonight, Councillor Murray. Really uh, then we can do it very quickly. Um, 17.7, Councillor Hyde. Well, 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 Lord Mayor, I know in the administration comment, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, it releases says, it. Well, it, it doesn't, which is precisely what I wanted. Um, so uh, I, there's no need to move this now. Right. So you're withdrawing that? Uh, I'm withdrawing it. Well, thank it's been achieved. So uh, thank you to members, the members, 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 are there any motions without notice that yes. I'm aware of? Oh, Councillor no. Martin, thank you very much. <laughs> members, I close the meeting. Thank you.